Hello race fans, Peter McCarty here, welcoming you to Circuit the Spa Francorchamps for the second part of the H&R 24 Hours of Spa, thanks to Milner Motorsport. Joining me in the commentary box for the next six hours is Jonathan Burke. Jonathan, welcome. How are you feeling heading into this one? I'm excited. We had a few moments of drama in that last hour, and there's some tight battles going on throughout each and every class, so it's sure to be a fun next six hours. It certainly is, and uh, if you're wondering, if you're listening here on Race Spot, and you're thinking, is that Patrick Long and Alan McNish? No, I'm sorry, it's not. No, you're stuck with Jonathan and I, but we do sound like them. I'm as close as I can get, you know, trying my best. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's been a, well, I've just been watching the last hour or so, and it's been a, well, certainly a very exciting race. So far, we have the number six Simza Esports LMP2. Uh, in the lead of the overall in the race and of course the P2 category in the new Dallara P217 machine uh, which new for this season on iRacing and an amazing machine it is in GTE it's the Bendley Gods uh, in their Corvette C8R doing a cracking job as well and in GT3 it's the Familian Bomber team with the uh, well, what is now quite an old machine, the BMW Z4, but uh, Jonathan, that car, to me, it reminds me of a Scalextrix car because it's just got such good grip. It's got good grip and the BMW does have a, a good amount of power as well, so in a place like Spa, it's really, really strong. The Audis, unfortunately, have not been able to compete much with it. The top Audis in third, but almost a full lap down from the leader. That's something we're not really used to seeing. The Audi for, for quite a long time has been uh, certainly one of the preferred uh, GT3 cars, but great to see the BMW back. I, I absolutely love this car, although it's long retired from uh, competition in the real world. It's brilliant that it lives on here on the iRacing service because it's got the most... I mean, the one thing about it is the engine in this car. It's got a flat crank 4.4 litre V8 and oh what a noise it makes and of course the comically large rear wing as well I have to say I do like that. This is how do you take such a simple and oh, to be honest, oh, a we've got a, speaking of BMWs we've got a bit of problem here at Pujon. That is the, oh dear, Jan van der Spring in the 285 machine he's got to turn around and oh, big damage there Jonathan what do you see here? He was going down into Puhan, and I'm wondering if he got a little contact with the lap car here, the number 10, or did he just lose it on his own? It's a little wide in the wrong strip. Everything will come right here. And then an LMP2 oh, may have surprised him a little bit as he got ducked down to the inside. And then the number 10th place car, the 200, had to go wide to avoid him. Oh, what a pity. Yeah, it didn't look... I, I, certainly from my feed, uh, it didn't look like there was any contact he just maybe just got a little bit eyes on the curb there turns in that's quite a strange one actually as you said maybe just got a bit of a a bit of a surprise wasn't expecting him to dive up the inside there but there was room there's plenty room yeah maybe just I, I, as soon as he saw him but on the inside just panic a little bit as you get an onboard now inside the car you can see his head down in the poo on the lp2 goes and he may have just lost it on the curbing as well, as you mentioned, because he didn't look like he was panicking or anything when the LP2 car came around. No, 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 definitely not. He looked, he looked fine. He looked to be taking a pretty similar line. But the, 
I tell you what, we've we've been on the air maybe two or three minutes, Jonathan, and already there's an incident that's made me a liar. I'm like, oh, this car's got so much grip, it's so stable, and then someone crashes it. <laughs> it's, I shouldn't laugh, but it, it seems a little ironic. But that is quite an unusual accent, because that is where the BMW normally is brilliant, isn't it? It's got that really nice uh, kind of st st stability is the main thing that you kind of look for in that car. And the weird thing is, this is like midway through a stint for them, so it's not cold tires, the tires are warm, so... And maybe just got a little bit of the curbing, honestly, but it, very, very strange, isn't it? and that damage is going to really hurt down these long straights. As we go back to the LMP2 cars, this is for 5th and 6th, Prism Sim Sport and Dura Motorsport. They're going to have a duel going down the long straight, and the, the battles for, like, the 5th places and the last podium spots are very, very interesting. However, the distances from almost 3rd to second for almost every class have been very, very large. Yeah, it's interesting how that sort of played out in the early stages, but this, uh, uh, I feel we should have a swear jar for how many times we say a long way to go, but it's so true in 24-hour uh, in racing. Of course, uh, we just had the, the 24 hours of Spa last weekend, which is of course now a, an all GT3 event where Porsche won in dramatic circumstances, and the car actually, well, it it, the, the gearbox basically broke on the last lap and they managed to get the car to the to the checkered flag and take the win but the thing was was that you know that it happened on the last lap 20 you know 23 hours and 58 minutes into the race so at this stage you hear a lot of drivers who are experienced in the uh, in the endurance racing game they all say you know the, really the first 22 23 hours or so at the top level are, are just about survival and just keeping the car clean and I think they talked about it before we switched over to Sumil and Justin. They're talking about, like, this is the thankless job, like these stints right here. It's the middle part of the race. We're settling in. Track conditions are changing. It was very, very cloudy for a brief second, and it's cleared up. So the track temperature and conditions are changing. As we see, ooh, diving down was this 23 car very late on the brakes going into the chicane. Yeah, the prison rates and racing beta car, Marcel. Ropach um, in the 23 machine, just getting a maybe a little bit late on the brakes there. Maybe a tiny little bit of aero wash, perhaps, possibly. But uh, yeah, these these cars. I mean, they, they these they amaze me, Jonathan. These LMP2 machines. I mean, I love the old Acura open top uh, HBD, the ARX. It's a brilliant car which went toe to toe with the Porsche RS Spider back in the day. But this thing is another machine altogether. The aerodynamics very impressive, but for me, it's the braking performance of this car with the carbon fiber brakes. You can just stand on them and the car just pulls up from such high speed. Yeah, and it's really, really good. I think for the endurance uh, scene to get a car like this onto the service, and it's really helped, I think, generate a lot more interest into endurance racing. And as you see, like the IMSA class now has this car as the prototype class. and. IMSA is getting a lot of support as an official series, so it's really interesting to see as we see this battle hit a lot of traffic right now. It's going to be key for our approach to try and get through this quickly and see if he can take that fifth spot away. Indeed, and of course this is this is multi-class racing. This is why we all love it as endurance racing fans. You've effectively you've got you think why is that BMW racing against that car that looks like a spaceship? Well, if you're new to endurance racing, this is what it's all about. You have three different races going on all at once and they all have to co-inhabit the track together um, and the management of how the drivers if they're in the fastest class how they make their way through the traffic and those in the slowest class how they manage the traffic coming through past them and we see it sometimes don't we Jonathan where the faster traffic often can use the uh, slower um, class cars as almost little chess pieces. You can use them as like a, a, a pick or a basketball screen to try and you can box in your opponent if you're really, really clever. Yeah, and it's all about timing and making sure it works. However, like the slower traffic can also be a nuisance, especially if you hit a large group of cars. And thankfully, we haven't had much issues so far with the lap traffic in the Olympian 2s, but I do remember the Ivor series a couple weeks ago, the 12 hours here at Spa, and there was a lot of issues with lap traffic and such as the LMP2s caught the slower cars. But right now it's been very, very good and very, very clean and respectful from all of you guys. It certainly has been, yeah. We've got a pretty even split across each class. The LMP2, we have 15 cars running at the moment. That's our top class, prototype machines, as you'll see them later on track. Oh, oh, that's a bit cheeky. <laughs> 
goodness me, uh, that took me by surprise. I must have put the 23 Prism Sim Racing Beta car. Jonathan, what? I, I, I'm a little confused what he was doing there. Either he's trying to get heat in the tires, or he's trying to send a message to the BMW. And I kind of want to, you know, say it's the, the second option. However, I would not be surprised <laughs> if it was the first, and he's struggling a little bit for grip. But I didn't think that BMW held him up much at all going into the Camel straight there, so I'm very confused on that one. That was a bizarre bizarre thing. There is a, a number of hypotheses there. I mean, Oh, and oh, there's a BMW bound. Another another BMW off at Puhon. Uh, didn't quite catch on my feed who that was. Did the? Uh, we'll see if we can get a replay of that uh, in a moment. But uh, yes, this um, LMP2 machine, um, 600 horsepower, V8, built by Gibson in Derbyshire. So, oh, oh goodness, it's Lewis Goodway, the, not the second place car in GT3 was the car that went off at Puhon. Now, did, was he pushed? I, the no. same thing as earlier, just gets on wow. the, just gets on that little curb right there and goes around. I'm wondering, did he get hit on the inside door as well? Did he get sent in that direction or did it just overcorrect him? Certainly not from what I saw on my, on my feed. Um, that's very strange, isn't it, there, but uh, for Lewis Godway... Uh, oh, he's had another incident. Oh, no, that's the replay. Oh, my apologies, that's so bad. So, hmm, that's, that's very strange. I wonder if there's maybe some tyre marbles, perhaps, causing the, the driver's issues there. Yeah, because this, again, a lot of these incidents, like, he's, he's, again, about eight, seven laps into his stint where the last incident was in this corner. And this is unfortunate for Lewis Godway because he was really, really close to that 257 from the Embalmer team, and now it's a huge 30 second gap for them to make up. Indeed, this is a, and it, you know, same car, same corner, it's uh, it's almost spooky, and same mistake on that curb, onto, and it's almost a bit on the painted line between the tarmac and the curb, and that just sent him around, and what a bizarre incident, two bizarre incidents, but I guess the good thing is, Jonathan, in a 24 hour race, if you are gonna maybe have the occasional incident like that, but the critical thing is he didn't find himself in the barrier, so he'll be able to carry on. I think it's when you start taking damage is when it really starts to hurt. Yeah, especially any aerodynamic damages. We see a, a big battle right here. This is 9th, 10th, and 11th in class for the GT3s. The 211 Ames Bergfield team, the 200 Reprex team, and the Wolf Motorsport team as they're going side by side. The two BMWs, the Audi, not really happy with either of them, wants to get by both. Still side by side as we head into no name corner now. And now this is going to be interesting to make sure these guys don't spin out as they head into Puhan. No, I know. Yeah, if you're in the BMW and you've been watching the feed, you're going, oh, please hang on. <laughs> Normally you would expect those sort of incidents from the Audi, which of course has got the big V10 engine in the middle of the car and quite a short wheelbase, so it can be a bit twitchy. A lot of drivers don't like it for that reason, but uh, it's strange to see the BMW, which is normally a lot more tied down. But I guess uh, Spa, it's such a, well, it's such a fast circuit um, where you need such a, a blend of of good downforce. Oh, as we've got another BMW off, 235 machine, the Team Race Gitter. I was about to say Team Race Glitter, but that would be silly. Um, coming down into the bus stop around Blanchimont, a very, very fast corner, full commitment makes it through there safely so is it on the brakes as a prototype approaching that always makes you nervous oh and swipes Ooh. over the nose of the yeah. prototype oh dear yeah the the chicane here at spa is not very kind to lap traffic at all especially if you were in the slower classes it, it is very difficult to navigate around thankfully it is only a one car incident and he has just a bit of damage and hopefully the prototype does not have a lot of damage either but oh, that was scary for the 23 Oof. you see him diving away from the chicane trying to avoid that <laughs> that's those are the things that you can just be in a rhythm you've, you've maybe been doing 20 or 30 laps or so with no no problem and then all of a sudden bang there's a problem in front of you but uh, let's have a look at our gte runners this is the battle for seventh spot in GTE and a, a lot of Corvettes out there uh, on on the, the, the track today. Uh, of course, this car relatively new to the iRacing service. It came out during this season about, oh God, nearly six or seven weeks ago now, but it's a wonderful piece of kit. And of course, in the real world, it's had an amazing start to its um, 
to its competition career, particularly in the, the IMSA WeatherTech Championship. Yeah, the, the, the Corvette team has been very, very strong. And it's really, really nice to see. I'm a huge fan of the Corvette team, and it was really kind of upsetting over the years to see them not towards the top. But now, recently, in 2020, as crazy of a year this has been, seeing them get some race wins, especially with this car. It's a very mean-looking fast car. And I think one thing that does help them as well is there seems to be a lack of BMW in this field. The M8 was an option for people to take, but... A lot of people taking the Corvettes and the Porsches. Yeah, that is a very interesting um, observation because we, we do kind of joke about it behind the scenes that a lot of the time the GTE class, often referred to as Formula BMW, <laughs> because the BMW has been so dominant, hasn't it, in, in the last, well, the last year or so, really, um, in the GTE class. So great to see some new challengers getting... Uh, getting up there of course this corvette mid-engined naturally aspirated v8 with about five yeah five and a half liters capacity and already uh, a huge amount of, it's already had six wins uh, in this season in imza and five of those have been in the number three car of jordan taylor and antonio garcia and they're looking well they're looking pretty strong to uh, to claim the championship and it's the car's first ever year yeah, and the thing about like new cars in iRacing, I know a lot of people say like when they first had a car, some things are overpowered, but the Corvette really wasn't, and it fit really well with the BMW M8. I am an owner of the M8. I've driven the M8 a lot, actually, on the server, and it, it is a very fun and easy car to drive, but the Corvette, I think, is a very good car as well, and it really helps. If you see the 142 Nicola Rickers get a little bit wide there, and now the fight for seventh is on. Yeah, that might have just unsettled them a little bit there. So Coljo Birkenfield now in that really menacing looking machine, the 188, the black car ring from Ring Fazart Sim Racing, GTE. So no difference between the cars when they came out of the box. But of course, the the one thing that makes iRacing different to pretty much any other simulator platform or any kind of alternative in the kind of gaming world, if you like, the, is that the, the setups are so, so accurate and there's so much that you can play about with on these cars and especially things like the Corvette, which is such a sophisticated machine. Getting these cars set up correctly for each circuit is huge and that's why we see, you know, if you're new to sim racing, you think, how can they have so many sim racing teams? Well, the team that you drive for is massively important. Yeah, and the teams are, like, massively invested too. As, you know, they mentioned before we switched... There could be tons of hours, as we see now, an LMP2 car now getting in this conversation here. That's the 23 Prism car. He's had already too many close calls as we've switched streams. But teams will spend hours, like, building setups. I know even just me running on the ovals occasionally. I'll spend a good couple hours just figuring out a setup for an open series. But, like, for stuff like this where there's a decent prize pool, teams will spend... 30 40 hours a week per driver maybe testing trying different things looking at different lines looking at the data testing different conditions and especially for these gte cars it's very very important to get a good balance of power and downforce especially here at spa you have long straights but then you have these long fast corners and then you also have very slow corners absolutely i, for, I think for for many spies uh, maybe the Nürburgring Nordschleife aside, it is as good as it gets uh, in terms of the challenge for the driver uh, and the spectacle. And this is maybe just, uh, it's just come to me, Jonathan, that perhaps, of course, the BMW, the GT3 car, it's known to be so, so stable. But I wonder, that incident, those two incidents that we saw, saw coming into Pujon, I wonder if maybe those cars are really trimmed out, so they've got quite a low aero setup. And that's made them just a little bit more loose. And although they've been driving them for six and a half hours or so, maybe just the car having to be trimmed out a little bit more to get the maximum lap time, but not quite as raceable, perhaps. Now, we mentioned the track cooling down as well and the cloud cover coming over. And these are all things that can affect, you know, the track, especially going into a fast corner like Puhan. And yeah, if they're trimmed out and focused really heavily on the top speed portion and not so much the downforce, that... That could be that could be the issue there, as we've had seen in many classes here at, at Spa. You, you have to have a good balance of both. 
Indeed. So this is this is a really interesting position for Kodjo Birkenfield to be in in the 188 machine, who we're riding on the hood of right now with uh, Nikolai Richter's in front in the Valkyrie E-Racing green machine, even though it's white and black, but never mind. The, <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're currently, at, this is the battle for seventh. Now, for, for Coljo in the following car, he gets an opportunity there, and is he going to take it? No. I remember watching a, an excellent documentary, uh, Jonathan, called Endurance, which was commissioned by Porsche. And one of their drivers, uh, Lawrence Vantor, who won this race actually uh, last week, uh, the Spa 24 Hour, and he said, you know, when you're behind, in an endurance racing format, if you're following one of your rivals, you have two clear choices. One, you can push really hard and try and, you know, overtake and then pull away, or you can also sit behind, manage your time, manage your tires, not work the tires out too much, but also save a little bit of fuel. And across a 24 hour race, if you can save one pit stop over your rivals, it's a massive amount of time. Yeah, and, make, and managing the stints as well could be massive, especially here at Spa. It is such a long circuit, over four miles, and you have these long straights, so a draft could be helpful. Saving like even one or two laps could make a huge difference and really make us more break a strategy as we have the LMP2 cars are getting closer to the end of their stint, at least the top four or five runners are. GTE cars and the GT3s still about midway through, but again, like a, saving one or two laps of fuel could be key down the line. They absolutely could. Oh, oh sorry, I got a bit of a fright there. I thought the Simza car was off, but it's actually come into pit lane. So that is our leader in pit lane, Simza Esports number six. And that lovely white, orange, and black machine there into pit lane. The siren sounds. And of course, the, the endurance pit lane here at Spa, it's so, so long. And when you're crawling along there at, well, 40, 45 k's an hour, it's such a, such a long wait. And uh, some drivers, they'll be maybe just glad of a little bit of a rest, perhaps, just to take a little bit of a, a breather. But uh, let's see what their... Um, what the strategy they're going to go with of course the lmp2 cars you should usually get two stints of fuel per set of tires usually the fuel stint is about 35 minutes each so just over an hour on a set of michelin tires so let's see what the sims guys choose to do phoenix racing also in the pit lane behind them and the gap was about 10 seconds but during those last few laps the team of Tokak and the simpson cars have been able to open up a big gap and now heading into that first pit stop. Yeah, we'll see. It'll be interesting what they take here. Well, indeed, yeah. So let's see if we see the jerks go up. The car is taking tires. If it disappears and comes back again, that means they've changed driver. If it just sits still like it is just now, that means it's taking on fuel. So let's see what the Sims guys decide to do. Phoenix changing drivers. So yeah, Phoenix, yeah, well, a good spot. The 66 car. Inserting a new driver, we'll find out who that is when they go over the timing beam. But nope, no, no driver change for Simza, and I didn't, uh, on my screen, I didn't see any tires or anything. No, so I think they're double stinting at least this time. And we were talking about earlier, you could maybe get away with a triple stint if the track cooled down at all, but Simza able to retain the lead, a decent stop, a second actually faster than the Phoenix Racing team, so they got even a bigger gap now for their lead. So there they go off for their next stint of the race. Let's see if they can continue to, to build upon their lead. Just we're seeing a couple of the pit stops shaking out at the front of GTE as well. The HM Engineering Corvette getting to the front of the pack as it stands. Um, but those cars you can usually, well, it's somewhere between 55 and 60 minutes on a tank of fuel, but here at Spa, it's pretty heavy on fuel. There's a lot of full throttle around here. Yeah, and that's where, again, that, that fuel saving comes really into key, especially also managing the tires, because you're full throttle and wide open so much, and you have a lot of these corners that have a lot of downforce and that need a lot of grip, you can be very harsh on the tires. The 142 and 188 seem to can't leave each other right now. Richards and Birkenfield are going to stay right up close to each other, and I love I love the deliveries on both. It's a little frustrating, at least, to watch the um, the real life Corvettes in just the yellow and black, even though it's such a good color. But seeing all these sim paints, it, it makes me happy seeing all the different colors we have. Yeah, I love it how you have the complete kind of creative freedom for uh, 
you know, for the sim racing paints, and you see a lot of the a lot of the teams now have their own color schemes, their own branding, something, and in, and in most cases, it's kind of just defined by what the team want rather than the sponsor that they might well have. And uh, of course, for for kind of uh, shall we say uh, average Joes like myself, um, you can go on to programs like Trading Paints and pick from a huge array of uh, of paint jobs for the cars and at the moment I've got a Ron Fellows tribute on uh, on my C8R. Yeah, I have actually designed a few of my own paints through Photoshop a little bit. Uh, I, I go to Temple University in Philadelphia so I've been a Temple Colors, Temple Pride on some of my stock cars, particularly the, the Camaro in the Sprint Cup side of things. We saw the 71 get in the middle of this battle as he just came out of the pit lane. The T3 Esports Junior Motorsport Club and the Prism Sports all pitting. So it looks like the top six or seven of the LMP2s all on the same strategy. No one really managing to stretch out a lap or two. Well, there doesn't seem to be much uh, change in those strategies yet, indeed. So, and it's, like I say, brilliant to see so many Corvettes in there in the battle today. In fact, I do we have any BMWs in our GTE field? I'm not sure if we do. I have not seen one, and I'm actually kind of I'm actually kind of surprised because the BMW is very good on the straights and will be able to contend with the Corvette. And I think that's where some of these Porsche 991 teams have really lost out. Because we have confirmation, absolutely, from both on the timing screen and uh, from our producer Hugo Luis. No BMW. I have to say, this must be one of the first GTE events in iRacing in a long time where there hasn't been even just one BMW. Yeah, I mean, people favoring the Corvette over this, and there has been a balance of power update to the BMW. It lost a little bit of horsepower, so maybe that's another thing they're factoring in, that loss of eight or so horsepower. Maybe not contending out here, as we saw in some of the other GT classes that have been here at Spa. The Porsches and the Corvettes have been able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, so maybe they'll be stronger in the Corvette and the Porsche, but right now, the Porsches have not really been able to challenge the top two Corvettes. And which is interesting is that we have two Corvettes leading, three Porsches in the middle, and then these two Corvettes still fighting for six. Yeah, very interesting indeed, of course. Uh, we'll see how it shuffles out over the, uh, the course of the day. We also have two Ferraris in the GTE field. We have the 152 car, the online simracing.de, and also the 219 Ferrari of 11s. Sim Sport, so there's representation for Maranello as well. So we've got Bowling Green, K Kentucky, we've got Weissach, and of course we've got Maranello. So there's uh, we're very much a, a, a multicultural uh, race we've got today, and that is really the spice of sports car racing. As I mentioned earlier, we've got three different races going on here. We have the LMP2, the pure prototype car built only to go fast around a racetrack. LMP2 stands for Le Mans Prototype 2, and that is 600 horsepower, 900 kilograms, very, very fast machine, lots of aerodynamics, carbon brakes. The GTE cars also very, very sophisticated, but based off road cars, although they don't really carry much over from their uh, road car base. Uh, they are they are effectively like GT prototypes, effectively. And then we have GT3, which is a little bit closer to the production car, where uh, the production car, there are a little bit more transferables, but like the engine, for example, is linked to the um, to the road car as well. So it's quite interesting, um, interesting balance. The GTE cars are a little bit faster than the GT3, but not night and day. No, I think that's actually really good for them as a field to make sure they get through lap traffic because the GTEs have really not had to deal with much of the GT3 car traffic. The, unfortunately, the LMP2s, you know how quick they are, how aerodynamic they are, have had to deal with both classes of traffic, as you see right here. The 14 low grip racing, several laps down, pretty actually far behind in class for them, making its way through this battle. Yeah, there's, uh, well, that's the thing is, even if you don't get off to the good start, you can just keep on plodding away and work your way up through the field. That is the spirit of endurance racing, as they say. It's, uh, it's not over until the checkered flag drops. Of course, we saw at Le Mans uh, four years ago when the luckless Toyota team at that point, uh, they unfortunately had a breakdown with two minutes to go where their uh, Toyota TSO 50 LMP1 hybrid machine 
broke down in front of the pit straight and uh, I have to say Jonathan I, I, I was close to shedding a tear for them when you saw all of the Japanese engineers in tears watching their car breaking down and but then on the other side when you see the elation of teams for me when you see an, a team win an endurance race the, the emotion is clearly on a higher level because there's so much that goes into it. There's so much time and effort I think especially in the real world but also in the sim world of putting together setups, testing drivers, planning out strengths, planning out strategy. It's much as we praise, you know, the race car drivers, the endurance racing is really, really a team effort. And I think in sim racing it really shows as well with how the drivers get organized and how they set up their setups and strategy. As we the, now that these two Corvettes have been victims to several uh, traffic picks, as we see the 06 who spun out earlier and hit the barrier in Puhan, now this Einsimracing.de Ferrari has now joined the battle. Ah, so we now have Ferrari versus Corvette here as well, and uh, you know that's something that we've seen this year in the uh, the IMSA WeatherTech Championship, isn't it? Where the you know the Porsche team have had all all of the pace of the Corvette team, but have not got the results because they've not been able to deliver in the uh, in the races they made little mistakes very unusual for porsche and corvette well they're doing what corvette do just uh, executing in the pits and getting the job done as we see the ferrari there the 152 car of stanislav bolinart getting held up there a little bit um, now the ferrari i i, I had the great fortune now uh, jonathan of uh, interviewing uh, a lovely lady called rachel fry who races the Ferrari 488 at Le Mans with her uh, Iron Dames team with Manuela Costa and Michelle Gatting and she said the Ferrari, she says it's an excellent endurance car particularly, she says it's really really consistent and she says it just loves driving it over long distances. And I think that may be the key for these Ferrari teams is right now neither of them really close to the class leader but again as time goes on it's still a long race, we have 17 hours and 25 minutes to go before the checkered flag falls. And obviously, as the stint has gone on, he's gotten closer and closer to both these Corvettes. So maybe over the long run, over these long stints, the Ferrari 488 is really, you know, showing signs of life. Indeed, yes, uh, it, it, it certainly, it certainly is. It's uh, certainly coming to its own throughout the stint. And uh, interesting, Nikolai Richter's has just allowed, uh, he's just allowed the car in front in sixth place in class. The uh, no, look, that is in class. That is the uh, it's Koja Birkenfield. Now, Koja Birkenfield was behind at one point, so there's been a switch there between the Corvettes. And, and again, I think it's slab traffic, as you see. Richards catch a BMW at a really, really Ill, Ill opportune time. Like the way the LMP2 cars have caught him and the way he's caught some of the slower GT3 traffic, it's just been poor timing. And it's really nothing he can do besides navigate his way around and try and not lose as much time as possible. He's still within touching distance of that Ranchfield Sim Racing GTE car, but now he's in the clutches of that 488. Yeah, that's, that's not what he needs is to have that twin turbo charged. Ferrari looming down on him uh, at the moment, just looking where they are in the stint. At the moment, they are five. Uh, no, they're actually quite early on in their stint, from what I can see. Just looking at ring for. Yeah, the interesting. The Valkyrie E Racing green car, 15 laps into the stint, whereas Ring Fazart Sim Racing GTE, the car, the car in sixth place in class, has only had nine laps of the stint. The Ferrari only had six so there's uh, there are slightly different strategies these guys and I think this is enticing the Ferrari as well he has the fresh rubber you know the much fresher rubber got the now the draft as he goes down the Kemmel straight to maybe pull alongside as we get an onboard look right here he's looking looking thinking about it. he's gonna have to be very late in the brakes heading into Lacombe's in order to get around this Corvette the Corvette power very very good and Fortunately, nothing right there. He's going to have to get really, really close, almost on his bumper, I think, going on the Camel Straight to have a shot going on the Combs. Indeed, yeah, absolutely. The Camel Straight, and for the Formula One fans watching, you might remember Mika Hakkinen and Michael Schumacher going toe-to-toe -to -toe down the Camel Straight 
And that was exactly the spot where it was, but definitely Stanislav Lennart is getting closer here in the Ferrari. And like you say, the Corvette very good in a straight line, but this Ferrari looking very strong through the twisty stuff. Let's see how it hangs on here at Kuhon. Very, very high aerodynamic load here, really loading the tyre hard. Runs a little bit wide there, that's ah, because there's a prototype coming flying up the inside. Good presence of mind there from the Ferrari. Yeah, I think in, in a lot of these slower classes, the GT and the GT3, you had to have a good crack awareness, and Ferrari really showing it right here. So we get a double box right now. We're looking at the rear wing from the Corvette and inside of the Ferrari, and it, it's oh, this is an amazing image as we look at the LMP2s got slicing their way through the traffic ahead, and he trying to go through Blachemont and maybe set up something going into Chicane. He's going to, again, have to be very, very brave in the words. Well, have to be, yeah, if he wants to make the move, right, this is a brilliant, this is effectively the, the helmet cam, this is a driver's eye view, uh, coming down into the bus stop, hard on the brakes, really late on the brakes, and the BMW GT3 goes wide, oof, good. thankfully gets out of the way, but uh, this Ferrari, he's, uh, he's getting closer, he's just nibbling little bits away, but that Corvette has got some ponies down the street. You know, unfortunately, held up the Corvette in front as well, though, so now it's going to be a three-way fight, and the Ferrari is ever closer right now. Uh, Lux Marks had to stay close with him through Bradalon and LaRouge in order to get a good run down the Camel Straight. It's going to be hard for them to make sure he doesn't get any loose. Nope. Clean through there, and now he's as close as he's ever going to be, and it's going to be late and the brakes and another comes closer and closer and closer. The 142 leans over a little bit to the rev limiter. He's at max revs late and the brakes and another comes and the Ferrari is through. Beautiful move. Really, really clean. Set up in advance. Absolutely perfection there from the Ferrari. Really, really impressive stuff. And that's what we like to see. Uh, indeed. Um, so, game on then here in this... Uh, in this battle for GTE honours in the midfield, the online simracing.de Ferrari, the 152 machine. That was just a typical spa move where you, you have to almost plan it all the way back from the bus stop, build it up, not try and rush the move and know where your opportunity is. And that's coming into Le Com and got it done so well. But good, good respect and good compliance from the Corvette as well. Yeah, not over defensive driving. You know, the Corvette's coming towards the end of his stint. Obviously, Nicole Richards, I don't know if he's going to stay in the car, they'll swap drivers, but he's got 16 laps on his stint. This Ferrari only has seven, and Birchfield in front only has 10. So they're on opposite strategies, but a good move for the Ferrari in, for the later stages of this race. Indeed, it certainly is. He uh, was making it way through, making his way through, and it doesn't look like there's a mark on that car as well, which is just what's required. To keep the to keep keep going throughout the race, you don't want to be nursing damage. It's uh, you you pay for it for the rem for the remainder of the race because there's just not sometimes not possible to get the stuff repaired when you go into pit lane. So 17 hours and 19 minutes to go, and still well we've been racing for six hours and 40 minutes, and these guys are cannot be separated. It's still Sims at Esports LMP2 out at the front right now, leading by 34 seconds from Phoenix Racing Esport Green. Uh, they're both on identical strategy, both on the seventh lap of their stint. Uh, in third place in LMP2 is the Rink Fizart Sim Racing car, about another half a minute behind the second, about a minute behind the leader at this stage. So uh, it's still plenty to play for at the top of LMP2. Uh, in GTE, it's much closer. We have the HM Engineering Corvette of Mark McCormack leading the Benley Gods car, which was leading a short time ago by 12 and a half seconds. And third is the Race Union number 187 car, the uh, first of the Porsches. In GT3, we have the Vermilion Bomber, the BMW, uh, the Munich Missile in the number 257 leading by 41 seconds from Simza Esports uh, GT3 and after that that little mistake uh, there Jonathan that's cost that's pretty much what that little mistake cost them those 41 seconds 
Yeah, the gap stretched out to 30 seconds, and then obviously the wear and cooking of those tires spinning through Wuhan. It just cost him another 10 seconds, and that's, a, that's an unfortunate mistake by Lewis Godway. And they're going to have to try and figure out a way to close down this other BMW. He's pretty safe right now in second place. Then the next place car, Absolute Motorsports, almost a full lap behind. But it's going to be a matter of, you know, trying to plan out a good strategy to track down the Familian Bomber team. Indeed, yeah, the running mistake-free is the order of the day here in this 24-hour competition. The 24 hours of Spa, as you look at the Ferrari, really making moves now. The 152 car, well, Stanislav Lenartz chasing down Collier Birkenfield, the next of the Corvettes in sixth place. So, uh, the uh, Ferrari, as you mentioned, Jonathan, making good advantage of that slightly fresher rubber. And he's been consistently faster than both of these two Fets. I'm wondering if the Ferrari, as the sun is going down with the cooler conditions, is coming into a little bit of its own right here. Maybe showing that's like, hey, we're not around just to be pushed around at the back of this field. We're going to be around to fight as we see the 41 breezing on by. The Bullout Racing 2 car in 10th in LMP2. And this is an opportunity maybe for the Porsche to get a look he thought about. Or the Ferrari to get a look he thought about it. And the Corvette, again, still has the LMP2 on the inside. That's going to hold him up even more. Yep, so we're right on board. We're on the helmet cam again. On board the Ferrari, the 152 machine. It's got looks to be really, really nice and balanced through those uh, through those middle sections. Go through the Jackie X corner now. Hard on the power, down towards Pujon. In a Formula 1 car, it's, it's almost incredible to think that they're more or less flat out around here at 100, nearly 180 miles an hour, which is a um, <laughs> crazy, crazy thought. But in a GT car, a little bit more of a balance, and um, you've got to balance the brake and throttle through through there into the Fania chicane and then towards Stavo and Campus. A brilliant driving challenge here, and you speak to so many racing drivers that a good proportion of them will tell you that Spa is the favourite. It just is a good mix of everything you want in a like really good racetrack. It has its long straights, it has its wide long corners, but it also has the tricky bits, tight corners, the pain, the cones, rattle on a rouge, the source. It, it has everything I think you want as a race car driver. And even for like a car manufacturer, this is a track where I think a lot of the manufacturers don't feel like they have an advantage or a disadvantage. It really equals out as the Ferrari looks on the inside of the chicane on the Corvette. Nothing doing there for Len Martz, but he's been fast from Berkfield for the past few laps, and he may get an opportunity out of the source on the rundown to Rouge and Rattelon. Yep, it looks like he might do. He's he's rehearsed it before, going past the uh, the other Corvette behind. So can he pull the move off again? Let's have a look. Coming down towards Eau Rouge for many the most well the most famous corner in the world out through Radion onto the Camel Strait and he's uh, he's making the 188 Corvette know, know that he's there, filling the mirrors, both the side mirrors and the inside screen on the car, moves to the inside line, through he goes and the 188 Corvette doesn't do much to protest about, oh, oh he's off, oh watch, Oof, dearie me that was close, that was really close, he goes straight on, he'll have to serve a slowdown penalty here which will allow at least the 188 Corvette to go by. Now, does it allow the other car there to go past? No, it doesn't. So, he's got to do it all over again. Yeah, Richard's still behind. Birchfield able to gain the spot back, but that was a little bit hair-raising there for the team, the 152 team, the online sim racing .de team. That, that could have been disastrous if he came back out and collected <laughs> the other two Corvettes as I think he still has that time penalty and Richards has actually been let pass, so this is a really hurts them as they were running so well on this stint. And now, well, it's basically a frow reset. It's game on again. However, the Corvettes are nearing the end of their stint. They're gonna have to be pitting soon. Yeah, and that makes you wonder, oh, it makes you wonder whether is there much need then to, to bust the gut to try and get past them again just to see them dive into pit lane. It's, uh, it's a different mindset of racing, isn't it, compared to sprint racing where you have to be thinking thinking ahead all the time. Um, so it doesn't see here 
if the 152 Ferrari tries to go past the Valkyrie Corvette um, as they come in to the bus stop once more at the moment just looking at the, the stint length they are at the moment the Ferrari on lap 9 of the stint the Valkyrie car 18 uh, laps into the stint and the uh, the 188 ring for their sim racing only 12 so got to keep an eye out mainly for the Valkyrie e-racing green car to come in. Well, I think the Ferrari is uh, you know a little no pun intended seeing a bit of red right now because he's already on the back of the Valkyrie e-racing green car of Cola Richards and he's going to set up the move again. He was too brave on the brakes heading into Lacombe's but he's going to be already side by side as they head down the Kemmel straight. It's not going to have that help with the draft. It's going to be a drag race into the braking zone. As who has the advantage? It looks like the Ferrari. And can he hold it on the track? He does this time. As it'll get back around Richards. Good move. Good little redemption for them. Yeah, brilliant job. Yeah, really, really good. And I think, um, you know, aboard the aboard the, the Valkyrie car, you know, Nikolai Richter's he probably thought, well, he's already gone past me once and seen him make a mistake. There's not, no point trying to throw blocks or anything like that. It's just going to slow me down. And, you know, you just live to, to fight at a point when you do have the pace under the car. And that's what takes that real maturity because, you know, we're all, uh, we're all racers, aren't we, Jonathan? When you're behind the wheel and you see somebody going past you, you the last thing you want to do is let them by. But you sometimes you have to fight that instinct and really think about the long game. Endurance racing is probably the most complicated game of chess there is. You have to think 5, 10, like 15 laps ahead or even hours ahead. And also, maybe the Corvette is also fuel saving. Again, they're getting towards the end of their stint. They're maybe trying to hit a fuel number. So really no reason to fight a Ferrari who's in the mid stint on probably prime tires, prime condition for him. Really no reason to be too defensive about it. No, no, definitely not. Absolutely, that's, uh, that's certainly the, the the theory. Although, it's uh, I, I tell you what, I love the comfort of the commentary box, Jonathan. We get to be such experts, don't we? But uh, we get to do it in the comfort of our chair while these guys are sweating away behind their rig and having to concentrate. It's uh, I'm glad we're in this spot. It's much easier, I'll be honest. I, I, even when I'm like sometimes racing just the the fix series or anything like that for. 12 minutes or something like that I, even I'm getting anxious just at the first bit of it I can't imagine like how anxious these guys are especially when they're planning for the night as the Sun continues to go down it's getting lower and lower in the sky and the images get like more and more pretty as we go on I love seeing the Corvette in the Sun down conditions going down into Blashamat and Kuhan it's such a beautiful image but you're right, and this is what the, you know, they mentioned the fatigue. A lot of these drivers are in Europe, and it is, you know, getting dark outside over across the pond. I'm on the east coast of the U.S. This is prime condition for me, so any American drivers right now, or even Canadian or South American drivers, are probably loving this racing at night, and it's still day outside for them. Indeed, yeah, absolutely. Well, it is. Uh, I can I can confirm that here in Scotland it is very dark. <laughs> We've just had our daylight saving time uh, change in the last week or so so it's yeah just getting settled in for winter now unfortunately but uh, good that we've got uh, lots of sim racing to uh, to keep ourselves busy with and to enjoy and uh, yeah I have to say you mentioned this uh, Corvette it looks so good under the the lights and we'll see it uh, we'll see the headlights the proper headlights come on which are kind of like uh, you, one you would find on a, a football stadium. They are so bright, and they're already on in the Ferrari, as you can see. Um, plenty, plenty of lighting at the front of that car as well. So, this is where we're coming into what's often referred to at Le Mans as happy hour, where basically the drivers still have the vision of the light, but with the light, the sunlight going away, or the direct sunlight on the track going away, the track temperature cools, and that gives the drivers a really, really nice. Uh, really really nice conditions to lay down some fast lap times so we could see in the next little while some really hot laps going in. I think that's another reason why this, this Ferrari is also pushing is because he's trying to make the most of his tires as well as the burning fuel load and I think we are going to see some hot laps for, for a lot of guys and it's very interesting to see how the night plays out for all these different teams and what they're set up to do. 
this is where you get that you know, if you're in a team of four maybe five drivers possibly and for this uh, for this competition you you go and you have a little bit of a snooze or you can have something to eat or whatever and you come back and you have that almost that trepidation of asking where what's going on and you, uh, you always been say yeah no problem car's running fine yeah we're doing okay or you get the uh well um uh, uh, Jim, uh, yeah, Jim had a shunt. Yeah, we're we're last. <laughs> it's not, sometimes it's a little bit of the glory of some race, of endurance racing. You can leave for a sec, go grab a coffee or something, come back, and then it's like, what? <laughs> and you know, it is such a long race, and some people may not enjoy, you know, watching all the endurance racing. But I think it's very interesting to see what all plays out in different stints because there's you know different highs and lows for every team. So again, we're seeing this Ferrari charting its way through the field, and we're seeing the Phoenix racing in the Simpsons Sport incident from earlier with that lead change in pit road. That was almost a finding moment for them, but there's still time for Phoenix racing to get into the overall lead. Indeed. Yeah, there, there absolutely is. There absolutely is. So we're riding on board the Corvette, this brand new Corvette, and you'll see the screen there if you're wondering. He's, uh, he's not watching television uh, on on board this Corvette. He's a little bit busy for that. This is uh, the kind of onboard camera, which basically replaces the rear view mirror. As you can see, it doesn't have any rear view mirror. It's exactly the same to the millimeter as the uh, the real world car. The guys at iRacing laser scan the machine, so that it's exactly the same. But that technology where you have the, the drivers approaching you, so the Corvette actually, uh, along with their partners Pratt and Miller, basically developed that technology where you can have color-coded system for faster prototypes coming up behind you, and you can detect where the cars are, and it's a, it's a really helpful system that, to, from what I can see, a lot all of their competitors have since copied. Sometimes I wish, you know, the road cars would have, just regular, like, minivans and on the highways or anything like that. When I'm you know, driving along the interstate and some slow person still all the way in the left lane, would they get a warning or something on their review camera? But it's definitely a very good, interesting thing. And it's something that I think has really, really helped the GC cars manage traffic and manage less and less incidents with traffic. Because we really have not had many GT car and LMP2 car collisions. It's mostly just when the LMP2s get a little antsy diving down in the corners, but that's basically it. There's been really good, respectful driving as we see the overall leader in the background, Timu Tanka in the senior uh, esports car slowly coming up on this battle. Indeed, yeah, I have to agree with you. The, uh, straight away, and as uh, soon as we've uh, you know, been in the commentary box, this uh, the driving standards here on show by these guys have been very, very impressive. I mean, if you compare it to, I don't know if you saw, Jonathan, the the uh, iRacing Petit Le Mans, and bear in mind that was the you know the very top drivers in the world on in sim racing, and the driving standards were appalling. I mean, yeah, the especially was in a track like, <laughs> but the, but the the actual con you know the conduct was really poor. You know, sometimes you just get in your head and think I have to go fast. That that's that's sometimes what you do. You get in your own head and you're like, well, I got. I gotta go fast. I gotta be the fastest one out there. And I think right now people understand this is a 12, a 24 hour race. Just managing the top tires, managing the stints, just managing the car, making sure it gets home in one piece. I think is a little bit more, I, like, I don't want to say, you know, reserve, but a little more patience, I think, from everyone. And the Petit Le Mans, I think, was hard because it's also at Road Atlanta, which is a track that I think has less overtaking zones than. Spa, where Spa is a lot longer and has, you know, the like, large camel straight going into the cones, whereas, you know, you run into traffic going in that first sucker at Road Atlanta, there's no way around it. Yeah, that's an excellent point. It is so tough, and there is, as much as you'd like to think otherwise, there is one line from turn three all the way down the S's to turn five, but it still doesn't stop people from trying it. <laughs> And it's, yeah, and as you mentioned, the lap length, of course, the lap length for the prototypes there, about a minute and ten, something like that, here a minute, for the, well, the prototypes, there are two minute laps, so yeah, you're absolutely right, you're a lot more spread out here, which, which definitely helps uh, uh, as well, um, as indeed so. And where the guys, the Simza guys, just managing that gap is very, very stagnant right now between Simza Esports LMP2 in the 6 car and the 66 car of Phoenix Racing Esport Green. Uh, Christoph Monza on board that car. Temo Toika on board the Simza Esports machine. And 
GTE. It is, well, it is again very, very close between HM Engineering and Bentley Gods. I, I have to keep checking myself, Jonathan, because every time I see that, I keep thinking Bentley, like the Bentley boys from the Le Mans in the late 20s. I, I, I kept thinking Bentley too when I first saw it. I'm like, Bentley? We don't have a Bentley. I'm pretty sure there's no Bentley in iRacing, although it would not be opposed to having a Bentley in iRacing. I don't know if you've ever seen a GT3 Bentley. I've oh, seen one at Road America, and it, amazing. Is a, it is a fantastic machine to have at a track like Road America, or even here. That front engine weight be really, really good. But again, Science Love Lock starts getting closer again to Birchfield. Birchfield's going to be at the very end of his stint, probably just managing the tires and trying to get to the pit lane. Whereas Leonard's is trying to make the most of the lap times, trying to make the most of the sun still being up and the track cooling down. Yeah, this is interesting because for Culture and for, for, for Birkenfield, this is perfect because he knows he's at the end of his stint and he knows, now look at this, he is throwing blocks now. He's thinking, well, I'm going to the end of my stint anyway and I'm not allowing this Ferrari to basically deploy the pace that I know he's got. You know, this is the, the thing is, the Ferrari is he going to have a look at the bus stop. This would be a big look. He does. He lets off the brake slightly. Can he make this move stick cleanly? Oh, snips the nose off. Oof, that was a firm move there. Great move from Stanislav Lenarts to make that stick in the Ferrari and now he can escape a little bit more but uh, yeah for Birkenfield he probably just hampered the Ferrari the 152 car for a few laps there yeah, and again Leonard's is probably still a little frustrated from that this time he got around him where he had to go off into Lacombe's off into the grass he went but as we see several cars have now dived down the pit lane and it looks like several drivers reaching the end of their stints as we reach the top of the hour well, why don't we have a little bit of a look at how our drivers line up in each class at the moment. Uh, we'll start with the LMP2 machines, as we said. Simza Esports leading from Phoenix Racing Esport Green by 33.5 seconds. In third is the Ring Fazar Sim Racing Team in the number 8 car. Fourth is T3 Esports, followed by Turner Motorsport Club, Prism Sim Racing Beta, Angry Bull Racing and Milner Motorsport Sim Racing Pro in the 21 machine. In GTE, it is HM Engineering leading the way in there. Well, there's a song here, isn't there, Jonathan? Their Little Red Corvette. Um, so <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll save the singing for, for later on. But the Little Red Corvette, HM Engineering, number 159, leading by 15 seconds from the Bengali Gods. Prism Racing Alpha in the 113 car, they are in third with Race Union in fourth. Online Sim Racing DE in the leading Ferrari has moved up to fifth now with Ring for Zart Sim Racing GTE in the black Corvette, the 188 machine in sixth. Valkyrie E Racing Green in their Corvette are seventh and Austrian Sim Racing's ROT in their Porsche are in eighth right now. And finally in GT3, it is still the BMW Z4 GT3 of the Familian Bomber team, leading by 47 seconds from Simza Esports GT3. Third is Absolute Motorsport, Actal of Design. Fourth is Rank Ring Fazar Sim Racing GT3 Pro. Fifth is Milner Motorsport Sim Racing Black, followed by German Performance Sim Racing, Team Race, Race Getter, and finally AMC Birkenfield. We're going to go on board now with a fan immersion here on Race Spot TV. And so you can watch exactly what is required to stick one of these prototype racing machines around this incredible circuit. Myself and Jonathan Burke will be right back very, very shortly. Enjoy the onboard footage.
Welcome back to Race Spot TV. We hope you enjoyed those laps on board with our leading car overall, the number six Simza E Sports LMP2 machine, driven by the wonderful Timo Toika, lapping at just over two minutes uh, in that car around the Spa circuit. Seriously, seriously fast and. Uh, Whipping one of these uh, Delara LMP2 machines around Spa requires uh, an equal amount of skill and uh, bravery, I would say, uh, Jonathan. Not only that, when we were in the fan immersion, he was doing his in and out laps for pit road, and those are really, really key, especially in a car like this, where it can be so different in this stint to a beginning of this stint. He's nailed it as well. He was two seconds faster than Phoenix Racing on his out lap. So now that gap has stretched up to 34 seconds. Timu Toika really in a league of his own up here. The Phoenix Racing needs to do something probably a bit more drastic to really catch that number six car. Brangsford Sim Racing LMP2 also very far behind. Almost a full minute behind second place. So it's a very spread out field in LMP2, but it's still a lot to play for. Indeed, and of course in the LMP2 class, there's just potential calamity around every corner, of course, with the GT cars. Every GT car they come across can do something unpredictable, and that's, you can never ever let your guard down, particularly for the prototype guys. The closing speeds between, say, for example, the uh, Delara P2 and the, uh, the GT3 are massive, so it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really interesting to watch how those guys manage that uh, that gap. But uh, yeah, gone past the 17 hours to go, Mark. The sun's starting to set here on beautiful Spa. And uh, I have to say, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've had a little peek inside the circuit when I was driving through uh, on business a number of years ago. But they would you believe it, Jonathan? They used to have a whiskey festival in the local town, the town of Spa itself, in the local casino. So they've like they fitted all the vices into one building, alcohol and gambling and race cars all in one place. I feel like you're describing like some sort of like heaven that we can get to at the moment. <laughs> I am. No, no, and in fact, yes, because the um, for in my opinion best beer in the world, brewed in Belgium, and also the best fries, the fries and dipping mayonnaise. Oh, just a delight. So you've seen the French can't do their own fries, right? Well, that's that's a shame, unfortunately. It's, it's <laughs> ironic, isn't it? <laughs> their own neighbors out doing them. That's just that, that's just rude to, <laughs> to take their thing. But yes, you, uh, you go to a place called a friture, uh, which is where they basically where they fry things. It's uh, that is the definition of heaven. I mean, we have that here also in the states. It's just called the American South, where they just fry everything. <laughs> I want to go there. That's, <laughs> it sounds, sounds good. So in the in the, in Belgium here, um, they have uh, they have all the all the good stuff. Also, I can report that the um the havana uh, club in spa in downtown spa is uh, a good place to go for a for a party and like a formula one weekend here i think is definitely on my bucket list of things i i need to do <laughs> like I, I need to get the experience of of being especially here a track as famous as spa and as unique as spa is indeed i think we should have a, a race spot staff outing to the spa 24 hour next year are you proposing that officially is an official proposal that you're going to write down? I think it is. I've just seen our, our chat light up. Hugo, our producer, said agreed. So it's decided then. See you there. <laughs> All right, for that, do we get our own little booth too? Do we get like our own little sign or something on the side as well? That'd be fantastic to have. I think so. Yeah, yeah. We we should we should have like a we could have like a race spot. Um, like little compound at the at the track, and we can we can try all those local delights that I mentioned: uh, the beer, the fries, the uh, cho good chocolate in Belgium as well. Uh, I am an, I have been fortunate to not even have visited that other side of the, of the ocean yet. I, I, I am dying to actually go to any of these tracks. Spa in particular, I think it's on the top of my bucket list. Maybe Monaco for the Formula One race, but I feel like Spa is like the old racetrack wherever you're driving either a GT car a prototype or a Formula One car indeed yeah there's uh, there is something uh, there is something I think for Spa as well when you've got a car like like we have in this race here the LMP2 machines where they've got such high 
aerodynamic capability now that there's nothing spa has that layout that can really showcase one of those high aero you know performance cars at their very best you can really see what they can do and but the, it's not without its weaknesses though here at spa in these tight tight corners particularly the bus stop chicane the source and you watch the Ivor 12 i was the last big spa race that i did was multitude of drivers that were having issues in a lot of these slower corners just understanding like how much power to put down where where the fine line is in the p2 so it's a very it is a very fun car to drive but it's also very tricky and i think it really is good around these high speed corners but give it something tight and give it something that has a very very you know thin margin of error and it, it could be a challenge you're you're absolutely spot on that's an excellent point as we see the ferrari uh, the 152 Ferrari trying to get past a pie, one of the GT3 Audis. Through he goes, a little bit of flash there for his uh, typical Audi driver flashing at the car in front. Um, yeah, just waving hi. Ah, oh, they say hello. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's very. That's much more polite. As we see the the uh, blue disco lights on the side of the Ferrari now illuminated in full night vision mode. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with you about the the P2. Of course, when it's it's really happy when it's going through fast corners because it can use all of its uh, aerodynamics. But in the slow technical parts, it really is it is a challenge to hustle around the slow technical parts. It wants to understeer. It kind of feels a little bit almost just uncomfortable, really. And uh, yeah, and the one thing is that it's got so much power. I mean, 600 horsepower in a car that only has 900 kilograms to push around. And it all comes in at once because, of course, it's a it's an actually aspirated motor, so the throttle is immediate. And we see that a lot of the times the traction control really having to work very, very hard to keep the car on the road when you're putting the uh, putting the power down. Or if the driver is making sure that that traction control doesn't kick in right away. Again, in the slower corners, if it if it catches you off guard, you can send that rear end around. We the T3 Esports machine right here, currently in fourth. Marcus behind the wheel. He's about 10 seconds off of that podium position. They've kind of been running a lonely fourth place, but nighttime's coming in. Conditions are going to change, and it's going to be interesting to see all the cars that have been up front in the day, are they going to continue to be as dominant in the night? Absolutely. Who will be the who will be the vampires of the uh, <laughs> of the field uh, today? And uh, of course, this this uh, Dallara P2 machine uh, with the engine right there in the middle, underneath that shark fin, uh, it's actually produced uh, in Derbyshire uh, in England. And uh, Jonathan, do you know what the uh, the Gibson engine and the oh, we've got a spinner. It's the BMW again. It's the BMW GT3 of. Is that the Phoenix Racing BMW? No, it's the Milner Motorsport. Oh, oh it's the is or, the race organizers have unfortunately had a spin, and I say you may have gotten a little bit of help from a Porsche. It looked like it. Let's have a look at it then. So coming around Blanchimont, no problem there. There's a Porsche approaching, large in the mirror, it's coming into the bus stop. And oh yes, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Just, uh, I was trying to give him the benefit of the doubt there, but no, no, he, he was turned around. Jan van der Spring. Well, that's um, oh, that's so frustrating. It's the worst when you just wait for that that punt up the back, and then you go, oh, come on. You know, just waited just once, but gets back going again. But that car, the two eight five, was running strongly, but a couple of incidents have uh, cost him pro cost him time. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's kind of been a nightmarish stint for Bring here, and unfortunately, hopefully not a lot of damage to the rear of that car. There's already some damage in the front, but, you know, you just, if you're at the faster car, you just got to play the patience game. I really didn't think that 285 was in a good place to not get run over. I think the Porsche just got a little bit into that. I didn't actually see what Porsche that was that was involved in that incident. It'd be very interesting to see if they have any front end damage as well. It looked like a small nudge, but you know, when it's at the rear of the car, sometimes it doesn't necessarily need much. And you know, the, 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 the sad thing is, is that that has cost them there. That's cost them 24 seconds. So what was a relatively small incident has really, really hurt uh, the Milner Motorsport guys. Um, so they're now, they're now in, now interestingly, it says they are, yes, they are, they're sixth. I was just looking because, of course, 
Or if you look on the uh, the front left of the windshield there, viewers, you can see there's a little uh, a number six there, or zero six. That's a kind of LED panel that the GT3 cars have to tell the spectators where they are in the class. So if it's a zero one, then it's going very well. Uh, and then all the way through the field. So you'll see where the drivers are in their field. You won't see them on the GTE cars, um, but you do on the GT3 machines. Now, I'll, I'll come back to, I had a, a really good tip bit repair, um, prepared there, I should say. Uh, Jonathan, do you know what Ayrton Senna and the engine in the back of the Dallara LMP2 have in common? I have no clue, and I'm assuming you're about to tell me. This is tenuous, yes, it's very, very tenuous, but anyway, I shall carry on. So, Bill Gibson of Gibson Engines, which is the engine provider for all of the LMP2 class uh, at this current moment. So, Bill Gibson fun founded a company called Zytec in 1981, and originally they provided engine management systems for motorsport, and in fact supplied the first ever fully electric engine management system to the Tolman Formula One team, who, of course, debuted a young Ayrton Senna. So he used, and when Ayrton Senna had his debut, he used one of Bill Gibson's uh, Zytec electronic uh, control units. And then it became, he so, later sold the company and, uh, and started up Gibson Technologies as a, a, a new start. So it's, um, so there you go. That's, that's, is that the most tenuous link you've heard all week? Probably, it, it is probably the most interesting fun fact I think I've ever heard, it, but it makes me smile though, because <laughs> we, you know, it is a weekend where, where the Formula One team is going back to Imola and we're remembering center of the statue outside, obviously, as we see, unfortunately, what has been a disastrous stint for the 285 could become even more disastrous as Sergey Blum of the team RaceGitter.de, I wanted to say Glitter as well, <laughs> again, that is a funny team name that we should propose somewhere but the other BMW is hunting him down and that aerodynamic on the front of the 285 makes him weak and boo on but he's given the Ooh. brakes and so is that LMP2 who came flying in well now this is this is full BMW driver handbook here flashing the tail the headlights you see this on the road you see it on the racetrack uh, well this is, uh, it looks like Jan van der Spreng, he's got big issues, as you said, that aero damage is really causing him problems, and Sergey Bloom, he's saying, out of the way, um, you're, it's, it's kind of like the kind of injured lamb here, uh, and he's desperately just trying to get to the end, end of the stint, now looking at the stint, Jan van der Spreng, oh no, he's only, he's only three laps into his stint, so a trip into pit lane isn't necessarily an option right now. No, and that actually makes that spin that he had in the chicane even worse because those tires have kind of lost their freshness a little bit. And now he's still under attack in this 235. We're also at a little bit of a moment in Puhan, if you don't recall. So the two the two BMW drivers that have had a moment in Puhan together for the first time as they head into the source, deep on the brakes goes Blum. He's going to look to the inside, maybe get a down through Rattelon. Oh, this is going to be a little touch and go he's gonna get alongside him as we head to Rouge and rattle on not enough momentum from the 235 to really get a run but he's gonna have a really good run down the Kemmel straight yeah whenever you see two cars going side by side through Rouge, you all you think is well this normally ends well not <laughs> so we see uh, as they head down towards Lake Combe are they gonna sort it out here this is certainly an easier place to do it Side by side, round he goes. Can he make it stick there in the race? Get a dot de machine. He can. Great move there from Sergey Bloom. Gets the move done cleanly with a lot of traffic around here. There's a P2 car there blasting up the inside. That's the 77 Durner Motorsport Club machine going through, followed closely by the 40 car of Moto Racing Esports. Now, I presume that's the same Motul as in Motul Oil. I believe it might have some similarities. I, I went with the car and make sure we get the the colors and sponsor right on that one. But fortunately for them, behind that other LMP2 car in front, it's a very, very cool livery. But unfortunately, again, running in 10th in class, you know, it's a few laps into their stint. They've, they've been a little off strategy as well. They've been noticeably pinning later and stretching these stints out as much as they can. But it has not worked out for them. It looks like it is, so it is the same Motul. There's a Motul logo on the wing uh, there on the, just the, the end plate of the rear wing. So 
Ah, very cool. Of course, Motul, a, a major sponsor of the uh, IMSA WeatherTech Championship, and of course had their flagship event, the Motul Petit Le Mans, at Road Atlanta um, a couple of weeks ago. It's a thrilling event, and uh, Motul, I love the, um, where the the drivers in IMSA, when they set pole position, they, of course, they get out the car and they get given their Motul cap, but also they get a Motul pole winner sticker that they get to stick on their car for the race. That's, I like that. That's a nice touch. I think when I was uh, go-karting when I was little, it was always my favorite part of getting like a top five finish or a podium. Like just, just the little stickers on the side of the car. I could care less for the, the little medals or even the trophies, just the stickers. <laughs> the, the stickers are the best part. Absolutely, yeah. They, 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 there is something more more satisfying about the sticker. Often the trophy you've got to give back, which isn't isn't so nice. And uh, <laughs> it's uh, that's always when you it's. Uh, you know, you think, well, I, I'll, I'll make sure that I get to keep this trophy for the whole year before I lose it next year. Uh, that was certainly the case with uh, the very few sporting trophies that I won in my youth. Uh, one of which was the uh, the Scottish uh, National Club Curling Championship. Did you get to keep that one at least? Is there, is there a picture or a plaque somewhere of that I, one? I, I have the picture. Yep, we uh, our team of four. We uh, we got to keep it for a year, and and in fact we were so lazy that we we're actually late giving it back, which is often the <laughs> often the way it goes. You're probably just getting angry letters from. Yeah. <laughs> well, you really <laughs> need to give it winners. back now. You've lost for the last three years. Give it back. Speaking of angry, the Angry Bull Racing Team has closed up on the. WS Racing Esports Magenta car. This is the closest that several LMP2 cars have been together for position in quite some time. And maybe signs for the number 10 that running in the night may be better for them to see the Audi kind of get out of the way in the best way he can around Blanc Tremont as they head down into the chicane. And maybe the Angry Bull can pick up a few places here. That was an excellent segue. I love that one. Oh, there you go. There's a great example of just how hard these LMP2 cars are to ma manage on the exit of slow corners. You just saw a huge amount of uh, opposite lock had to be applied there, and he's going to be a little bit of a wiggle. As soon as you ask for the power, it's, whoa, it just wags its tail, this car. It's like a puppy. Really, really fast and indeed. 550 newton meters of torque, so it's or for in, in if you if you like 410 foot pounds so it's a lot of torque from a naturally aspirated engine the engine itself only weighs 135 kilos so it's a proper race bred engine this machine it's uh, uh, really really special and the thing that amazes me as well is just how protected the driver is in one of these cars no, I, think this, I think the safety standards of a lot of these like prototype cars are amazing and to avoid big accidents and big injuries and we've seen accidents and injuries and unfortunate passings of drivers in the past few years, notably the Formula 2 incidents at here at Spa actually and then prior to the 24 hours there was a big incident in the support Lamborghini class going three wide coming out of the source and it just did not work, a huge accident but thankfully all drivers were safe. And mentioned these prototype cars, they're light, they're quick, they are safe and that's one thing you have to love about, you know, the real world cars that they are safe. Now, in sim racing, you unfortunately cannot have injuries unless your uh, your wheel spins around in your hand and hurts your wrist, but it's the only injury I can think of. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it is, uh, that is one of the, the, I guess, if you like, an advantage uh, of, uh, of sim racing. And, yeah, when you see the dri anything to make the driver safer, out there in the real world is very important. For me, Jonathan, it's very important for preserving motorsport for the future because the standards of what we deem to be safe today are much advanced of what was de deemed to be safe 25 years ago. And 25 years from now, the standards will have will have will have gone up. So you've got you can you can never stop innovating with the safety. And I mean, we it's funny we we, we uh, when we saw the halo system come into. Formula One, and I remember everyone complaining about it and how ugly it was. And then I think it was maybe the sixth race with the system. It was here at Spa, and the usual last horse, turn one, hairpin pileup occurred. And Fernando Alonso's McLaren, I think it was, was punted straight over the top of the then rookie Charles Leclerc. And if the halo hadn't been there, well, it would have been 
well, almost guaranteed to have fatal consequences. So, and then funnily enough, not many people moaned about the halo after that. And it, it, it just shows you sometimes, yes, it might be strange to get used to, but you know, you will get used to it. And at the end of the day, if it keeps the driver safer, I'm, 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 I'll never criticize uh, any initiative to, to keep the driver on, uh, in, to give them more protection. No, and I know, like at first, like I was a bit, you know, pessimistic about it. Uh, as we see the racing car tucking through traffic right now, I think he was one of the, the one of the drivers involved in that little BMW incident earlier. But you're right. Any any time to improve safety is an improvement. And I know at first about the halo, I was like, eh, they should just go with the windscreen. But then again, the incident here at Spa with the Claire, and you saw the markings on the side of the halo, that if that wasn't there, the Claire would have easily been killed or seriously injured. And then even if you look on the across the pond over here in IndyCar where they added the aero screen. There was a huge accident in Iowa on a you know false start restart that ended up cars going over the top of each other and had it not been for the visor screen we could have had a serious accident. So any anytime safety improvements come into the sport that's key. Uh, someone in our chat has noticed that the Prism LMP2 car, the number 23, who I was talking about quite early on was running in the top five and has dropped all the way to 13th concerned about that is he's had a three minute and 45 second pit stop so he must have gotten towed and must have a bit of an issue well interestingly the car looks pretty clean so i wonder what has gone on there um that is very interesting we'll try to find out for you julian trenkel at the wheel of that car right now was running strongly uh, i tell you what how good does that car look at the paint on that car with the as the, with the sunlight on it, it changes colour. That's so cool. I've never seen that before on on a sim racing game. That that's someone who's like a graphic designer who clearly is either getting paid too much or has too much time on their hands. But it's still amazing to look at. And like a beautiful like in the sun. Look at like the, the aerial is even better. I'm again, mesmerized by that. That is extra. Well, whoever painted that car. I tip my hat to you. That is really, really cool. And again, unfortunately for them, they they must have had a long step of had to get a tow at some point, or maybe a disconnect. We know the technical issues, you know, the, the little gremlins that haunt us, the router issue, there's the internet connection. They haunt me too, don't worry. You know, it's not just the race drivers that haunt us, broadcasters too. I've had a little glitch here and there already. But maybe a technical issue like that, and unfortunately it's minute tow has cost him a lot. He's a couple laps behind some of his other rivals. Yeah, well, whatever's happened to them, they certainly look the best in class doing it, that's for sure. <laughs> that is, uh, yeah, very cool. Prism, uh, Prism Sim Racing Beta. Very, very cool indeed in the 23 car. Running a pretty significant nut sporting number as well. Of course, uh, 23, the number uh, of the, the great Michael Jordan who is uh, about to step into, for, for the second time, stepping into uh, some motor racing uh, team ownership. Of course, he did run a, a American Superbike team for quite a while with um, the brother of uh, the late, great Nicky Hayden, and uh, Roger Hayden, racing for him. Um, but now, of course, going into NASCAR, Jonathan, which is your area of expertise, I understand. Yeah, going into NASCAR, it's a, I think it's a big investment, and it's definitely something that at least for NASCAR, like the sport needs, and I think 2020 has been a rough year, I think, for motorsports in general. We've talked a lot about IMSA, but, you know, that GTE class, it only has six cars in it. And then, like, the factory Porsche team, you know, you mentioned it's not for their standards. They're also leaving at the end of the year. So having an investment like Michael Jordan come in with the sponsorship that he brings with the investment from a successful driver, Denny Hamlin, and then with a... And a little bit of an unproven raw talent in Bubba Wallace coming in as a driver who's been a forefront for social change in NASCAR. Like, it's it's a much-needed thing, I think, for, for them to get back some popularity because NASCAR has definitely been waning in popularity, and IndyCar has really stepped in and taken taken over, I think, as a big source of motorsport. So we look back at the 10 car of Angry Bull. It's fallen a bit off from the WS Racing Esports Magenta car, and... Maybe that's just a product of the traffic. We see a battle right here. First time we've seen a really good battle for position. Two BMWs going at it. Ooh, that that was a little close to, to, for comfort. They're going into the combs. Oh, that was yeah. They, they, of course, it just bottlenecks to there, doesn't it? It's and you see so many cars 
having side-to-side -side contact through that section and uh, requires a lot of compliance from both drivers and of course all of the drivers here in this race they're all on their own sim setup at home uh, and there's a variety of different setups you can have you can have uh, a single screen you can have triple screens, which are kind of like a wrap around, or you can have a, a curved screen that wraps around you. Or some drivers now are using a virtual reality headset, which, for me, the the competitive advantage if you can, if you can, if it doesn't make you seasick, <laughs> the virtual reality headsets for me give a huge advantage in perception to see what the cars around you are doing. Now you can actually look in the mirrors and look around you and get like a. You know, some of those blind spots you normally get on, like, say, the single monitor setup are no longer there, so it's really good for making the, the really strong moves like that, as it appears that 247 is really struggling. You know, PK just got around him, and Albrecht has already fallen almost two seconds behind. That 247 has some front-end damage, but I'm wondering if they're just really struggling right now for pace in the stint. Yeah, so it's Finn Albrecht, um, yeah, running about four and a half seconds off uh, his absolute outright best pace so about lap 13 of the stint so he's still got plenty time to go um so yeah maybe just picked up some form of damage or sometimes you just get these you can just get these especially in a long race you can just get these spells of 10 or 15 minutes where you your lap times just fall off the the, the cliff and it, sometimes you can just go i actually don't know why that is it's just sometimes you just go out of form for a little bit yeah, kind of like the rhythm thing too, and we, you know, we mentioned that it's getting dark out. It's getting darker and darker, and the lights illuminating the track from the cars. You know, it's going to be very difficult for them to to stay in a rhythm, so to speak. As we have another battle right here, the, the other, the Prim System Racing Alpha car. Oh, well, this has to be just as pretty paint scheme. Has tracked down the Race Union Porsche, and this is going to be a fight, hard fight for fourth. We have the Race Getter .de car in the way. It's it's going to be an interesting fight. I think this is for the top. Now, this is the second top Porsche honors right now. The two Corvettes in a league of their own still up front. The Bendy Gods and HM Engineering. But this is this is going to be a key fight, I think. It is absolutely nothing to separate between these cars, of course, apart from the setup installed on them. They, and I have to say, this to me, Jonathan, this Porsche, it's not a race car. It's a four-wheeled musical instrument. It's an absolute beauty of a machine. A four-liter, naturally aspirated <laughs> has that really distinct Porsche sound, that wailing flat sick boxer engine, 500 horsepower, it's an absolute gem this car. And interestingly as we see the Prism Sim Racing Alpha car going around the outside, gets the nose ahead, heading into Lecombe, can he make this stick? Oh, a little bit of contact there, oh dear, that was a bit saucy. So yeah, flashing lights, the Race Union car. Uh, well, that's getting interesting indeed, and as, if these guys are, are battering each other back and forward, the Ferrari, the 152 car, will be on them before he knows it. And the weird thing is, too, the, the race union car is struggling for pace. They're only five laps into their stint, so it looks like they're a bit off cycle compared to their rivals, and they were two seconds slower, you know, last time by compared to the Prism Sim Racing Alpha and compared to the Ferrari. So I'm wondering if there's a little bit of damage. There's a little bit at the rear there, but I don't think that's going to affect the Porsche very much going through these corners. We're going to have to see if, uh, well, Putskin is able to set up another big attempt going into the cones, but that was very aggressive driving from Justin Wackman. It was indeed, yeah. At this stage of the race, you don't really want to make any contact unless you, act. well, there is no reason if you have to, but you, if you can really help it, it's good to try and avoid the contact wherever possible. But yes, this, uh, of course, this car won the uh, the IMSA WeatherTech Championship last year in the hands of Lawrence Van Tour and uh, Errol Bramberg, who both won the uh, Spa 24 Hour last week with uh, Nick Tandy. But of course, been replaced this year by a, a new model, a 4.2 litre naturally aspirated car with a completely different engine, though. And as, as you rightly mentioned earlier on, Jonathan, it's not had the well, it's had the pace of its rivals. The one lap pace has not been an issue, but in the races, they've just not been able to quite deliver and finally getting the car's first win in IMSA at Petit Le Mans a couple of weeks ago. But uh, of course, as you, as you rightly said, Porsche leaving IMSA at the end of the, the season uh, in GTLM, and that just leaves the Corvette and the BMW. And well, 
you wonder if uh, with just two manufacturers if that's if that will carry on that class it's, it's something i do love about some racing uh, some of the cars and manufacturers you can you can race no matter where you are and you don't have to pay huge amounts of sums of money just to get a brand car as we see work puts going again into lacombe's he thought about it but workman is going to hold him up yet again but in, in sim racing, at least, you can race a huge variety of cars. You can still see, you know, the Irish series still allows the Ford GT, the 2017 car, in their GT classes. And that car they actually did decently well. I think it finished fifth in the class there. So it, we had the Fords, the Ferraris, the BMWs. And I think it's something that in real life GT racing we're not getting at the moment. But definitely in sim racing, we're still seeing the wide variety of manufacturers going toe to toe. It's very. It's very entertaining to see, and I love seeing all the different cars out on track. Indeed, yeah, absolutely. And of course, that's uh, in contrasting fortune. That's how the the GT3 um, racing world, if you like, uh, both in in the sim and in the real world, especially variety is certainly not. We're not not short of variety there. We've got Acuras, Lexus, BMW, uh, Audi, Porsche, Aston Martin. Uh, Glickenhaus, <laughs> we've got all different kinds of uh, GT3 machine and for me Jonathan I think the GT3 rules which we see the cars with the, the yellow uh, indication in this race, I think the GT3 rules are as a global formula, I think that's the way forward uh, uh, going for, for the future. And it definitely seems like a, it's also a good balance as well, there's not one or two manufacturers or cars that are very very strong it seems like a very good tight feel then you know again manufacturers can easily get into it it's not as something expensive as the gt feels we saw we've seen on the inside of the corvette multiple times today or tonight depending on where you're viewing us that it's it, it looks like a spaceship a rocket ship on the inside of it there's so many buttons and knobs in the view view camera there's so many little controls and things you can change we see Book Puts is going to get a huge draft into Eau Rouge and Radion right now, and now maybe he can try again into the Combs, but there's a there's a prototype on the outside, so he can't move yet. Got to get more of a draft, and now he's going to use the prototype draft. Wackman moving to the outside. It's going to be you know last of the late breakers heading into the Combs again. Ooh, it's a great battle, isn't it? Inter Porsche battle here between the 187 Race Union and the 113. Prism Sim Racing Alpha machines. Uh, a little bit of damage on the back of the race union, which was there before that brief contact at Lake Home a couple of laps uh, ago. And uh, yeah, just coming back to your, your comment about the, the Corvette, you're right, it's an incredibly sophisticated piece of kit. And it's uh, so much so that, uh, of course, Chevrolet only play a, they play a part in that car, but of course they entrust the help of a company called Pratt & Miller to both uh, build and run those cars and uh, Pratt & Miller's um, day job if you like is uh, in the defense industry and satellites and all sorts of complex things like that so race cars are really um, well kind of a bit of um, <laughs> they're, they're pretty easy for them I think compared to what they normally do if he's doing rocket science then well I'm going to tell you this ain't rocket science this, this battle is continuing to heat up Walkman got a little bit wide there and then the Prism car had to check up a white quotes and this battle is heating up more and more and more. Unfortunately, online sim racing.de in sixth place has not been really to take advantage of this. His lap time is still similar to these two fighting Porsches. And he does have a big gap to make up to even get here. So it'll be interesting to see as we head down into the chicane. Hard on the brakes is that Prototype behind trying desperately not to nick the back of that Porsche and then yeah, the LMP2s have to be so careful coming out of the chicane. Almost like the GT cars have almost an advantage going through the chicane compared to the LMP2s. I, I, th I think they actually do. I think if you micro-analyzed each meter of that last section into the bus stop, once the cars come off the brakes, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think the GT cars, in the really slow speed technical stuff, particularly in the GTE class, they are quicker, I'm, I'm pretty certain of it. And then, as soon as they come out the field, then the uh, the Space Shuttle <laughs> LMP2 cars fire off into uh, into the distance uh, uh, as well. And um, so, who is going to who is going to overcome this battle of the Porsches, the uh, the number the number 187 race union and the 113 
Prism Sim Racing Alpha. Now, interestingly, Sim Racing Alpha, they're on lap 18 of their stint. Race Union are only on lap 8. So they're in quite different strategical places right now. So uh, stint-wise, we should expect ooh, about 23 laps, possibly, maybe 22 for these guys. Depending on how hard you're going, you can get you can get 24 if you're lucky, as we're seeing guys that have the 17 and 18 laps since that would be the LMP2s. All the top five have gone on a pit road since is still holding the lead. Also done a driver change and almost two minutes in pit lane. Now the gap is only eight seconds for the overall lead. Julian Reinhardt now for them, but it's about five or six more laps really for Luke Pooks to get around that Porsche. I don't even know if he wants to fight him if they're on opposite strategies already. Is it really worth fighting this hard? Possibly not. No, that's a very good question. Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, the uh, oh, as you see, the prototypes just coming flying through, and it's interesting to see a lot of the front-running GT guys. They are making sure, leaving room for the the prototypes. They know they need to co-inhabit. They both the prototypes and the GTs know they've got to try and make room, make it easy. And of course, the thing is, over 24 hours, all of these drivers will be passing each other back and forward so many times that. They'll kind of, you almost build up a kind of uh, notebook, don't you, uh, Jonathan? That they, you know the drivers, the cars that you you that have behaved around you, and you know the drivers that haven't behaved around you. And you think, oh, this is the problem car. Let's avoid this one, or let's you know not give him any room because he didn't give me any room or whatever. So it's it, it, we're getting to that point in the race now where the drivers will have built up a kind of notebook about the cars around them. Yeah, and every, and every driver of every team has almost had a shot in the car, at least so far, too, so you can get a feeling of who's aggressive, who isn't, as Walk puts. This is the closest he's been, I think, and he's going to get a huge run. Very, very defensive is the reunion of Wickman, and they're going to go side-by-side side again into Lake Holmes. Wickman's been brave on the brakes. Uh -oh. He's brave again. They're almost into each other. The Prism car hanging tough on the inside. Wickman able to defend the position again. And there's a slower Audi, or no, that's a slower, uh, faster Corvette behind who's caught them and is probably wondering, well, what the heck did I just get myself into? And that is the 169. That's the Bendley Gods car of Andreas Dahlstrom coming through. So putting these guys another lap down. Uh, and I, I tell you what, I, I don't think, uh, throughout our uh, entire commentary stint, I'm, I'm going to be able to keep saying that without thinking Bentley Gods. <laughs> Uh, and like we say, why not? Let's start a campaign, get the Bentley and I racing, the Bentley GT3, that would be so cool. Um, an absolute monster. In fact, they're actually, um, those cars are actually built not that far from where I'm in Scotland. They're built just south of the Scottish border in a place called Cockermouth uh, in Cumbria by the Ford World Rally team of uh, M Sport. And you'll also be happy to know, if you do enjoy that car, Peter, that a local track by me where I live, uh, Road America. Um, every time I've been there for the GTE America class, the, the Bentley team, the one and only Bentley team has won in the, in that class. So I think that will probably make your heart happy. It makes me happy too seeing a different manufacturer winning as again slap traffic being frustrating, I think, for the two Porsches that are fighting. That's even a slower car behind. That's an Audi that's trying to fight with these two Porsches. That's really hurt the, the, the Prism Racing car, the 113 there. It's really pushed them back, and the Corvette coming through has definitely shuffled it out with the full headlights on now as well. That does make me very happy. You're right, Jonathan. And I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm devastated. I did. I had my tickets booked. I was due to come to the uh, IMSA event at Road America this year, but of course, I uh, couldn't travel over. And uh, I, I, I had to watch it on TV, and it was—it uh, certainly wasn't a boring race. That's for sure. The IMSA race at Road America this year. Well, the, and the weather definitely made it exciting. As weather out, <laughs> out in the Midwest can be very, very unpredictable, <laughs> and giant monsoons like that can definitely enrage. And Road America is—it's not on par with Spa, but it's definitely up there in terms of the beauty and how you know that track behaves and the elevation changes and all that as this fight continues on. Phoenix Racing did not make a driver change and has been able to make up a huge gap for the overall lead, Going jumping back to the LMP2 fight. And it's down to 10 seconds as this GT fight continues. I'm wondering also if this is even good for Race Union to be defending this hard. If they know they're on opposite strategies, then why not just let the faster Prism Racing car go? 
yeah, that's that is the the thing. Unless I mean, it, there's so many permutations, and of course, all the drivers will be speaking to one another and thinking of what they're trying to do, and they'll be getting information from spotters, which might be their fellow co-drivers or team helpers or what have you. Um, but yeah, it could be that race union thinking we've got no business being up here in fourth, but why while we're up here, why don't we try and slow some of the fast guys down? Or they're thinking, well, we need to, we can't let these guys get into the rhythm. There's so many permutations, and that's what I think at the end of the day in a sprint race, it's very simple overtake the guy in front of you at all costs. But in endurance racing, as you rightly mentioned, Jonathan, it's there's so many different permutations as to how they go about it. But I think, I tell you what, I think the prism car might make a move here into the bus stop. He's right beside him, going through Blanchimont, but not quite. But is he thinking about it? Ooh. We'll need to watch. Uh, did someone say Lecom? I think that's where we might see it. This is about as like textbook aggressive defending as you can get right now from Justin Workman, and this this is actually really hurting the Prism team as well because, you know, they've already been lapped by the two other Corvettes that lead Porsche, the Austral the Austrian sim racers. Excuse me, not Australian. The Austrian sim racers. That gap has been growing and growing and growing. Yeah, of course, the Austrian sim racers, the leading uh, the leading car. Of the um, Porsches, so let's here we go then. He's got a good run, a very good run, and gets ooh, uh, about a Porsche 911's width of space to play with. And oh, Prism car swoops across the nose, hard on the brakes, a very firm move indeed. But gets the oh, oh no. contact! Oh, that was save it, save it, save it, save it. Are they both save it? Oh, that's a pity. Um, it just it had the move done. And really, when you're the car behind, it's up to you not to make that thing, uh, not to make that mistake. But uh, how do you see this one, Jonathan? Well, I think this this is definitely frustration. That move right there from the Prism Racing of Tom Wick, but he's been frustrated behind that slower car, and then, oof, just I, yeah, you gotta know that that car is in front of you. You gotta lay off a little bit, and after that first contact, it didn't seem like the reunion car backed off at all. It seemed like he continued to put the throttle down, so I don't really understand that one. We'll hopefully review and a decision made about that incident shortly. Well, it didn't help either of them, that's for sure, and look at the state of that prism car now. Big damage at the back of the car now for the, for the prism racing machine, the 113 car, on lap 21 of the stint, so will be able to get into pit lane shortly but race union they're on their lap 11 so they've got to kind of they can't come in now they can't waste half a stint they've got to keep going and prism now passed but with damage and just before the end of their stint that's not what they wanted but uh, like you say the frustration stepped in you think i'm making this move whether it <laughs> whether it hurts me or not i've got to get this move done yeah and it, uh, but there's a little bit of push comes to shove when it comes to that too i really just feel like you know, the Prism Racing Machine of Wickpath had the position and should have been able to, you know, keep it. I didn't think that, I don't even think he thought the Race Union car was going to come back at him as aggressively as he did as well at the end of Lacombe's. So it'll be interesting to see how this damage affects him going forward, especially that Race Union car, because that front end damage might hurt him in the straight line speed. As someone in the chat has mentioned, there's been an issue between the 211 and the 289 and the 142. And that's the Valkyrie green team, and then some of the teams lower down in the order in the GT3 class. Maybe we'll get a idea of what has happened there with those drivers, but hopefully the Prism Machine doesn't have a lot of... <laughs> and that's a hairy moment for Phoenix Racing right there. Jeez, it's all happening here where the darkness descends on Spa here on Halloween night as well, of course. Uh, so well, this is getting very spooky now, um, indeed. So, yeah, this is, um, now there's problem, I think, as well, for Familian Bomber, ah, yes, sorry, my apologies, Familian Bomber taking their pit stop from the GT3 lead, Simza Esports GT3 going by, but they will be due a pit stop any minute now as well, so, uh, that's how that's all shaking out, but, uh, yeah, for Phoenix Racing there in the LMP2 car, Christopher Hansa 
Well, that's just a great example of how in the P2 class particularly, there's always something around the corner potentially coming to bite you. You have to have your, your wits about you at every single corner of these entire 24 hours. Yeah, and you gotta be, you gotta be flawless. And it's about, you know, we mentioned keeping it clean and the little things of just making sure you, you don't screw up the in and out laps, making sure you're keeping the car on the track, no little contact as we see. You know, the, ra the sim race organizers, the Portland Motorsports Sim Racing Pro Car, has gotten close to the WS Racing Esports Magenta, but I feel like every time we see the W Racing Esports Magenta getting chased down, it, uh, it, it continues to win. It looks like they've also gotten past the Angry Bull, and Angry Bull Racing has dropped significantly. Uh huh, right. So let's have a look. Angry Bull Racing. They're, they're Something's not happened to the leader. In LMP2? So, Simpsons Esport is in the pits, only four races in, and they appear to have been towed. <laughs> I think yeah, the ah. Simpsons Esports car has had an accident. Uh-oh. So, let's have a look then. The number six, that's at the bus stop, isn't it? Yeah, going very, very slowly at the bus stop. Oh. Oh, he's made a mistake going into pit. That's a bizarre, but let's try and get another replay. Yes, so we're coming around out of uh, campus out towards Blanchimont. Now Blanchimont is flat out in an LMP2 car. There's two GT cars up ahead. So what happens to Julian Reinhardt here? Coming through Blanchimont, does one of the GT cars lose it in front of him, maybe? No. Oh! Oh, oh dear, 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 dear. Oh, oh that's another hit too. That BMW is, that BMW behind is destroyed for one. But two, that was a, uh, oh, that. He gets a big run through Blanchemont. They're heading to the chicane. He's gonna look. Uh, he had room on the right and try to go right, but that is a lot of damage now. I the IMSA, Simsa Esports car. I'm kind of speechless. Yeah, me too. I have to say it's. Uh, I'm not. I'm not often speechless. Uh, I'm normally got too many words, but my word, that was. Uh, Oof, and that's our race leader, of course, no longer, and that poor BMW, I'm absolutely destroyed. And to, to me, Jonathan, what, nothing that BMW could have done. He was on his normal line, doing, you know, being predictable, and all of a sudden he's just ploughed by a, by a prototype coming through. Maybe jinked a little bit, but the room was never there, I don't think. And I don't think there was a car's width there, so he had to go the other side. Oh, what a disaster for Simza Esports of Julian Renard. And there's look at the front wheel. The front left wheel is jammed on, so they've got suspension damage or steering damage. And that is them. They have now got the next 16 hours to try and recover that problem. Yeah, they were in the down in class. They've been up front, and that's just... Yeah, the one thing that race control might need to look at too is if with that BMW comes back to the side and who the blame is on. This was an issue, again, in a lot of other spot endurance series that we've seen, you know, heading up to the chicane, trying to predict where the LMP2 car is going to go and where the GT car is going to go. It's always an issue, and it is. He's trying to get to pit. He was trying to, his darndest to get to pit row, but it just was not happening. So we'll keep an eye on to see how long he's going to be in pit lane at the moment. Yeah, already a couple of minutes there in pit lane. So it's yeah, not good for Simsy Esports yet well over three minutes now. So, well, that changes this race completely and it's Christmas come early for Phoenix Racing Esport Green, who lead by a minute and 14 seconds from Ring Fazar Sim Racing LMP2. They're both they both had 12 pit stops and they're both on the sixth lap for those pit stops. So Phoenix Racing Esport Green are in the driving seat now in LMP2. Yeah, when they're a minute gap, now they have, you know, they had a little bit of a moment for a second ago with GT traffic as well as now the night. This is where things get dangerous as well. It's hard to predict where cars are going to be and you, know, you don't have as good a vision as you do in the sunlight now as we are fully bathed in darkness. And this is going to be a good fight. Right here is actually Polar Esports has gotten away from W Racing Esports Magenta. So it's a good little stint that Alexander is putting together. He's got two spots so far and maybe get a third soon if he can track down that 77. 
Yeah, crazy, isn't it? After uh, eight, nearly eight hours of racing, uh, there's a number of close battles out on the track. Tell you what, the, uh, the little red Corvette, HM Engineering, driven by Mark McCormack, doing a great job at the wheel of that car right now with a reasonably healthy lead over uh, about 26 seconds from the Bendley Gods team. So comfortable-ish, <laughs> as we've just seen with the Simza car, there's no such thing as a comfortable lead, which is, uh, they were certainly looking good at that point, but uh, put themselves right down the order now. But uh, at the moment, looking good for HM Engineering, who are one of the real rising teams in uh, in sim racing right now. Yeah, a lot of swerving back and forth. The slower M2 car gets out of the way. To Lang trying to get back around, running comfortably there in the fifth spot. But now, as they head down into Brussels and into No Name Corner, yeah, it's it's nice to see them to getting their name out there, and especially organizing an event like this as well. It takes a lot of resources, manpower, and communication to really make this work. So good for a team on the rise, not to only like showcase their driving ability here with a good stint, picking up a few spots, but you know, also making an event and drawing other teams in. Absolutely, yeah, indeed. And of course, uh, H oh, oh, one of the Audis has got a spinning <laughs> Audi there, a GT3 car. Now, who was that? I couldn't quite tell in the dark there who that was. It's the 210, it's Wolf Motorsports, uh, 11th in class. So, let's have a look then, what happens. Flashing his lights at a GTE car ahead, not happy at all. And here comes an LMP2, oh dear. Bang, oh. So it's almost as if he was kind of upset with the car in front, flashing his lights, and then all of a sudden here comes an LMP2 car and gives him something else to be upset about. Like, I'm already upset at one class, now you have like two classes for me to, to be angry at. That's upsetting. And now now the thing for the Muller Motorsport cars, do they have any front aero damage that might play into Lucas Lang's hands? And I think he was angry at the prism cars. We see someone diving down the pit lane. But those types of spins and accidents, especially in the dark like this, this is where like things are going to get dicey, especially with guys coming back on track and any little contact like that. It, it's going to be hard, I think, going forward if there's any more little incidents like that. We've had a relatively quiet last hour until a few minutes ago. Yeah, it just seems that when the full darkness has come down, that's when the, the issues have really started to happen. So it might be that some teams now, at their next pit stop, they try to get a fresh driver in there and just try and chase things up. Okay, you do lose a little bit of time with the driver change, but sometimes you've got a driver who's been, you know, battering away for a couple of hours. You really need that fresh head for the... Uh, for coming into the darkness hours and uh, that's going to be vital. We've seen it mainly be incidents between faster prototypes and the slower GTs and both drivers just going about the race but uh, that's where the problems have be have come from so uh, let's see how the teams handle that going through uh, the next little while. I'm interested to note as well like how does the strategy in the LMP2 class play out? I'm sure Phoenix Racing was all about chasing down Simsa. Well, after that incident with the BMW, well, that strategy's out the window, so now they got to think about maintaining the lead and not losing it to any other pieces. So we'll really see how this plays out. Yeah, and they're still in the lane. Uh, according to my timing screen, they are, well, eight, eight, over eight minutes in the lane right now, and I think they'll be there for some time because that car had a lot of damage, I would suspect. I mean, for something like that, Jonathan, would it be half an hour, an hour, something like that? Yeah, it really depends on how much, how hard he hit that front end on the wall. He hit very hard, although that, B, that BMW that got hit did not get, <laughs> got the worst of it, I think. So it, it really is a shame for some sub, but I think if they can get back out, maybe run some laps, maybe pick up a few places as well, you know, seeing... What other things go wrong? Again, we have not really had many incidents. Only had two drivers retire from this race, the 11 Progressive Sim Racing car and then the 222 Phoenix Racing Esport Orange car are the only drivers not in the sim. So a few more incidents, a few more retirees, and maybe Simpson can get another, you know, a top 10 out of this, get some a little bit of redemption back. Well, the good thing for Simza is they're right in the battle with the uh, 
Familiar Bomber team for the win on GT3. It's BMW versus BMW there, so uh, there's a good battle, uh, good battle going on. So their day is far from done, and it's not done in LMP2 either. They uh, there is still plenty, plenty racing to go. We're going to ride on board with the number 159 HM Engineering Little Red Corvette uh, of Mark McCormack, who's leading the GTE class at the moment. So. We're going to go for an onboard, oh, look at that, nice and dark and gloomy inside the uh, the Corvette C8R. We're going to go for a race spot fan immersion and allow you to enjoy a few laps on board of this wonderful Corvette. And we will be back very soon. Don't go. Uh, 
Welcome back to Spark from Kishon, and I hope you enjoyed that wonderful little onboard trip with Rasmus Busk in the HM Engineering Little Red Corvette. So let's have a run through how the drivers sit as we're now 15 hours and 50 minutes to go in this motor race. Leading the race is Phoenix Racing Esport Green, number 66. Yes, if you're tuning in just now, the number 6 Simza Esports car has hit problems after a collision with a GT3 BMW on the entry to the bus stop and he's in the pit lane taking repairs. Ringfazar Sim Racing LMP2 have moved up to second position with T3 Esports in third. Durna Motorsport Club E.V are in fourth with Miller Motorsport Sim Racing Pro, WS Racing Esports Magenta, Angry Bull Racing and the Bull Out Racing 2 in eighth spot. GTE, uh, it is the Bendley Gods who are leading from HM Engineering with uh, the pit stop still to shake out. It should see those positions reverse once more. Online SimRacing.de and their Ferrari are up to third place with Ring Fazart Sim Racing DE, uh, GTE sorry, in fourth. Prism Sim Racing are in fifth, followed by Austrian Sim Racers, Race Union, and Valkyrie E Racing. Finally, in our GT3 battle, it's still the familiar bomber BMW, the 257 machine, leading from Simza Esports GT3, holding up the honour of Simza Esports at this stage of the race. Absolute Motorsport are in third with Ring Bazaar Sim Racing in fourth. German Performance Sim Racing are in fifth, followed by Milner Motorsport Team Race Gitter, and also in eighth, Reperix by Alto Motorsport are three laps back from the leader and Jonathan well I have to say that was well as soon as the darkness descended the drama ensued almost immediately we've got the prime time hours this is where the, <laughs> this is where the lights come on and this is where all the fun I think begins and we've had a few incidents and collisions again our overall leader big collision there are back out on track it would appear I did see them uh, running in yep, 6 Julian Reinhardt running in the sixth position or not in the sixth position in the sixth car running in the tenth position but then that earlier collision with the prism esports car and the racing Union car is under investigation for causing a collision so that could pick up the midfield of the gte classes we still have we still have this prototype fight and it's unfortunately hit a lot of gt traffic <laughs> Oh, thanks. there's a lot of traffic here. This is like uh, the Champs-Élysées. It's very, very busy indeed here coming through Lecombe down towards the Brussels hairpin. And yeah, this is very busy for the, the prototypes. And of course, when you get into these slow sections, they get really quite twitchy and not very happy indeed. We've got the GTE leader up ahead, the uh, HM Engineering red Corvette there. The one five nine car but the uh, prototypes get by cleanly um, so yeah it's uh, it's good to see the 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 Simsy esports car back and running again but four laps down 10 minutes in the pit lane i suspect uh, jonathan that they haven't got all of the damage sorted no there's probably some serious aero damage a lot of optional repair that they decided not to repair which I will be okay. I think they can probably nick a, lick a little bit of a wave of it throughout the stints, but I don't think they're going to be able to progress really through the field with that kind of damage. As again, these <laughs> a little bit swerving there from the HMM Pro cars. He didn't know where the GT car was going to end up. Lucas Lang, these two have been inseparable so far. And Jack, Alexander Jacob gets a little bit of a gap now as they head through the chicane. And we're nearing the end actually of the stints. For the LMP2 cars, so it'll be interesting to see stops play out for these two since they're right next to each other. Indeed, yes. At the moment, uh, Milner Motorsport they've done 13 laps. Uh, WS Racing Esports Magenta done 18. Turn Motorsport Club 14. So yeah, I mean 18 laps. That's right on the the fuel limit for uh, Lucas Lang in the WS Racing Esports Magenta car. So that car is bound to come in any probably at the end of this lap. I would suggest. And probably a little bit, you know, backing off there to save some fuel, maybe get a draft, realizing, all right, it's the end of the stint. Let's not push it right now. 
Maybe a little bit of an undercut here. If they're on slightly different strategies, an undercut could work out for Lucas Lang, and they can get back ahead of the 21. But they still have an uphill fight to go chase down the Junior Motorsport Club of Dominic Spiker in the 17, in the 77, excuse me. Almost a full lap behind him. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it, to see that you know the only the top, well, actually the top three are the only ones on the on the lead lap at this stage of the race. So we get kind of spoiled, don't we, with uh, endurance racing now with so many cars on the lead lap. There's uh, there's so much that can happen as we've seen already here at Spa. And of course, it's not like it. It's completely different to well, even to Le Mans, but it's uh, very different to somewhere like Daytona where they have the Rolex 24, where You've got so much lighting, but here there are parts of the circuit here at Spa which are just like driving into the abyss. Sometimes that's why, you know, sometimes being in traffic may be a good thing because there's enough lights on the road to see what's going ahead. Is Lucas Lang getting very, very close now. There's a slower car ahead, and they're both going to have to take evasive maneuvers. There's Audi plopping himself in the middle of the corner. They're going to head to the chicane. Offensive goes to Jadero, or unless he's just backing off and letting him pass. Yeah, he's just backing him off and letting him by. So that is a very interesting tactic there. And, oh, never mind. Lucas comes into the pits. <laughs> yeah, he was maybe not expecting him to do that. He's probably thinking, that's very kind, but n not on this occasion, thank you. Maybe another. Save it for later on. <laughs> of course, Lucas lying there right on the end of his stint. 19 laps, um, so about 38 minutes on a, a tank of fuel. That's a good run from Lucas Lang in the 64 car. Um, so he comes in down this endlessly long and slow. And just coming back to that, that little incident we had between the Prism Sim Racing Porsche and the Race Union Porsche, if one of those cars does get incident responsibility and has to serve a drive through A drive through here, it's got to be the most punishing drive through penalty in the entire world. And I believe one of them has gotten a drive through penalty. drive through penalty three laps time, causing a collision. The... I don't know who that's to though. It doesn't say who that's to, it just says the two cars involved, so we may have to double check or poke someone to get clarification. Oh, both maybe. <laughs> maybe them saying it takes two to tango, you can both sit on the naughty step. Uh, yeah, that was a bit of a... <laughs> there was, you know, it, it did take two to tango on that one. I'm wondering, wondering if it's actually towards the 187 for the contact at the very end of Lacombe's there. And, we're gonna, and it's going to be interesting to see who comes down pit road, because I believe that just got updated. So we'll have to see which one of those two it will be. I'm sure we'll get an idea of it in moments' time, as we see now. Different stints ending for different drivers. Looks like the GTE cars stints, some of them on pit road. And the end of the stints is going to be for the LMP2 cars as well. Indeed, so we'll see how, how they get on. Um... Interesting complexion to this race now, how there's a few drivers that have hit issues, a few teams that have hit issues, and a lot of drivers having, there's very few cars out on the circuit that haven't got damage, and those that don't have damage are usually the cars that are running up the front, and I mean, particularly HM, HM Engineering doing a great job to hold off the, the battle in GTE from the Bendley Gods and it's just about 30 seconds separating those guys at the moment. They're on a relatively similar strategy. Interestingly, the HM Engineering guys have actually taken one more pit stop. They've taken nine, Bendley Gods have taken eight and they're both on a similar stint length at the moment. So I wonder why that is The HM Engineering have had that extra stop. Maybe we're back in the Penalty? No, I don't think they've gotten any penalties or anything like that. Maybe a little bit of damage um, from earlier on mm. or something like that. But obviously, it doesn't seem to affect them as much as they're currently still leading the race. And it was a close fight between those two for quite some time. And lap after lap, the Agent of Engineering car continues to just gap the leader. It's been... Just a second or so a lap, so you see, like right there on the graphic, two seconds, two laps ago, a 112.4. That was a fantastic lap from Bus. But 
we'll really have to see how this battle plays out. They were very, very close at the end, you know, of the day into the evening kind of transition there. And it seems like the HM Engineering car has gotten the advantage. It looks like it. Yeah, it certainly does. And um, for HM Engineering, interestingly, they, um, they have their fastest lap of the race is a 2 minute 11.9. The Bendley God's fastest lap of the race is a 2.12.8. So there's on outright pace in those cars, there's a little bit of an edge for HM Engineering. And as that graphic quite clearly shows, there is a big difference in uh, uh, in pace at this stage as well. So uh, HM Engineering starting to turn the screw a little bit with uh, Busk and McCormack. Uh, let's see. And that, that's also the thing that I've noticed as well with this uh, with this Corvette, um, uh, Jonathan, is that it's a brilliant car to just consistently click off laps. It's a really predictable car. It's nice and balanced. It's It doesn't spring too many surprises on you. And it's quick as well, obviously. And th I think that's when we come through the darkness hours, this Corvette is going to really come into its own even more. Yeah, I think that's the, really the key in terms of what car you would enjoy really in the GTE. I think that the, the Corvette, and especially the BMW as well, I think are very, very predictable. The Porsche, more unstable, you, you don't really know because it is a bit of a different build, but it's still a good, consistent car. Do you see this fight? The Austrian Sim racers are tracking town, racing Alpha car with authority right now, under a second. And it's going to be a close fight within a few seconds here as they go through the source. There's a slower BMW on the outside there. They might get a huge run heading down to the Lacombs. Yeah, get a bit of a double bubble draft here uh, will the Austrian sim racers. And, of course, the Prism sim racing car has the potential of a drive-through penalty as, ah, the Austrian sim racers car gets that little bit, just tiny bit held up by the BMW Z4 GT3 there. And that's just allowed the Prism car just to edge away ever so slightly. So, got it all to do once more. Yeah, but he's been consistently faster than the Prism. He's also been in front of the Prism most of the race. It's just that it appears the uh, the 137 has done a driver change on that last stop. Tuscarf getting in the car, while Tom Wankpez and the Prism car staying in. So these are probably the first two times these two cars have been close to each other in quite some time. And the Austrian sim racer is definitely trying to flex a little bit of their muscle here, so showing like, hey, we're definitely faster. Yeah, they certainly, they're of course running, as you rightly say, running third um, for the last couple of hours or so. But uh, just shows you making that driver change, it's quite an investment, isn't it? You do not get a driver change for free in terms of time. You've got to sacrifice some time in the pit lane to make that driver change. And you've got to make sure that whoever you're plugging into the car uh, is, is, you know, is going to, there's going to be a benefit to it. Otherwise, you just got to kind of, You've got to use the guys as much as you can and try and avoid those driver changes. However, you then there will always be an invoice to pay if you like when you get to the end of the race uh, after 24 hours. It's um, you know if you've had guys that have been doing super long stints, they're going to be really fatigued. Yeah, and then also with the, with the endurance pit as it is here at Spa, even the LMP2 cars, it's almost two minutes down the pit lane in total, which is almost a full lap for them. So it really is quite an investment. You really have to plan out when you switch and how you want to plan out your stints. And obviously you want your you want your best driver closing, but you may want them for key moments. Like right now, like as it just turns tonight, we just saw how crazy it got as soon as the sun went down. Do you want your best driver in right now or do you want to take a chance with someone else as some racers as the Austrian sim racers haven't gotten much closer and now have to let that is our overall leader, actually. That's Phoenix Esports that has to let up a little bit going through a Rouge and Radion. That was a little hairy. <laughs> that was very hairy. I actually think the Porsche had to just, the Austrian Sim Racers Porsche actually had to just back out of it slightly there. And um, that was phew, at the, at just at the, the apex point of Eau Rouge and the Prism car having to back up now. And now they're right together. Very close indeed. I mean, for me right now, Jonathan, I want to have my safest driver in the car right now. Just that transition to the dark uh, and then put the fast driver in in the depth of the night, um, possibly. I mean, you see how many times have we seen it where Le Mans has really the key stint at Le Mans has been the kind of triple or quadruple stint. I, I think back to um, 
Nick Tandy in 2015 when Porsche won with the 919 Hybrid for the first time and Nick Tandy put in an unbelievable quadruple stint in the night and that was the, that put them ahead coming into the daylight hours again. Yeah, consistency I think is what you really, really need at night. Making sure you're not getting any collisions or track limits. There might, well, there was almost a collision heading down into Puhan there between the prison car. He's who's already seen a bit of action and has Tom Wanklitz, but Kostang Tuskov has been patient and he might get a good run up to the chicane. He'll get a draft and I don't know how much that damage is affecting that prison machine. It looks like it's all in the rear, so it shouldn't be affecting aerodynamics, but it could affect the handle. Yeah, certainly the back, and of course the, the Porsche 911 RSR has a huge rear diffuser uh, underneath the rear wing there. You can see just underneath where the exhausts are. Uh, it's got a massive rear diffuser which pushes the car down into the ground as it's going around corners. And that was one of the big updates with the RSR 17 model uh, when they actually did something very, very unfortunate. Where the engine was actually swapped around with the gearbox and the, the gearbox put to the back of the car and the engine is technically in the middle. It's kind of a rear to mid-engine car, whereas Porsches always have to be, well, the 911 anyway, always have to be rear-engined, but this one is, is technically a mid-engine car. Uh, and that is to fit the, the, uh, the, the, the big diffuser. So if you get basically hit up the back, that damages that diffuser and then it can cause all kinds of problems uh, in the fast corners. It wasn't a lot of contact, though, hopefully on that, you know, that beautiful paint skin that we mentioned before for the PRISM team. And maybe just buying his time as the Austrian Sim Racers. I think they know they have a faster car and they're just trying to set up a good place to do it, especially with the various prototype traffic that has come through. We have our overall race leader come through. Looks like it's a number 10 machine as it's going by right now. So just trying to be patient, not trying to force anything right now. Actually, excuse me, that 64 machine going by the WS Racing Esports Magenta team. But... You know, be patient, mark out a move. We got a long time to go and we're into the stint relatively early, I think, still for a couple of these GTE cars. Yeah, they are. They are indeed. So um, for the, uh, I'm just looking at for the Prism team, they're 11 laps in. Austrian Sim Racers just 12 laps in. So yeah, they've got a bit, quite a bit to go. Uh, as we see side by side now through the Fania Chicane, Austrian Sim Racers, can they get the move done? Yes, they can. That's uh, that wouldn't have been the textbook example of where to go through, but a win is a win, and through they go. I, I, my jaw dropped as soon as I saw him going alongside. I was like, he's not gonna, he's not gonna think this is gonna stick. And sure enough, apparently it's stuck. <laughs> so that was really good heads up driving from both drivers there, going through that session. Yeah, that's not really a uh, an area I'd want to overtake, but now the Austrian sim racers can get on the charge and get after that Ferrari that has now taken that podium spot. The online sim racing .de team and maybe get after them. They are quite a ways behind, but, and this fight may still not be over. The Prism Sim Racing Alpha Car may still have an advantage with that lap traffic with that Audi right there. They do, of course, the online Sim Racing team, they've got, the Ferrari's got to come into the pit lane and is right at the end of their stint. So we should see that Ferrari in third come in any minute now, um, that bright red Ferrari. Uh, so let's see, and that, likely will promote the Austrian Sim Racers car back to third and the Prism car uh, close behind in fourth but uh, Prism, a good strategical move there just not doing the driver change and it basically gave them track position alongside the Austrian Sim Racers but as you rightly mentioned Jonathan look at that look at that Austrian Sim Racers Porsche now the 137 car just really starting to stretch straight away yeah and it's going to be and I think, for at least for Prism Sim Racing, keeping Tom Wilpots in there was, I think, like a little bit of a confidence thing. By having that incident and that really aggressive race that we saw with Race Union, obviously, you know, if a driver change might have been needed, but, you know, keeping him in there, it's a confidence booster. And he didn't do a decent defensive job with that damaged car with, you know, clearly the, the pace difference that the Austrian Sim Racers presents. Indeed, he was certainly thrown in at uh, thrown in at the deep end there, wasn't he? As he ooh, just getting balked a little bit by the fifth place GT3 class car, it's the Audi of Frank Hoffman, and just took, hampering him slightly uh, at Buhon there. But then now the Austrian Sim Racers car, Aventy just barges way past, 
one of the Z4 BMWs. And, you know, interestingly, the over one lap, the probably, I would suggest that the Audi R8 is probably the quickest car uh, in all, over most tracks. But for me, the BMW, it's... Uh, I think it's just the dream 24-hour car, isn't it? Because it's the, it's certainly the, the most stable and the most comfortable to drive over long distance. And I think that, that over a 24-hour race, that's such an, a, an important attribute. I think this is one of the first times as well that we've seen an Audi, at least in class position, be in the podium spots. It's been all BMW. The 299 Absolute Motorsport, does, uh, I think design car is currently in second. But the BMW right now is really showing good pace, and I think it's really, really good. You mentioned the grip level around some of these fast corners. You mentioned Puhan, obviously, uh, right along in the, in the Rouge. So I think this is where you get the big advantage with that BMW Z4. Definitely, indeed. As we see, here we go then. This is our Ferrari in taking tires. One, the number 152 of all of Matzenbacher taking tires and fuel. So let's see if this Ferrari, if they decide to do their driver change at this point as well. They're certainly looking good at the moment. They've fought their way up the field in their uh, in their Ferrari. They're one of the leading Ferrari at this point in time. Jacks are down. No driver change then. So Olaf Matzenbacher takes new tyres, takes fuel and goes back out in the moment in sixth place in class. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think that they're probably the, the team watching for that penalty still. Well, the decision has been made, but no driver has actually been down pit road, so we still don't know if it is the race union car or the Prism Racing Alpha car that has to serve that penalty. And I'm sure there's a bit of protest going on as well. Um, so they're probably the ones best in the hot seat to maybe charge with the field. We've seen as the sit goes on, this 152 Ferrari has been very, very strong. Right now, it's got clean track, it's got fresh tires, so this is a good opportunity, I think, for them to knock out some fast laps and, you know, maybe catch some of these guys napping. Yeah, absolutely. That's what any driver, especially in a race like this, this is what any driver dreams of, a full a full tank of fuel, new tires, fresh track, just, and spa Francochamp to enjoy. That's, uh, that's what it's all about. Um, now... If you know, the, you'll see the three green lights on the side of that Ferrari. That those will go out along after the next lap because those uh, those three green lights are there to signify where the car is in class. So if it has one green light, you're in first. If there's two, you're in second. And three, you're in third. It came into the pits in third, and there you go, off they go. So uh, the car now uh, that system has updated, and that's exactly the same system that would be on the real world race car. So that car is in sixth place right now, 14 seconds behind the race union Porsche of, uh, of um, Marvin Otterback, and then not far ahead of him is the Prism Sim racing car. So as you rightly say, Jonathan, it, he could really do with one, if not both of those Porsches getting that penalty and then leapfrog up the field. And again, you know, he's a little off cycle as well compared to some of those other guys. They're about midway through their stints now, whereas, you know, this car has just gotten out of the pit road and just gotten fresh tires and fuel. So it'd be interesting to see how it plays out and how it aligns up with the other strategies. And maybe the Ferrari is actually getting better mileage as well than the other cars around, like the Corvette and the Porsche. And that may be key later on. It could be. Yeah, very good point indeed. Of course, the Ferrari, a pretty slippery... Uh pretty slippery car and actually the engine it, the crazy part is with this car is that uh, <laughs> the engine is of course the here in the GT class you're thinking why how can a Ferrari um, race alongside a Porsche 911 and a BMW and a Corvette well we have a thing in sports car racing called balance of performance where each of the uh, different cars in the class are balanced to try to go around the track at a similar pace. So if a car is too fast, they'll either take away power or turbo boost, or um, they'll add weight perhaps as well. Or if the car needs to a little bit of a help, they'll take weight away and give them more turbo boost or whatever it might be. So the Ferrari, the crazy thing is, is that the race car is about 500 horsepower. The standard street car of this 488, which is now, you know, four years old, uh, is 660 horsepower, so they actually have to take power out of the road car to balance it up because it's such a sophisticated machine. 
Yeah, and I, I really do love watching the Ferrari 48 go around the track. And I love seeing like the little uh, support series with all the Ferraris and all the Lambos, you know, doing well and seeing like some of these cars perform well. And obviously, this one's performing well in a class where there's only two of them. So hopefully, you know, it brings home the banner for the Ferrari team. It, it's got that scarlet red color. And again, if it gets better mileage and it's doing better on these longer stints, it could be a factor later on, maybe for that last podium spot. Right now, the two top Corvettes on a lap and league of their own, the Bendy Gods and HM Engineering. But, you know, that last podium spot is still very, very much up for grabs for GTE. It is indeed, and of course, Ferrari have, well, like they do at almost every racetrack in the world, they've got the most amazing heritage here at Spa in lots of forms of motorsport. and. Uh, they actually won the one in one of the most beautiful cars ever made. They won the first ever 1,000 kilometer race of Spa in 1966 when uh, Parks and Scarfiotti won with the Ferrari 330 P3, which for, for me still remains one of the prettiest cars ever made. Yeah, now transferring over to the LMP2 class, looks like there's another bull that's knocking on the door of the 21. It's not the angry bull. Before, the Angry Bull has gotten ahead and is now in sixth. It is Bull Out Racing that has now tracked down uh, Michael Frockbacher. I believe they made a driver change to that 21 car, so this may be a little bit further back than they want to be at the moment. So Bull, the Bull is out of the gate here for the number 41, Tobias Grunkotter, chasing down the Milner Motorsport Sim Racing car, that lovely white and blue machine there, the 21 machine. Separated by two tenths of a second after eight and a half hours of racing. Amazing. And here goes Bull Out Racing down the inside into the bus stop. Can he make the move stick? Just about. Yep, seals it up. Nice, clean, safe move there. Well done. That was a really brave move. Really good move as well. And he's a few laps into his stint more than the 21 car. So that's it's really key. So for looking for tires. Also look because they're not falling off that much, you know, depending on if he has new tires or not. His last stop was a 32-second stop, so he's already almost in the tires. If tires are still good, well, you can put on some fast laps still. Maybe triple stint if you want to be really risky. I know we've been talking about the double triple stint on the tires, seeing which one would be better. You probably could try and triple stint at this stage with the track completely in the dark. Yeah, I think so, and uh, certainly in, in the coming hours, of course, it's a long, dark night here at this time of year here at Spa. Of course, the sim uh, basically replicates those uh, conditions um, exactly as they would happen in the real world. So this is, yeah, I think in the depth of the night, I think the triple stint is definitely on for the LMT P2 cars. Normally, a double stint during the day isn't an issue, uh, in usually running for about... Yeah, about an hour and 20 minutes at the very most, but uh, of course a triple stint you're, you're going just over the two hour mark. I think it will be, I think it will be possible and of course the taking the tyres does, it does add quite a bit of time in pit lane so you can afford to be a little bit more gentle and take a little, a few less risks. So I think all being told, I think the triple stint could actually work at some point. We'll see if anyone tries it. And if you're towards the, you know, if you're in second or third in this field, the Reichsfahrt machine or the T3 Esports machine, and the Phoenix Racing machine is almost a minute ahead of you, you have to try something drastic, and you have to push them and put them under some pressure, because now with, the, you know, the Simpson car being now in ninth place, he has picked up a spot, in ninth place after that collision from earlier, it's going to be really hard, I think, for Phoenix Racing to, to lose this race without some sort of big mistake. But again, you know, Simpson was leading by almost a minute. It's the back end getting really happy on that 21 car right there. Yeah, that was a huge moment there. And, of course, we see that all the time of this. This Dallara is really, really lively on the power. You just see, oh, yep, what manages it really well there, just using a light throttle application, then squeezes the power on up the, up the gearbox and... Uh, of course, these uh, Dallara P2 cars they have a lot of uh, a lot of technical adjustments you can make with the suspension, the chassis, um, you know, the aerodynamics and all those kinds of things. But the, interestingly, the gearbox, uh, as we see the Milner Motorsport cars in the slight issue there, but the 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 gearbox you can actually only choose three gear stacks. You can't go in and change each gear individually. So you can either have a short stack, 
a normal stack or a long stack. So for places like Le Mans, they'll use the long, tall gearing stacks to get maximum speed. Or somewhere like, oh, I don't know, Detroit or Lime Rock Park, they'll use the short stack to get maximum acceleration. I I don't know uh, if they would use, uh, maybe some teams will use the normal stack, others might use the long, but I think the normal is probably going to be about right for, for here at Spa. It also depends on what you want to set up your car to be great for, because if you want it to have that great straightaway speed, maybe you do risk it with that long stack and, and see where it goes. Also, that longer stack may be a bit more gentle on the fuel load as well. So it, it it's really just a balance of how you want your car set up and how you want your drivers to, you know, conduct themselves throughout the race of, of what you want. Obviously, a place like Spa that has so many different quarters, it, it is a challenge. Like, obviously, it's easier on, say, Detroit. Oh, well, you're going with the short stack. Obviously, it's a street circuit. Or, you know, Le Mans. Well, there's a long straightaway. But you're going with the big stack. So here, I think it's a bit more of a touch and go. Like, you know, who chooses what, what areas they want to really focus on it for a good setup. Indeed, yeah, of course. It's, and if you've got the long stack in, of course, you... You need to really to make that work. You've got to have the car very slippery in a straight line. So you are very much going. <laughs> you're all in on the the dragster strategy, aren't you? you the, then you've uh, yeah, and like you say, a good point on the fuel as well. Because of course, with the longer gearing stack, you it, the, you know the, obviously the gearing is taller, so you don't have to. You you can sort of be a bit more flexible as well with the throttle so it'll be interesting to see how how that how that pans out and how what the drivers have got in. Of course, we won't be able to know for sure but we will certainly try and speculate that's for sure as we see the number 41 pull out car going past the gte leader still hm engineering leading at the front uh, in their red corvette it's rasmus busk who is on board that car right now and uh, hm engineering really building starting to really build on that lead from the Bendley Gods team, uh, Trevor Pastrami on board that car. They've now built it up to about 37 seconds. So uh, just edging away from the pack there are HM Engineering. And they're consistently like a tenth or two faster every single lap. Even if their lap times stop dropping, they're still a tenth or two faster from the Bendley Gods. So it, it's been a really, really good race for HM Engineering. They really haven't been under a lot of pressure, they haven't been near any incidents or anything like that, they've been really good at navigating throughout the traffic, so this is like a textbook example of how you endure in race right now is what they're doing. Indeed, and uh, Vlad Kamichev, he uh, was racing in the uh, the IMSA um, iRacing Triple Crown Challenge uh, held at Laguna Seca here on iRacing.com on Sunday past and uh, did a great job, was up there fighting for the podium in the HM Engineering Corvette and uh, so yeah obviously getting some good track time in in that car and hm engineering obviously got a good setup on that car as well it's running it looks super stable no not a wheel out of place right now and it always flashes the lights there as well and uh, comes through on one of the uh, comes through in the ninth place gt3 runner in the bmw which is albrecht motorsport max steineken there yeah, right now the field's all kind of spread out, all kind of settling into to, to rhythms, trying to plot out really next move and next stints. And this is where you really take in the track conditions as well, because we're now into the full of night. This is where you need to make those adjustments if your car was not as strong in the day. And this is where you can make it up some spots, or even if your car was good in the day, how can you change it to make it good into the night as well? So it'll be interesting to see on these pit cycles and such who leapfrogs who and what the strategy is for the teams going forward. Indeed it will. This is where the, the, the big moves can be made, uh, ex exactly so. So, 15 hours and 16 minutes to go in this motor race. We go all the way through to the middle of the day tomorrow, and we will be right here with you for the entirety of this race here on RaceSpot TV. All of the coverage live and uninterrupted. And if you want to get in touch with us here in the commentary booth, you can just pop your question in the YouTube comments box and we'll be delighted to answer your question. Uh, we do, please do get in touch with us. We'll be delighted to chat to you. So we're looking at the number 66 car of the, in the LMP2 class. That's our leader, Phoenix 
Racing Esport Green, who just before Simza hit their problem, of course, uh, nearly had a bit of a disaster of their own. Yeah, there was a bit of a, a bit of a hairy issue. Probably one of the most confusing and crazy things we've seen. <laughs> I, I, and I was kind of speechless watching it, and I was getting like texts from other, some of the other crews as they were watching it. Like that is unreal. But well, what had happened? Both him and the Simpson car pulled down pit road, and right in front of them is a Corvette who has ran out of fuel, slowly coasting his way down. So unfortunately, Phoenix Racing was stuck behind this Corvette. Simsa passed them on pit road, and ever since then, Phoenix was behind Simsa. But then the incident with the lapped car, Simsa going a couple laps down with damage. Now Phoenix sport, Race Sport has gotten back in the lead. Yeah, that's I did, I did watch that as well. It wasn't long before we came into the commentary box, and yeah, the poor Corvette coughing its way into the the pit lane. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, the moment with uh, of this number sixty six machine that is Michael Martel, who's driving that Delara right now, and doing a very good, very grand job of it indeed. Of course, Delara. Well, Delara, the, the, uh, a company that uh, maybe aren't necessarily a, a household name like a Ferrari or a Porsche, but they are equally as important, if not more important, in the motor racing world. Delara, of course, the most successful chassis manufacturer ever at the Indianapolis 500. And, uh, well, that, at the moment, that makes it quite easy for them because they are the only chassis manufacturer in the Indy 500, but, weren't, but only came into the sport in 1997. Uh, the company itself has been going since uh, the early 1970s and uh, founded by Mr. Jim Paolo Delara, who's now the ripe old age of 83, but still going strong. And uh, Jonathan, my favourite story about Delara is, is that it's not just race cars. I mean, their race car history is just endless, but they actually created and designed the, uh, the carbon fibre hand cycle that Alex Zanardi used to win a gold medal in the Paralympics in 2012. It's sometimes cool how you can see like racing technology and racing engineering go back into the real world and really benefit the real world. I think that's the greatest things about racing is you can apply so much of the engineering and technology from what you learn, like building a race car and making a chassis into real world things like, you know, building stuff for the Paralympics or helping anything like that as we see. This is the second place car, the Rangsford Sim Racing Machine. It's ran a very lonely race now in second really has not much seen much action but second place is still the second place indeed yeah this is uh, the car run by uh, Ronnie Dorig and uh, Almond's, Almond's Beggar on screen right now Soren Kullid Zeit as well in this car number 8 machine ring for Zeit sim racing LMP2 again Fortunately, because it's been a lonely race, though, he hasn't hit anything, so that's that's always a plus. That's a that's a huge plus. Yeah, that's always that's when you know. Uh, I always think if you're if you've got uh, if you're not getting much camera time on a broadcast, that means you're doing a perfect job. <laughs> if we're not debating about what accident you just had, you're doing a fine job. As we now look at the third place car, the T3 Esports Machine, again, kind of a lonely third place there in it ahead of fourth and 77 machine but this has been pretty good for them as well and sitting in a good podium spot yeah and i, I tell you, another excellent looking machine is as well uh, a really nicely painted up car you can't quite see it so well at the moment in the the dark part especially going through the uh, the forest section here uh, at, at spa but uh, yeah beautiful looking car that as well some nice multicolored spots as well and uh, just looking at the we got a better look at it. There's a, and then of course you see the logo on the shark fin there as well, looking very, very cool. That's what I like about these prototypes as well. You've got lots of room to uh, put lots of different designs onto them. Yeah, I feel like the sim racing paint scheme, you can really get, really get creative, really like take design to a whole new level. There's nothing really stopping you or anything. And obviously having the whole digital design things, you have trading paints, so you can even just make it your own in Photoshop. I've done that before. So how creative drivers get and how creative painters get is amazing and i love seeing all the different teams with the different colors and many of them are so unique you can spot them from miles away and it really as a broadcaster it really helps me spotting what cars 
passing who and what who's involved in an incident. Yeah, indeed, as we see on T3 Esports holding it down well. In fourth spot in the LMP2 class, we have the Durham Motorsport Club EV team. EV, it's not an electric vehicle, it's quite the opposite. It's an actually aspirated 600 horsepower V8 in this car. But EV is the, well, I'm not sure what that stands for actually. This is Nick Solweski, Dominic Spicker and Richard Finkenzeller in this machine. Their fastest lap so far, a 202.174. So actually about six tenths of a second off the ultimate pace of the leading car right now. Yeah, but they've been in this like mid-pack fight with the 64 US Racing Esports, the Angry Bull team, Bull Out, Muller Motorsports. Uh, they've been in this mid-tier fight, and right now uh, getting a little hairy there with the uh, uh, Porsche, and the Porsche really not giving a lot of room in that instance, but they've been in this mid-tier fight, and so far they've, they've come out on top, sitting quietly in fourth place, and maybe they're just buying their time. Maybe they got a secret morning setup that makes this car an absolute rocket ship, and they can go hunt down the top of you never know, we will find out, but they're doing the, doing the job right now and it, all it would take is a couple of mistakes up ahead and they're into the, the thick of the podium fight in that 77 machine. So that's the, so let's get an update as well, let's see what the Simza car is doing. The Simza Esports LMP2, Julian Reinhardt, is still at the wheel after that little mistake and he is now in ninth spot. But he's now got, this is where it gets pretty tough because he's got another two laps up to the next car uh, in class. He's in ninth, he was leading. And those two laps, that, that's going to be a long old night trying to trying to haul down four minutes. Yeah, and it's hard to tell right now with the current damage model on the LMP2 cars, but how much real damage is on that machine still. They only spent 10 minutes in the pit lane. I, I actually don't think that BMW has left. They've they've spent almost an hour in the pit lane. <laughs> the Rangsfart Sim Racing GT3 Am that was unfortunately involved in that collision earlier. But it'll be interesting to see how they manage the damage as the race goes on and maybe how many spots they can pick up. This car has been fast, it's not fast at the moment, however, only at 205. It's, you know, top competitors that they were racing with were in the 203s, so there is something affecting that car. Yeah, it's not at 100%, that's for sure. I mean, the, although they had to spend well, like eight, eight, I think it was about eight or nine minutes in the pit lane, well, it, that wasn't enough, I don't think, to, to get all of the, the damage completely sorted. So, yeah, not ideal uh, for this car. But, like I say, the spirit of endurance, just keep going, keep turning the laps and see what can happen in front of you. The last thing you need, uh, the one thing they can't afford, though, Jonathan, is another mistake would seal the seal the coffin wouldn't it they aren't out of it but one more would put them into it yeah we don't we don't know how much damage there already is still to repair so another issue or incident or collision with the lap car could do get you the team in and it, it is would be tough to see because they've been up front they had full position it, it'd really be a little bit of heartbreak for the team to see that you know they put a lot of effort into this machine this weekend so let's have a chat about then the WS Racing Esports Magenta car, Lucas Lang aboard that machine, the 64, a very jazzy looking car here. His teammates, Nicholas Nagel, Otmar Pinner and Christian Kiels in that car. Really nice looking machine as well. Just got a little brief, brief look at it there with the headlights of that BMW, black and yellow. It's uh, almost got a slight bumblebee look to it, that car. Yeah, it looks super sporty and super racing. It's been on our cameras a lot. It's been hunted down by several cars, and yet somehow it's still in fifth place. It's had the Angry Bull behind him. It's had Bull out. It's had Molar Motors, and still holding that top position. So, team strategists and drivers doing a really, really good job of keeping this car in a really good spot. And they have not put a foot wrong yet. No major accidents or collisions either. Keeping the car clean is a big key. Indeed, and of course, this uh, from fifth uh, fifth place, the WS Racing Esports Magenta car, all the way down to the car in eighth, the Milner Motorsport Sim Racing Pro. They're all on the same lap right now, so uh, that's going to be interesting to watch how that midfield battle kind of stretches out. Angry Bull Racing, the number ten car, they are in sixth place uh, overall and in class with Flo Bossen, Jubornon, Jeremy Morin, and 
Thomas Mourinho uh, in that team at the moment. It is uh, Jeremy Morin who's at the wheel of that car. Uh, last, his lap last time around was a 203.2. So uh, one of the quicker cars actually at the moment. So watch for that Angry Bull car, that white, red and black machine. Uh, Jeremy Morin going quick at the moment. And he did get to the gearbox of the 64 car about two stints ago. So it looks like this 10 car does have a little bit of pace and speed. But I don't think the pit strategies have played out to what he needs. There's a couple seconds slower in pit stop, almost seconds. And that's really where this gap has come from. He's only 14 seconds behind fifth place. But yeah, it's, a, it's been a solid steady race. And they've been able to pick off and move through the field whenever they get behind. Uh, they were able to pick off the 21 and maybe they can get the 64 on the next stint. As it's going to be ending, bull out racing, the car right behind it south is just pulling the lead as well. Yeah, that car, the, like you say, the bull out car was only about two and a half seconds behind the angry bull machine. So going into pit lane to take a stop. Now the angry bull car is 14 laps into the stint, so a little while to go till they have to pit. Probably another, ooh, another five laps or so before we see the number 10 car in. So this little midfield battle, this is what we're... Uh, what we're really going to be, um, you know, we're really going to be watching in the LMP2 field over the next hour or two because Phoenix Racing Esport Green, their lead is uh, hovering around a minute. So uh, the the midfield, the sort of five, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, this is the the big battle really uh, that's going to play out over the next hour or two. Yeah, and the Muller Motorsports Sim Racing Pro Team, obviously the the team that helped organize this event. You know, Alexander Duhandro, Michael Fingenbacher, Robert Kunis, and Stefan Roseman for the team. And they've been in this thick of this midfield fight. They've been as high up as fourth in, you know, these past few hours. So it's just going to come down to strategy and image limitation. They do have a little bit of front end damage from collision in the chicken. I don't know how much that is affecting them, but they've been running a solid good race so far. And they're just in contention for a good result. They are indeed, yeah. It's, uh, it's very, very close for them. The 21 car, Michael Finkwalker, Robert Kunkis, Stephen Rasman and Alexander Dijako. And that 21 car, they are currently lapping very strong as well, 203.2. And they're, they're fastest lap as well, only about six tenths off the uh, the outright leader on outright pace. And uh, Nolan Motorsport, they're... Yeah, about another five laps before they come into pit lane. Yeah, we're starting to see a little bit more discrepancy between the LMP2 cars in terms of strategy. Everyone was kind of lined up on the same lap up to pit, but now a little, bit, a little bit different. Phoenix Racing actually went one lap shorter than some of their other rivals, so they're going to have to pit a little sooner. And obviously the 21 car still has a couple laps left. This is the, the bull out racing machine fresh out of the pit lane. It was bowling out for a couple seconds, gained a few spots all the way up to sixth. It's a very, there's a very mean looking livery right there. It's a very angry red color. Do you think that car, it makes itself angry? Of course, being a bull, if it's red, you know, look in the mirror and just go, oh, I'm so angry, I'm so red. I, I kind of want to see the bulls race each other because they're both red. I, I'm assuming that they both get angry, right? That's how that works. <laughs> Absolutely. They both get really angry with each other. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, in ninth spot uh, in the P2 class uh, is, of course, with Sims at Esports, who we've talked about. Let's look at 10th, though, in the number 99 machine, Fit Fuhr, racing Lars Leibniz on board that machine, that very, very blue car. Um, even see that through the dark, the, the blueness there. Um, also, Lars driving with Sasha Lutning, Robert Team and uh, David Ruprecht and of course team is a name which uh, has had a well with two m's uh, and, or sorry with two i's my apologies Nikki team who's had quite a lot of success here at Spa from Pichon and it's been an okay race for these guys they've been kind of hovering around towards the end of the LMP2 field and it's been a bit unfortunate for them they're probably hoping for something a little bit better but they're still in contention maybe for a few spots again something happens ahead of them um, easy pickings for a good spot. They were ahead of the Simpson Esports machine, and now there's a 50 second gap that Simsa has gained on the 99. So, hopefully, maybe a little bit of adjustment or changes can help them gain a few places. Indeed. So, let's look at the 68 car. 
running in 11th spot right now in the LMP2 class. And interestingly, they've got a five driver lineup there, as you can see at the moment. The driver on board that car is Dirk Walter. So they're, they've got a little bit more flexibility in their driver lineup. Having five drivers, you don't have to fatigue everyone as much. They can circulate them around a little bit more if they wish to. So they're in the 11th spot in class right now. Their pace, a little bit off the pace uh, of the, the other drivers ahead of them. Um, so they've just got to try and just keep keep the mistakes uh, away and just keep lapping at the pace they're comfortable with and if they can keep mistake free throughout the race they could get they can come with together with a good result but uh, for phoenix racing esport yellow they are sitting in 11th place in class at this point yeah it's it's hard to see the team car doing so well but the teammate the 66 running so well leading this race and then you guys are running in 11th it's probably not the best thing but they've also had three more stops I'm wondering if there's been a few issues on this car, <laughs> collisions or whatnot, where they've had to go down pit lane three more times, or maybe even a penalty that I'm missing in the review board. Yeah, it looks like it's not maybe gone quite their way uh, up to now, but still plenty of time to go. In 12th, the uh, Prism Sim Racing Beta car, certainly the, for me the, the nicest looking car on the track, this beautiful, you can see when the light just catches those stripes, it changes from blue to red to green. Really, really cool. You can just about see them there. If you see a car with the headlights behind the glinting off those stripes on the car, it's very, very cool and indeed uh, excellent design work there from Prism Sim Racing Beta. And they, um, you spotted earlier on, Jonathan, they had a kind of unusually long stop, uh, which we didn't really f get to see on camera why that actually was. No, we didn't. And I think there was someone in chat saying there was a collision of something down in the chicane, but they weren't sure what was going on. But uh, obviously, that, and it's a shame, really, for the 23, because they had been putting on a really good race and making that midfield battle even more interesting, staying out of trouble and fighting hard with the 64 in the 10 car. But maybe they can fight back and gain a few places. Their pace isn't bad. It's actually really, really good. A 203 last time, faster than a meter. So it is a long race. Things can happen, and maybe they can close down the gaps as time goes on. Well, if they've got the pace, that's the main thing. Uh, in 13th spot, we have the Moto Racing Esports team, the 40 car. Uh, of course, uh, Motul, a very significant uh, oil and lubricant manufacturer. You'll see Motul, one of the major sponsors of the IMSA WeatherTech Championship. Um, and the, uh, you'll see when you get your pole position in the IMSA WeatherTech Championship, you get a nice Motul sticker to stink, stick on the front of your car and a very fetching Motul cap as well. And a few weeks ago, we saw a dramatic conclusion to uh, the Motul Petit Le Mans uh, as well. So, uh, although not a good, not such a good day for that car at this moment, uh, currently sitting in 13th, another brilliant looking machine. Finally, to round out our LMP2 field running at the moment, the low grip racing team, Sammy Loeb, in the 14 car at the wheel of that machine right now. And he's driving with Jack Rotevel, Tom Mackell, and Luca Becker. So they've uh, low grip racing team. Hopefully they can find some more traction out there. And they were way down in the order early when we started our broadcasting stint, but they've actually managed to pass all the GT cars that were ahead of them. So maybe gain a few more places here, gain a little bit more experience for the team. Okay, so we've got a car, we've got one of the P2s in pit lane now. This is the Durner Motorsport Club EV, which uh, I understand is to do with, uh, it's an abbreviation for a German limited company, thanks to our fountain of knowledge producer, Hugo Luis, for that. Now, what's happened here? The 77 car going very slowly indeed. Oh, is it run out of fuel? It's a little early for them to run out of fuel. He was only 15 laps in. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's a bizarre thing to happen to. Huh. Very strange. There's something not right there. Maybe a, perhaps a technical failure of some description. He's going along. And... Is he running? I can't hear the engine noise.
I think the revs are slowly... No, the revs are still there. Yeah, it looks... Yeah, there it is. There it goes. Run out of fuel. Which that is really, really interesting because he was only about 15 or 16 laps in, so unless there had been an error on pit road... Oh, that's it. Well, we, we have seen issues with making sure the stints are good earlier as with that Corvette incident that saw the lead chain. That is definitely a little bit more bizarre. Wow. So, yeah, like you said, probably just a, an error on, on filling on the fuel. And for it to, but the, the crazy thing is, uh, the bit that I don't understand is that the Delara has the Cosworth dashboard on those cars gives so much information to the driver. Uh, really all useful information, I might add, you know, brake temperature, tire temperature, tire pressure, but also fuel, how much fuel you have and a predicted uh, output uh, or how much fuel you're going to need or how much fuel you're using. So to me, it seems even if they had made a mistake on filling, the car would tell you if you were going to hit a fuel issue or not. And it just seems very, very odd. Yeah, I'm wondering if... Whoever the crew chief is looking at the stats or something like that misclicked or just misadded something or wanted to short fill maybe to get some more speed is now looking at the the Bentley gods who have inherited the lead on the pit cycles HM engineering down pit lane and they've run a very consistent race in first and second place most of the time but their pace just has not been as good as the HM engineering machine. Yeah, but I think you, you're you're spot on, but the thing is a little bit three drivers as well, Andrea. Andreas Dahlstrom, Trevor Pastrami, and Robin Sunkvist. This is going to be a long, a long day for them, for the Bendel Gods. But the the critical thing is, is that they're here. They're right there in. Well, at the moment in the lead, they will have that after the pit stops. They will drop back to second again. But the critical thing is, is that they're right there. Even a tiny mistake from the HM Engineering would give the lead away. So Bendel Gods are right there. And any particular drop by HM Engineering, they are in the prime spot to profit. So they're doing they're doing exactly the right job. They're keeping the pressure on. And uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. They don't have the outright pace, but they're kind of doing a bit of a Corvette thing, aren't they? They're just plodding away and making sure they're right there all the time. Yeah, it's gonna be key here also for strategy purposes, who takes what. Uh, on the next stops, obviously they're 24 laps into their stints, only about a lap or two more, maybe, or they might be this lap. Uh, see if they do tires or a driver change. Right now, the HM Engineering car is in the pits uh, after that long, painful ride down. <laughs> and right now, it's clicking off with 31 seconds on their pit stop, and I think they're still in the box as well. So it'll be interesting to see what these, you know, two different teams do to try and get closer to one another and maybe fight for the win. Indeed, absolutely. So the Bendley Gods, they're currently on the 19th lap of their stint with Trevor Pastrami on board. So we probably expect maybe another seven or eight laps to go uh, for the Bendley Gods. And it will all come down to now, have HM Engineering done a driver change? It was Rasmus Busk who was on board that car. My timing screen is still showing that he is. Um, is is he still on board that car, that 159 car? It would appear so. I think they're out of the pit lane, only a 34 second stop, so it looks like just fuel. It's an engineering car, so it might be interesting to see if the Bendy guys do a driver change here or do a tire change as well. Yeah, that's that's the critical part. It's almost. <laughs> you almost don't want. In the case of the Bendy gods, they've almost got to try and just keep going if they can't necessarily afford the delay of a driver change right now if they can help it because they want to just make sure that they keep the pressure on HM Engineering. They've got to keep them honest. Uh, if they let them have a gap then they can relax and they can sort of, they can, you know, take more tyres or they can, you know, they've, they've got comfort to, to play it safe but if the Bendy Gods can keep that, uh, keep that going and keep maybe do a couple more stints with um, a couple more stints with uh, Trevor Pastrami on board, that could make a difference there, pushing HM Engineering into a mistake. Yeah, it's all. I think it's all about like plotting out your moves and plotting out this long chess game right now. The two haven't seen each other in a while. They've not seen each other 
close on track in quite some time as now we look at the HM Engineering card. Ramos Boss currently behind the whale, and in Glunch, Vlad Kuchimic and Mark McCormack, the team for this little red Corvette, as you keep saying. And it's, again, kept out of trouble. It's had very, very consistent and good lap times, arguably the best in the field in the GTE category. And just plowing along, just being consistent is probably the way to win this race. And they keep pulling out that gap to the 169. They had almost a minute gap on them when they pitted. So it was really, really close and really, really good for them. Well, hopefully, it will hopefully be the the crown at the end of uh, the end of the race tomorrow afternoon. They'll hope that they're the crown prince of the uh, of the field in their little red Corvette. Uh, good song that. Is that is a, a song you're familiar with, Jonathan? Unfortunately, it is not. And someone in the chat did mention that we're not, that someone should be obligated to sing this at some point. Okay, you've 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 forced me to do this. Yes, I didn't want to, but you forced me to to go little red Corvette. Do, do, do. Baby, you're much too fast. That's all you're getting. That's it. Yeah, fantastic. I go to ten <laughs> out of ten. We're, we're putting you on. Putting you on. A Britain's Got Talent for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the wonderful, the wonderful, the, the late great Prince sang that song. Little, little red Corvette. So there's every time you see a red Corvette, you can't help it but but sing that song. Speaking of red, we can move on to the red 152 Ferrari that is oh, good segue. quietly putting together a very, very good race for this team. Like they were when we joined the broadcast, they were down in ninth place and we were all the way up to the podium's positions. Yeah, they've been they've been brilliant, have they? For, for me, they've been one of the one of the, the teams of the day. Actually, they've uh, really fought hard, and like you say, it's probably been a race dominated by. Corvette, um, a few Porsches up there as well, but mainly Corvette. But this is the sole. This is by far the leading Ferrari. There's only two Ferraris in the 12th car pack of GTEs, so they're doing a brilliant job. And you know what? Not a single mark on that car after, whoa, after ni over nine hours of racing. So yeah, they are doing a stellar job. And look at that. They're just giving plenty of room for the prototypes. No point to take any unnecessary risk, and they're just doing some great, great lapping right now. At the moment, on board that car is Olaf Matzenbacher, who is about halfway through, just coming up to halfway through his stint and running very strong indeed. Yeah, they've been putting together good moves and even a few setbacks. They've always been able to fight back, so it's really, really, really good showing. And we saw flashing headlights there from the prototypes, the 64. He's trying to hunt down the Muller Brisbane Sim Racing Pro. They were within a second of each other before they caught the 152. But, you know, it's it's been a good race so far from them. As we move on now, the Austrian Sim Sport car, five drivers on this team. And they've unfortunately been part of a few issues. Oh, no, no, they weren't. They've been avoided, actually, all the issues. They're not even with Race Union or Prism in that fight, but avoiding all that, and they've been able to have a nice fourth place they have indeed yeah once they got that clear track they could really show their pace and what they're capable of uh, are the Austrian sim racers uh, about 12 seconds for the back we've got prism racing uh prism sim racing alpha with tom wild on board that machine uh, now this is the car where which was involved as you mentioned in that little incident with the race union porsche now what we haven't been able to decipher yet is if a penalty has been handed out, and if so, to which car was it handed out for the little incident that they had. Now, it might have been deemed as just a racing incident because, quite honestly, it, both of them were almost equally penalised by the contact, if you see what I mean. So I think, unfortunately, like live timing registers that we have, just when they pit and when they get into the pit box, I don't think when they go through the pit lane, so it would appear that it actually race union penalty because they are now over a lap or so behind this prism racing up uh, us racing alpha machine when they were very close to each other at one point so obviously they didn't, the prism sim racing alpha not getting a penalty is a good thing but they still have that damage to contend with and we really don't know how badly it, that's affecting the handling yeah it's bound to have some effect as you can see just yeah a little bit of damage to the diffuser Underneath the bumper, which is very visibly damaged, as you can see, but yeah, it's hard to tell. Um, 
Mind you, this car, uh, the RSR17, did win uh, at uh, the Long Beach Grand Prix, the Enza race, the 100-minute sprint race uh, back in 2019 in the hands of Lawrence Van Tor and Earl Bamber. And Earl Bamber, for the basically his entire stint behind the wheel, uh, basically the rear diffuser had detached itself and was flapping up and down. So it definitely wasn't doing its normal job. And he still managed to win the race with that. And they were lucky not to get black flagged actually. Um, but the, the rear diffuser, the deck just battering off the ground and Earl thought they would have had to have retired, but uh, managed to nurse the car to the win and uh, so it is possible to win a race with a damaged uh, diffuser so you should hopefully get that message through to the prism sim racing alpha guys and hopefully give them some motivation to keep, keep going yeah it's i don't know if it's affecting lap times right now if they're just fuel saving but they are a second or two off the pace from the other guys around them and it'll be interesting to see like if they try and repair this damage moving forward or if they can just kind of leave it be you know how how does one go about doing this for strategies points because they're in a solid fifth place only well i say solid and then i realize i look at the timing and it says only seven seconds ahead of the 188 so maybe not a solid eighth uh, fifth place yeah they've got to worry about the ring for Dirt sim racing gte uh, machine the 188 car the black corvette here or sorry is it yes it is yeah the, the black corvette the uh, or drive the car driven by Calder Birkenfield, Soren Matzkerth and Sven Paul. At the moment on board that car is Soren Matzkerth trying to chase down that number five, uh, sorry, number five, the fifth position uh, online sim racing DE car. So it's pretty tight in that midfield uh, in GTE. So we'll need to keep an eye on how that progresses. In seventh place in the GTE field right now is Race Union, who, as you mentioned, uh, Jonathan, have appear to have been the ones to serve that penalty. Uh, either that or, interestingly, if you look at the back of that car, they've repaired some damage. Yeah, I'm looking at the timing to see if they did have a longer stop, and they did a 134 stop, so they, they did repair some of that damage they got, but... It was very, it's very good defensive driving up until the contact in the cones for the 187. And they had been putting together a good race too. They've been up into the podium places at one point, and this is just going to be something to try and really fight back from. And they appear to have the pace. They got a two-minute, 13-second lap, fastest so far in the class on the last time by. So they have the pace, I think, to get back up into that fight even for the podium as well. It's a little squirrely out of the source right there. Yeah, that's the one thing where the, the Porsche does have a really good uh, traction. That slightly more rearward from mid to rearward uh, engine position just gets that little bit more weight over the wheels, just squidges them down into the ground that bit more. Very classic Porsche, Porsche attribute, that kind of out of corner drive. And of course, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, little brother of this car, the Porsche 911 GT3R, um, uh, of course, won the Spa 24 hour last weekend uh, using that very same attribute to its advantage in the wet conditions that they had. But, uh, yep, the, uh, like you say, you get a, coming out there out of Lesor really needed that, uh, that little bit of, uh, that bit of extra grip. Um, Moving through the field, the Valkyrie E-Racing Green Corvette sitting in 8th place, the number 142 car. This has been a car that's been up in the like, top 5 fight a little bit. Uh, when Nicole Richter's that we were watching, Manuel Bastian, Bernard Heibel, and Pete Snake on the team. The column's fallen off a little bit. They've taken a couple longer stops. And the lap times aren't, you know as good as they'd want it, but they're still in this fight, however. If something goes wrong, collisions happen, it would be great for this team. Indeed, that absolutely will uh, keep plowing away. In ninth spot in the GTE class, we have the Milner Motorsport Sim Racing Blue car, driven by Daniel Schnur, the 123 machine, so it's nice and easy to spot out on the track. And it's a uh, Porsche 911 RSR. With, uh, now there's a famous name, it's not the same one of course, uh, Phil Hill, 
who, well, one of uh, a legend driver uh, who won a lot of races with Ferrari uh, many moons ago, nearly 60 years ago, Phil Hill was a uh, bit of a Ferrari legend, so uh, it's not the same Phil Hill, of course, but uh, nice to be named after it. Sometimes I like seeing like, those famous names on, on famous people. Sometimes I love seeing my par parents and friends getting confused. <laughs> but the Bowler Motorsport Sim Racing Blue Car has had a very quiet race. Definitely better than their BMW counterpart that has seen a collision or two in their field. But not as good as the prototype counterpart. So maybe hoping for a better stint here. Maybe as things get in the morning, if things get hectic again, pick off a few places. But... It's been solid and quiet for them, so they've at least kept the car in one piece. Yeah, absolutely. You got to, That's the positive that they can take away. Next along, another further lap behind is the Stage 1 Racing Black number 179 machine, piloted right now by Rob Nowens um, in their Corvette in the... Now, this is um, unfortunate, but we have to mention it, don't we, uh, <laughs> Jonathan? This was the Corvette. It's running in the beautiful uh, championship-leading colours, uh, the number three Corvette colours, the yellow car. But uh, this is the car that um, quite famously, or inf infamously, ran out of fuel on pit lane with the two LMP2 leaders right behind him. Yeah, it's unfortunately going to become the, the infamous car of this race, and was a major setback for this team as well as look at where they are they're 10th in class and have not been able to make up spots as you see the 66 uh, uh, overall leader right ahead of them but yeah that running out of fuel cost them dearly as they had to coast very very slowly down the pit entryway and unfortunately they're gonna need something here to really pick up some spots Indeed, and the, the, behind them, um, another final lap down is the 11.9219 Simsport car of Jason Proctor uh, at the wheel of the second of the Ferraris. There we are, we haven't seen that car out on track, and uh, a beautiful paint scheme on that machine, uh, almost right motorsport Porsche-esque, actually, uh, the blue and black colour scheme on that uh, Ferrari. They've got five drivers, Dave South, Sven Hartman, Nicholas Back in Fuso, Matthew Giddens, and at the moment is uh, Jason Proctor on board that machine. And finally, in 12th place in class is the GMS racing car of Marcel Kiefer, who's a further eight laps behind the next car. So they've not had a good race at all um, so far. So it's a long night for them in that GMS racing Porsche in the uh, Martini uh, inspired colours on that car. Yeah, you can even see like the damage in the front, the wing, the rear. It's this clearly this car has been through a war, and it's going to need to try and just limp home safely. And again, unfortunately, they're several laps behind some of their other competitors. So maybe they can get some damage repaired and maybe pick a spot or two again if anything happens to our one towards the front. Absolutely, yeah, indeed. Well, we're uh, as we come into the real depth of darkness here. Uh, at Spa, uh, here in beautiful Belgium, we're now going to go for our race spot fan immersion. We're going to go on board with the Ferrari, the 152 Ferrari, or the online simracing.de machine, and we're going to have a couple of laps around the beautiful spa Francorchamps champs circuit. Enjoy, Olaf Matzenbacher will be your chauffeur.
welcome back here to Spa from Cushon. And so we've just had a wonderful couple of laps on board with the 152 Ferrari, which is uh, slowly but surely climbed its way up through the field through the late afternoon into the dark of the night. Let's have a run through our GT3 runners and how they are looking at this moment in time. The leader in class right now is the Familian Bomber team, the number 257 BMW Z4. And uh, Jonathan, so far, these guys have been solid. I think there's four classes, and they're a class in between GT3 and GTE because they're two laps ahead, and they haven't put a foot wrong. Their lap times are three seconds faster than some of the other drivers in their field. It, it really has been a like a Saturday night stroll for them. It, it really has, yeah, for sure. At the moment, it's, uh, it's their race to lose, um, and they've got a lot in front of them now. It's really... Between them, it's it's it, it's kind of a they're 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 basically competing with the race itself, aren't they? Those guys, so they've just got to try and tick off the laps as best that they possibly can. At the moment, behind the wheel of that car is Connor Carnick, and doing a brilliant job, working very consistently. And that BMW is just a joy to drive uh, back and forth. It's so nimble, it's so stable. To me, it's like a slot car is the best way I could describe how it drives. Yeah, it's really on uh, rails, I think, for the most part, apart from that little, that little brief incident we had where two of them swung out, but they have not really shown signs of any getting loose or anything like that. It's been really, really solid running for a lot of these BMWs, at least in the GT3 category. Indeed, yeah. It's uh, and strangely, you know, it's funny because the it, it, it's based upon, uh, to be honest, a pretty bland and pretty normal street car, the Z4. It might look like a sports car, but it's not really a uh, a proper sports car like a, a Porsche 911, for example. But the race car that they made out of it is an absolute cracker. Uh, and actually, the um, the Turner Motorsport uh, organization in the, the United States of uh, of America, um, based over. In fact, they're not um, they're not uh, too far from the East Coast, I understand. And uh, yeah, the Turner Motorsports, led by Will Turner, they basically turned this car into an amazing GT3 machine and uh, took it out and won the IMSA GTD Championship with uh, with Dane Cameron, who now drives for. A gentleman called Roger Penske. You might have heard of him. Might have, really might have. It's not like he owns uh, <laughs> an entire series or has a NASCAR team or has an IndyCar team. No, no, really might have. <laughs> <laughs> He's had some career, hasn't he? Has uh, Mr. Penske? He's. Uh, it, it, it's incredible to not only own the. I mean, to own the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is. I mean, in anyone's career, a crowning achievement. But for him to own that and the most successful Indy, to be the most successful IndyCar owner at the Indy 500, and to now own the series as well, it's uh, it's something that you very rarely see as a dominant team owner actually owning the series at the same time and be accepted by uh, by their competitors. It's definitely something that we can, you know, IndyCar at least can focus on going in the right direction with I think Penske being a famous name and having so many teams and the marketing genius that that Penske team is always getting funding I think for IndyCar really really helps out but let's take a break from the GT3 rundown we actually have Gustos Grinbogas the one of the drivers of the current leading car that is number 66 Phoenix Racing Esport Green and Peter, you, you're with me. Gustas, welcome to the Race Spot TV commentary box. Tell us a bit about your race so far. Yeah, sorry, I uh, logged in with <laughs> the wrong team. So we're number six, SimCity Sport. Sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, as you saw, we had we had the incident there at uh, coming into the bus stop, uh, let's see, I think an hour ago. But up until that point, our car has just been on rails. We've been uh, the fastest crew, you know, uh, taking pole position, stretching that gap uh, in the first stint. Then obviously, uh, 
losing a bit of pace, but then going back into the lead and, and leading quite comfortably, if I can say that. And then just, just yeah, that incident really set us back, uh, and now you know, it's just damage, damage limitation from here. And it, for, forgive me, speaking of uh, damage, I mean, you've spent about 10 minutes in the pit lane. Uh, I, I, I'm guessing that isn't all the, the damage sorted. What's the state of the car and what? how long did you take to, to take the repairs in the pit stop? Well, we had to tow the car back into the pit lane uh, and we had then eight minutes of, uh, of repairs. We think we've done everything and the driver's been, been quite happy in the car. Uh, we haven't seen any real top speed damage or, uh, or cornering grip loss. Uh, I haven't personally been in, back in the car after the accident, so, so I'm, ju I'm just waiting to see in, in a few hours how it feels for me. But yeah, it looks like, uh, looks like most of it's been fixed. Uh, that's been the case with this new Delara P2, the damage is fixed quite well. So we're hoping it's, it's all done and, uh, and now we're recovering. We're, we're gaining time, oh, we're hoping to be back on free laps uh, with the race leader very soon. Uh, and yeah, just just looking out for that top five, maybe even a podium at the end. Well, good says we wish you all the best uh, and good luck uh, for your stint. We'll be, uh, we'll be cheering you on here from the race spot uh, come to box. So that was Gustas Grimberas giving us uh, a great insight there into how the uh, the damage took place. And uh, Jonathan, that's interesting that in eight minutes they managed to get all that damage more or less repaired. Yeah, there was heavy contact with the wall and heavy contact with the car in front, but you know, at least they were able to get repaired. Unfortunately, that BMW that was a part of that spent over an hour on the pit lane has just recently rejoined the track. So, but it's nice to see they still that team still has a really good fighting spirit. Absolutely, I, I love that the uh, the never say die attitude, that tenacity, is really what you need in the rain. It needs to be part of your DNA for any form of endurance racing, and we've seen it, you know, so many times uh, across all the big endurance races where some drivers where they look down and out, where they just they, you know they find that little bit of inner pace and. Uh, uh, and just dig that little bit deeper, and then something happens ahead, and hey presto, you've got a you've got a result when it never looked like there would have been one. So, um, brilliant job to to the guys who, who are keeping going and uh, getting their cars back out on the circuit and lapping in. Well, what a great way to spend a Saturday evening lapping around this amazing circuit. It's probably the best way to spend a Saturday evening, in my opinion, is driving around Spa and a very fast, very good race car as we're looking at an Audi going very fast right now is the 299 Absolute Motorsport design car currently driven by Andrea Salvai and the highest placed Audi right now is an Audi in a sea of BMWs and the Audi's really been very quiet this race but are starting to creep up a little bit. Indeed, yeah, the Absolute Motorsport Echo of design car, the 299 uh, up to second, and yeah, the, 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 like you say, it's been very much the story of the BMW Z4 so far, but uh, the Audi... Pro oh, we've got a... Oh, we've got contact. We've got contact at La Source, one at the number 41 LMP2 machine in the 7th place GT3 car. So that is the 7th place GT3 car. That was Team Race Gitter and the 41... Ah, uh, is this the Angry Bull car? Well, it's not Race Gitter. It's actually the the Muller Sport car, I think, again involved. I think the 41. Oh, bull out, sorry, my apologies. Bull out, and oh, the prototype gets hit by the GT. And hit again. Oh, for one for good luck. Oh, dear. It's Milner Motorsport. Thank you. Yes, you're, you're, you're spot on. Apologies for my mistake there. 285 Milner Motorsport BMW plows into the back of the innocent prototype there, and oh, that's. Uh, that's not so good news uh, for either of those cars, really, uh, as we look at the number three, well, the third place GT3 car, the Sim, the other Simza Esports machine. So although it's not gone very well for the prototype division, the GT class, they're in a good spot for, uh, they're in the podium contention right now. Yeah, they're chucking along. Uh, Lewis Goodway had a little bit of an issue down here into Puhan where he spun out and 
that stint was a little bit rough for them, but they've been able to recover really well. Michael Davis and Burkhardt are powering as well driving that machine. They've been able to recover well, and they're sitting pretty in the third spot. They have a nice, sizable gap right now, and just manage their time and see if you can try and hunt that second place car down. Absolutely, the only way to do it is clean stints and uh, yeah, they they're maybe at an ever so slight disadvantage where they've, they've only got three drivers, which in the real world Spa 24 hour would be quite normal for a pro car, but most of the pro-am cars would usually run with four drivers. Um, but three in the sim is that's long. That's a lot of um, that's a lot of driving for each driver. At least a minimum of eight hours each. So it's uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, sorry, my apologies, maximum <laughs> of, of eight hours each. So it's going to be really really tricky uh, for them getting to tomorrow afternoon. They're going to be very very tired. Yeah, and I think that the varying team sizes also brings up an interesting point of how drivers and teams are planning the stints. If you know you're racing your rival with a small team size, you might plan your stints to do a few driver changes towards the end of the race and get that fresh set of, of eyes and arms in the car. Absolutely, yeah, and we, we did mention that, that uh, you know, the, the driver changes do cost time uh, in the pit lane. You have to basically make an investment in time to get that fresh driver in the car. Um, and of course deploy also you'll have some drivers who are slightly quicker than others and you want to deploy those fast drivers uh, uh, accordingly of course we, we see this so often as well don't we Jonathan in, in a lot of sports car racing now uh, it's very much focused around the pro-am model where the amateur driver is usually uh, you know like I say an amateur driver usually the one who is funding the program, adding the finance, and then hiring pro drivers to share the driving with them in endurance races. And it's a very popular and very successful business model. It certainly works. If you look at the um, the IMSA WeatherTech Championship, the GTD class, for example, you have a huge field of about 15 cars with lots of different manufacturers and many kind of wealthy amateur drivers employing very high level uh, pros and of course the pro drivers are all so close on time you know less than a tenth of a second separating pretty much every pro driver but the amateur drivers there can be multiple seconds separating them and really it's more about how good your am driver is rather than how good your pro is yeah it all comes down to experience and driving time and uh, someone in our youtube comments actually the simpson esports official youtube has commented and said, hey, they actually do have two more drivers, Jackie Lauderman and Scott Brazer, that have yet to be in the car. So they might have a few, you know, guys at the end that are going to be completely fresh that could maybe get a run down and grab second place. Uh huh. They've kept one. They've kept a couple of aces up their sleeve. Well, thank you very much for letting us know that. That's excellent information to have and to share with the rest of the viewers. Thank you very much indeed. They're uh, they're going for the I'll call it the Keating and Blake Mullen tactic because. It, uh, Le Mans last year, um, the number 85 Ford GT, the only ever privately entered uh, Ford GT in the GTE AM class with Felipe Fraga, your own Blake Molin and Ben Keating, uh, took that car and won on the road, unfortunately later disqualified for a fueling, um, a fueling infraction. But uh, their tactic was basically put the hot shoes in early, put Blake Molin and Fraga in uh, and break the break the race basically, and then Ben Keating would do the majority of his driving into the second part of the race. So that's why they're obviously keeping a couple of drivers up their sleeves. Very clever. And we had a brief image right there. It appears HM Engineering and Bendy Gods are now fighting for the lead in GTE. I don't know how that honestly happened. There was a huge gap between the two of them on the last cycle, and now there's only. A second between those two. Less pit than stop. a second. Pit stop. We're waiting on a pit stop for Bendley Gods. They owe us a pit stop. They're 19 laps into the stint at this point. H of Engineering have just come out of pit lane. They've done one lap. So uh, that will, in fact, that's actually quite significant because H of Engineering are in the lead and have a pit stop in hand now. So that is really, they're really starting to turn the screw now, H of Engineering. And they've been so, so solid. But, but for Bendley Gods, they are still right there, they're still in the game, and that's what they've got to do. They've got to accept that HM Engineering are probably quicker over a lap, 
But if they can be the team that don't make any mistakes, they could be right there come the end of the race. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this is going to play out. Are you, actually, are you sure that the stints are the same? I might, I might be reading something wrong. My timing might be frozen. <laughs> so it might, mine also. I'm just looking at that. So we're riding on board with the HM Engineering Corvette right now, who's actually second, and I apologize, is second on track with Bendley Gods just up ahead, that green Corvette just up ahead where that prototype's heading towards. But the Bendley Gods team, they are on... Uh, they're on lap 19, about to go into lap 20. Oh, oh they're still. <laughs> That's close. And now, what, this is interesting. Will they let HM Engineering go by, or will they try and make their lap their life really difficult? You have to make your life difficult if you're yeah, I would the say so. Gods, but I think you've got to, don't you? Yeah, you've got to try and do it. But to be honest, I don't think there was much of a choice there. So interesting stuff. Now, for the Bendley Gods, they have. An oper they, ha they do have another alternative opportunity here though. They can basically, yeah, one thing they can do is just fill the mirrors with bright headlights, uh, or, you know, which is something the HM Engineering car won't have been used to, to have someone in their class being so close all the time. So the Bender Gods can stay right behind the, the HM Engineering car, put them under a bit of actual physical pressure rather than just on the timesheet and basically let them tow them around until the end of the stint and just get that slight fuel saving, only very slight. And, you know, that's that they can still put pressure on HM Engineering without having to actually try and overtake them, if you, if you see my logic. Yeah, maybe force them to use the tires, maybe use for more fuel early on, get, get Ramos Busk out of a rhythm, but it's definitely now really, really close. And if, you're, if you are the Bentley Gods, I think you do have to try and fight this and put and even maybe put that HM engineering car behind you if you can, as it's going to get really close down into Puhan, and they're going to be side by side again. Oh, 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 here we go then into the Fania chicane on the exit of Puhan, and this is exactly what the Benley gods need to do. Trevor Pastrami putting some serious pressure on Rasmus Busk right now. Now we know that. Probably about, maybe about five laps for Bendley Gods before their pit stop. Now, also the one thing to concern is, look at that, just drives underneath him. But of course, the Bendley Gods will have a much lower fuel load, so that car will be a little bit faster. And there it goes. So this is interesting. The Bendley Gods now go back into the lead. They do owe us a pit stop, but critically, they've, they're just hampering the pace of HM Engineering and making them know, saying, you guys might be out of the lead and you might have a good lead, but we are not going anywhere. I think it's sending the message too that we also have the pace to compete with you, even with a lower fuel. And also the tires may still be a bit older on that car as well. And he's still getting plenty of grip as now they head down into the source. The slower Audi right in front might prove to be a bit of an issue. And it is. Both cars go wide, but the Audi smartly gets out of the way. Yeah, good presence there from the second place. Audi in GT3. That is the 299 of Andrea Salvi. So that is that is curious, isn't it? Bendley Gods, not only going by HM Engineering, but starting to pull a couple of car lengths here. And uh, it be interesting to see if HM Engineering, if uh, now who is on board Rasmus Busk, if he actually fights back here, Jonathan, or whether he just shadows him for a few laps. Wondering maybe the safe fuel ride behind him a little bit, but also. I don't know how kindly I took to that. <laughs> Those really aggressive moves uh, going down to the Blanchemont and trying to secure that first position. Maybe HM Engineering wants to put that car back up front. But yeah, ride behind. Maybe save a little fuel. Save your tires a little bit. We'll see what it will honestly see what happens. And we have a, whoop, looks like a prototype around in the source. Okay, let's see what's happened here then. It's the number 10 car of um, Angry Bull Racing. Coming down towards the source, there's a big train of prototypes here. Coming down towards this very tight turn one air pin of the source on the brakes. Oh, plow job there from the 68 car. A big hit there. And that's the Phoenix Esport yellow car, which is a long way down uh, in 11th. And that is, oh, that's not on. And now the 10, the 21, and the 64 all close together in that prototype fight for fifth place as this GTE fight still continues. Benley Guides 
Gets a little bit of a gap now, a little bit more, more breathing room, but that red HM engineering car is still there. Yes, indeed, that little red Corvette is looming large in the rear view mirrors of the Benley Gods car in that uh, almost kind of like army, <laughs> army style uh, light green uh, camouflage color of that Corvette of Trevor Pastrami, the 169 car. So this is interesting for Trevor Pastrami. He's got maybe not quite as comfortable uh, uh, an experience as he maybe thought he was going to have for the remainder of his stint here. Now, interestingly, my... Ah, no, I'm looking at the wrong bit on the... T oh, no. So, my timing screen has rechanged uh, here, Jonathan. Has yours done the same, where Ben the Gods are on lap 16 of their stint and HM Engineering are on lap 20? There seems to be something has refreshed itself. Yeah, that's why I was trying to point it out. I was really confused at first. I was like, there's, there's no way that Ben the Gods have hunted down HM Engineering, but I think... Trevor Pastrami has hunted down Ramis Bosk and taken the lead away because that that was a huge gap. That was almost 40 seconds when we started our, our run down to the field. And my word, that's that's impressive pace out of that Corvette. It is, yeah. So this is, there is no, it, yeah, there, effectively there is no strategical price to pay for either driver. This is a straight fight. So wow this is this race has turned on its head and um, that that is really really interesting so rasmus busk for hm engineering is now in a wheel-to-wheel -wheel fight with trevor pastrami and now we've got a race here in gte so i wonder if anything happened to the hm engineering car when we were off on the immersion perhaps who knows but uh, it's now uh, it's now a dog fight um, and there's, there's, I don't think there's going to be much thought of strategy here. This is just going to be a wheel-to-wheel -wheel battle. Well, there is that four-lap difference between their stints right now, and you see the, the leading BMW getting a little bit in the way of the HM Engineering car, and evasive action has to be taken. But Ramis Bus is four laps longer on his stint. His tires are slightly older, and his fuel is a little bit lower. So maybe trying to save some fuel, trying to stretch that stint out more. That Ferrari, the the 488 has been stretching the stint out like no tomorrow. He almost has an extra stint in his hand. Yeah, but he's been going to 26, almost 27 laps. Whereas these guys have had to call it quits around lap 24 or 25. So it'll be interesting to see what HM Engineering does here. Does it stay put right along in second, or does he try to attack now? Yeah, this is uh, maybe this is the point where he just uh, shadows for a little while, possibly. But. Uh... We'll see. And he's in the draft now. Does he decide to take it? Of course, you get an option here. You can just flat out and use all the draft and try to make move. Or you or you can short shift. You can lift off nice and early Scott Dixon style. That lift and coast that he's so good where he can still do lap record pace and save fuel at the same time. That He's an absolute wizard uh, behind the wheel of both IndyCar and the sports car as well. Amazing sports car record as... Uh, Scott Dixon, he's won all the big races, including a win at Petit Le Mans um, a couple of weeks ago for Wayne Taylor Racing. So, I tell you what, it's been a great performance then by the, the Bendley Gods. Well, regardless if HM Engineering had a problem when we were off camera, or whether, um, you know, whether the Bendley Gods cars kind of run this gap down, they're Lived Trevor Pastrami, <laughs> he's right there on pace, isn't he? He's equal in pace, but here's the key thing, though. He's not leaving the HM Engineering car. The HM Engineering car is still there, looming large in the mirrors. So this is going to be a fight until the end of the stint, and I'm sure HM Engineering is now thinking what you were thinking earlier. I'm going to put the pressure on, see if he makes a mistake, and take advantage of it. Yeah, well, that certainly couldn't be um, more of an imposing sight than having HM Engineering Corvette looming in the mirrors, that's not what you want to see. And I just, I, this is, this is, I know that Rasmus Busk is bound to have a little bit up the, up the sleeve in terms of pace, but will he deploy it at this stage? Is that the right thing to do? Is it better for him to save a bit of tyre, save a little bit of fuel? We're coming into the point now where multiple, you could be wanting to stretch out more on the tyres as well. So, let's see. A little bit wide there from Pastrami, and here goes Busk side by side in the middle of the night here at Spa. 
And it's going to be HM Engineering. Rasmus Book gets the move on the exit, gets around Pastrami, but coming through Orouge and Radion, they get onto the Kemmel Strait. Rasmus, Rasmus Book, does he have enough in hand to hold off Pastrami on the draft? Here goes one of the prototypes going up the inside, so that might just slow. Oh, it's the prism car. Is that going to bring them together? It's really close. Oh, I thought they were going to run into one another there. Yeah, they had to back out of a little bit, Busk, because he was worried about the braking zone. But now here comes the Bentley Gods after Strami. He's looking down into Brussels and it deep on the brakes he goes and he retakes the lead. This is fantastic in respect for racing both these two. They head down into No Name Corner. And it looks like right now the Bentley Guts have once again re-secured the lead. But for how long? That 159, that little red Corvette, is very, very good and very, very racy. It is indeed. And it, interestingly, it just took the slightest mistake there from Pastrami. And Rasmus Busk took no delay and blasted by down the straight towards Eau Rouge. And this is a great battle, these two mid-engine Corvettes, these five and a half liter flat crank v8 it's just completely different noise to what we've come we've come to get used to with uh, corvette but amazing car as well and uh, really nice balance and of course a car with a lot of pedigree under its hood already in just one season sadly didn't get to see it at le mans this year but hopefully next year we will do as they come around blanc chemin flat out through there using all the exit room on the curb there and then hard on the brakes and Pastrami Juno is covering the line slightly. Rasmus Bush gets a perfect apex, clips the curb on both sides, back on the gas again and this, Jonathan, this is a cracking battle here under the moonlight here at Spa. Yeah, and this allows for the overall race lead and they're somehow like, really, really close in stint time, only four laps difference again for HM Engineering. Again, it might be better for them to ride right here, save a little bit of fuel some of the competitors for the behind have gone quite far. The Prism Racing one is 25 laps in the Porsche. And we know that 488 has stretched out his fuel a lot. So now we go down to the Kemmel Strait. And whoop, now we're getting defensive from the Bentley guys. As here comes Ramos Post charging as they head into the Lacombs. Here he goes then. Up the inside and... Pastrami, Kevin Pastrami gives him the broom. Oh and just has to back out of it, has to check up quite a lot actually uh, as Rasmus Busk was a little bit offline and then was slower in the middle of the corner. <laughs> Man, yep, I don't think there's anything, there was nothing to, well, I was about to say there's nothing to be upset about, yes, being losing the lead is, uh, is certainly upsetting, but uh, no, that was a clean move there from Rasmus Busk, but uh, of course checked him up in the middle, but oh, look at this, out of Jackie X corner, Oh, Pastrami's giving him no room at all. Just moves him onto the marbles. And through he goes. Changes the lead again. Brand flashes him back. Brilliant. Oh, these these two are now racing each other hard. They're racing each other just out of pure spite. Like, this is now, we're both angry. We want this lead. And this brilliant racing. They're doing some fantastic overtakes in places that we really have not seen a lot of good passing opportunities yet tonight. Uh, uh, just a little, a little uh, reveal. I've just looked to see who's in third place because you just, you, you, do, <laughs> you never know if these guys get, like you say, if they get uh, this battle gets any more bitter. The uh, Austrian sim racer Porsche could be, uh, could be looking to get involved in this leaders battle if they come together. But oh, full commitment there from Kevin Pastrami, and Rasmus Busk is uh, well, he's met his match here hasn't he is one of the prototype dives up the inside that's the 77 machine uh, of during a motorsport club in fourth overall and and i think the key for this battle is there is no gt3 traffic that they've had to come across and the prototype traffic has been relatively light it's like the second or third car to really go through these two so it, it's just a pure dog fight there's no shenanigans there's no picks or anything in the way this is just a pure fight of skill yeah, they, you, you kind of get that feeling that it's uh, they know it won't last. They know that the, the, the field will, there will be little pockets of traffic that they've got to worry about. And that could be where they, you know, they maybe perhaps decide to just play a little bit of a joker on strategy. Maybe just sacrificing one lap to get track position, maybe, perhaps. Uh, it would take a pretty gutsy call to do that. But uh, Rasmus Busk, he's... Uh, 
you, the one thing you can guarantee is that this stint for Rasmus Busk is going to be nowhere near as fast as if he were out on his own. And I think for the Bentley gods, they've done exactly what they need to do to get under the skin of the HM engineering guys and make them let them know going, we are not letting you have this. We are going to get under your skin. We're going to get into your head. And at this stage with 14 hours to go, they're doing a great job of doing that. Yeah, and no, I think the Bentley gods able to showcase a little of their pace as the end of the stint is coming for the HM engineering car, so they'll be diving down pit road any time now, probably another lap or two, and then this battle will probably get restarted again in about six or five laps time. Absolutely, yeah, we'll, we'll just see how they keep going uh, until they get to the pit stop. Like you say, I think this is going to rage on until they get to the pits. Now, what I want to know is when they get into the pits, do they um you know is there any driver changes going on i suspect this is the last time you want to do a driver change because you're going to lose all that track position is particularly for the bendley gods they want to effectively mirror whatever hm engineering are doing here because they want to kind of upset the rhythm anything they can do is another prototype comes through the 99 car oh this is going to be tight oh a little bit of an oversteer there from pastrami go oh, is he going to use the prototype as a pick they go side by side then down towards oh source they make contact banging wheels into turn one here oh it's going to be very very close indeed Whew. to me is pastrami has he got the inside line is he gonna take it there's a prototype there again so here comes the prototype shuffle side by side the prototype can't get through and hm engineering rasmus bush goes through There's a lot of angry headlights flashing, wow. but that was brave Rasmus Boost going toe-to-toe -to -toe into the source, down in the Radilon and the Rouge, and just sticking it, just looking that stamp and sending it was that 159 car. Yeah, that was big, big risk, but uh, now he's got that little bit of a gap now. There's maybe, oh, this is certainly about five or six car lengths now between those two guys. And this is where Rasmus Busk, if he doesn't want to be bothered by the Ben the God's car, he's got to lay down some qualifying laps now. He's got to try and break that, break basically break that rhythm up. He's got to, he can't have that Ben the God's car uh, up there and kind of disturbing the pace. We know that the HM engineering car in most cases has an ever so slight edge when in clean air, but the Ben the God's car when wheel to wheel can we basically hamper the pace of the HM engineering machine, the red one there. So let's see how the next couple of laps progress as they head towards the pit stops. And now here's another key thing again, that prototype train that we were talking about earlier. A lot of those guys aren't really fighting for position of the prototypes in that train. However, it, it, it came through, it's coming through now. So now there's more traffic involved in this fight. It's definitely gonna be key here to see like, when it catches each car and how each car has to react to their line, where they lose time. Indeed, yeah, as we see the 41 bull out car just having to back off there coming into the bus stop. He does get, he splits up the Corvettes again. So we've got the bull out and the angry bull car there together uh, in between these two GTE runners. So now, interesting, does the, does the, um, the Bendley car, I keep saying, I keep counting the Bendley God's car, do they what do they do now do they go do they go into pit lane do they get out of sequence or do they keep the pressure on it's a really really tricky one to decide what they do in terms of uh, strategy they've got they've still got plenty of time in their stint to go hm engineering only got maybe three possibly four laps but ben the gods have got about seven laps to go so be interesting to see what they do and whether they mirror one another i'm wondering if the ben the gods if it is better to mirror them HM Engineering, keep the pressure on, keep being visible, don't let them lose sight of you. Because I think that was, I think that's why what might have bit HM Engineering in the first place. If they, they lost sight of the Bentley Gods, and if either there was a steady pace from the 159, or there was a pit stop sequence that we missed, but now the Bentley Gods are here, and they're fighting hard, and then, also a key thing to note, the, both those bull cars were together, but the 41 had a 10-minute pit stop couple laps ago, so I'm not sure what that was about. The bull out racing car that was the first prototype crew, the second one is the angry bull car currently in seventh. 
Hmm, an interesting one indeed. Um, see what is going on there. Um, so this, I, I have to agree with you. I think if I was the uh, if I was the the Benley God's car, I would just mirror uh, exactly what you say there, Jonathan. Mirror everything that they do. Come into the pits at the same time. But until they break away from you, if they break away from you, you just got to try and, like you say, be visible, flash the lights, weave around, whatever you got to do to upset their rhythm and to not let them get into that rhythm and deploy the slightly superior pace that they have. They have to do it. And now, now we transition to the GT3 class. We got another good fight in a top podium position. Absolute Motorsports since the eSports going toe to toe. Andrea Salvi behind the wheel of the 299. Mark Hart barring the 266, and this is two different manufacturers with a fight we haven't often seen here so far tonight. No, absolutely, and this is uh, of course the leading Audi, the Absolute Motorsport design machine of Andrea Salvi at the moment, trying to hold off Burkhard Mehring in the BMW, which of course, uh, the Sims at Esports BMW, which of course had a little bit of a mistake at Puhon when we first came on here together. Uh, Oh, goodness knows whenever that was, about four hours ago. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so it's been kind of recovering from that over the last four hours. But now, getting back to its rightful spot in second place, it would appear in that BMW. Now, can he make a move on the brakes? Here we know the BMW is really good on stability. Looks to the inside. Oh, but Andrea Salvi very late on the brakes in the Audi. Aha! Ah, there we okay. go. <laughs> and he goes into pit lane. So that's why I didn't take a dive there. But uh, Sims at Esports GT3 into pit lane for another pit stop. And I love this BMW. I love these flashing lights on the front of it. It goes when it's on the pit limiter. It goes left, right, left, right, left, right. I, I, it, to me, it, it makes the BMW almost adorable. Like watching it go down pit lane. It's like, oh, this is this is just a little cute thing that they've added. It's, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's like it's winking at you. <laughs> it's like, tick, 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 tick. There it goes. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. So uh, not only is it stable, but it's also uh, it has a personality as, as well. The machine from Munich, Germany, of course, a place home to excellent beer. There is a theme here, as you can tell. Tra travel hour with Peter. Uh, you can, uh, excellent beer, and uh, I, I tell you what, I, I have to say, I do love uh, a schnitzel as well. So what you're saying is we we need I need it. Travel with you to get the best beer at it. But I don't know what we're going for. <laughs> absolutely, yes, absolutely. That is what we'll do. <laughs> Ooh, and th this is huge for that battle as well. That's a driver change as well for that car and that team. Is now Scott Brazer, someone who's yet to get in the car, he's gotten in the car. This is going to be key. Maybe Simpson Esports was teasing their strategy a little bit in the YouTube chat, saying, "Yeah, we don't worry. We got we got our aces yet." Look, look, calm and collected there, Scott Brazer. Absolutely unflappable, Wait, <laughs> waiting to get out onto the track. And this is critical, I think, Jonathan, because although... Ah, they're taking tyres now as well, uh, along with their driver change. And I think having a, key, having a fresh driver in at this point is going to be massive, because Scott Brazier, you know, we're, we're, he's been sitting on the sidelines for 10 hours since the start of this race. And now he's behind the, at last, he's behind the wheel of this beautiful BMW and now he can get out onto Spa-Francorchamps and lay down some laps. And I think this is where we see the Sims at Esports machine go forward. Yeah, that Audi is also, I think Andrea Salvi has been in that car for quite some time as well. So it'd be really, really interesting to see how this pit strategy for those two pl plays out. Unfortunately, the Slater Familian Bomber has two laps on those two, which I don't know if we mentioned this enough, how, that is incredible pace at BMW. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It's that car has just been, uh, it, like you say, it's sort of a GT3 plus, isn't it? It's uh, been really, really impressive all day. And like we say, they're really in a, uh, they're in a competition with the race itself, with completing a 24 hour race for them. Their pace is so good that they, you know, the only person, the only people that can beat them is themselves here, really, because their pace, they've got their competitors beat. So it's now just a case of running that car clean uh, at the pace that they're doing. And uh, like you say, it's just a case of that. That is very much an oxymoron because that is not easy. They're, they are in a commanding lead, but 
they still have a big challenge ahead of them. But just look at look at the like lap times though. Like they've been they've been consistently running sub two twenty seconds in the two nineteens, the two eighteens, and a lot of their competitors. We mentioned that second place fight. They've been in the two twenties, two twenty ones. So their their pace, the setup, all the drivers have been really on point for this team, and it's really really great for them, honestly. It is. They are they are in their own in their own planet. As they can see, they just. Ahead is that the sim yeah the Sims a car in third place, just ahead of them right now. So they've got a good, actually a really good. Both of these guys have now got a really good marker. And actually at this stage of the night, when things are really start, you're starting to get into the depth of the night. It's brilliant to have a good kind of, um, I don't know, a little bit of a dancing partner, I suppose, where you can both kind of match each other's pace. Uh, this will oh as Brazier goes a little bit wide there on the exit of Blanchimont. Will that allow the familiar bomber car around? Not yet, but the, the, you, what do you think? I, I reckon this is a great, great news for both cars now that they've got effect of their car. They've got a reference point to work from. Yeah, the only upsetting thing is it, for the Simpson car, the car behind you has a one on it. <laughs> it's like I'm in third. How in the world are, do you have a one on you? How in the world are you lapping me? And obviously, Brazier just getting in the car. You know, he's probably been watching the gaps, watching the race, maybe even watching the broadcast. And if you have been, hello. Um, but obviously, he, he knows that, that that other BMW for the Familiar Bomber team is just been quick. And watching what he does, too, could really help the Simpson team try and match their pace. Absolutely. There is nothing better than following as a flash, flash, flash there, the Familiar Bomber team. And I think that's pretty smart, actually, from uh, Brazier and the Simza car because he's just got in. He'll be really keen and ready to go. And like you say, if he can live with the Familiar Bomber car, which at the moment has uh, Michael Be Besuch on board, and like you say, there's nothing better than following a fast car and watching their lines, watching their braking points, and you're going, ah, that's the line around there, okay. And it's amazing that how much you can learn there. So the the, uh, the Simza car of Brazier just got to try and live with the leader here and try and just pick up some tips and, and increase that pace a little bit. That midfield battle in uh, LMP2 has heated up a little bit. The Angry Bull and WS Racing Esport Magenta are right on top of each other, and they've also hit traffic, including at least a broadcasting favorite Ferrari right now, so it's going to be really tight between these two. Yeah, we've got a soft spot for this uh, this Ferrari that's really uh, sort of really fought its way hard back up the the field that's sitting in fifth right now is the online sim racing DE machine, although two cars ahead do all pit stops very soon, so it will probably hop back to third once more. Uh, in fact, I think it is that Ferrari did have, uh, it did, yes, it had three green lights on the side of it, which means it's in third spot. So. Uh, yes, so it's, it's looking looking very good for that Ferrari right now for for a podium. We have the, the Angry Bull with WS Racing Esports. This has been a battle that we've, I think, gone back and forth from the entire time you and me have beaten here, Peter, because a couple of these LMP2 cars cannot seem to get away from each other and always find a way to find each other again after a stint or two. And the Angry Bull has been quick, but has had a few mistakes as we've seen. Yeah, exactly. It's um, it, it's you, you, sometimes it, that can work really well. Oh, as we see the Milner Motorsport car diving to pit lane, the yellow and black machine. In, in he comes in, Otmar Pinna, the 64. Now, if I remember correctly, was it the 64 car or was it the 68 car that was involved in that incident at La Source? I think it was the 68. It was the 68. It was, yes, I thought, yes, the, the Phoenix Racing yellow car. It's getting my yellow cars mixed up. <laughs> uh, oh, we've got a spinner, the Ferrari, the 119 car, the number 219 Ferrari had a bit of a spin there. The only other Ferrari in the field, driven by Dave South at the moment. Um, but uh, the honour of Maranello very much being held up by the online simracing.de car with Olaf Matzenbacher. He has been in that car for pretty much the entire time we've been on air. There was someone in there earlier and I already... It was, uh... I wish I had, like, a name sheet with me. 
Unfortunately, we don't. We just have the team names with me. But there was someone else in there for that first stint or two that he was on. And then he's been in there for quite some time. But he's, I mean, that team is doing a good job managing the stints, the tires. And I think they're the team that's showing, like, hey, we can't beat you on pace, but we can definitely outsmart you and put on a solid good races. Again, that 219, you know, showing that, you know, the other side of the Ferrari garage, unfortunately, a little bit of a rough ride so far, but sitting in 11th ain't too bad in a 16-card class. Indeed, yeah, absolutely, and getting, uh, you know, working working the way through the race, keeping the car moving, that's all you can do. Um, but yeah, they certainly, we got the, the 152 Ferrari, they're, uh, they're oh, no! oh! oh, the Simsa car! It's the Simsa BMW! Oh no, the Sims of BMW Z4 has been ploughed by a prototype. Now he's just at the pit lane. Can he get around there? I think he might be able to just about get into pit lane to get that repair. So what happens here? He's minding his own business at the moment, but there are prototypes approaching from behind. There it is. That is the Phoenix Racing. It's no way is that the leader. No. That is, I don't think that's the leader. That's the no. eight car. That's second place. That was second place. Oh. Oh. oh I was. Now, that was. And that was the other Audi. second place. No way. I think we need to see that again. Was that the second place Audi in GT3 that he then collected after that? Oh wow. What a. Oh no. Now I know we shouldn't take hot takes, but that was uh, that was completely on the eight. <laughs> they, I believe the two six six gave him the necessary room to get past, and really a shame for that Simpson team because they had been sitting pretty. Scott just got in the car. Oh, that's it. Yeah, he's he, ten hours watching his teammates minding his own business, and then the Audi. Oh my goodness me, the Audi there. Oh. The Audi of, now who is that? That is the Absolute Motorsport number 299 car. It was sitting second in class, just ahead of the Simza car. And driving along, mind his own business. And then a torpedoing BMW just comes flying along here. Oh! And then a prototype from behind. Oh my word. He's probably thinking, I'm, guys, leave me alone. And that's... And I, I kind of saw, as soon as we went to that first image of all that traffic heading down there, that was going to be an issue. Ooh, oh, and then the prototype hitting a, the Audi behind. Actually, that's the Corvette, I believe. That's a high-ranked Corvette, too. There's a lot of, like, good midfield cars involved in this accident. Yeah, and it's good. To the poor old Sims at BMW, it's like, it's like he's been punted like a snooker ball. And through he came, and, oh, and it made such a lot of... Oh, oh now it was the Familian but oh, the leader, Familian Bomber, Michael Besich, did he get contact? This is the GT3 leader, the runaway GT3 leader. Now, I tell you what, if it's not their day, I don't know when it will be, because they've had a brilliant, perfect day so far, and he was, you know, an, a, a couple of metres back, a couple of metres forward, that a GT3 leader was in big trouble. But look, he hits the brakes, he sees that accident happening, he sees the Simza car coming torpedoing along and goes, oh, I think I maybe just better back out of this for a second. Sometimes you don't have to be good, you have to have a little luck on your side. <laughs> there was the flying prototype the car, yeah, it was, it was a lot of things. Look at that, that 8 was struggling so much towards the end right here. The ring to start sim racing car and he just goes straight into pit lane he knows oh the look at the wheel huge steering damage there uh, it's the steering at a 45 degree angle it was huh it looked yeah, like pit. it a little bit of steering damage it looked more um but yeah you think as soon as he had that incident he thought oh, oh, damage that was a lot that was a lot of like, of higher up running contenders just kind of in one little bubble right there and that could have gone horribly wrong for a lot of them, and fortunately for the, the Reinfurt Sim Racing, that's awful because Phoenix Racing is already a minute ahead of them. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Now, uh, so this is... now, just an update on the front. We have a driver change in the GTE class for both cars. We have the Anton, Anton uh, Gulich uh, on board the HM Engineering Red Corvette, and the Bentley Gods have now got Andreas Dahlstrom on board as well. 
So, uh, and the on online sim racing DE car about, oh, about just under four minutes behind the leading two, but they're now in a place where if the leaders hit any problems at all, they would be right there. Yeah, and I think uh, the driver change might be might have been for the best, at least for both these two, because I know both teams, uh, both drivers were a little bit angry <laughs> when they were racing each other for the lead, but this fight is going to start up once again. And again, about five laps different this time. The Bentley Gods have just fresh out of pit road, whereas HM Engineering has been on track for a little bit. So they do have, you know, warm tires as well if they have a driver change with tires. So now they have full fuel, full tires, and fresh drivers. This should be fun. Absolutely, and this is exactly what the Bend ben the Gods were wanting because, well, they need they need to keep the physical pressure. And there's a big difference, I think, between pressure on the timesheets and actually a physical race car behind you putting pressure on you. It's a completely different matter, and that's exactly what the Bentley Gods have been able to get themselves into that position where they can really make, to be honest, make the HM Engineering guy's life a little bit more difficult than it was. And this is a... For HM Engineering, they're probably thinking, ah, this is um, this wasn't what we're used to. We're now have to actually, <laughs> we're going to have to really start pushing pretty hard now. Yeah, it's like we were taking a nice little Saturday night stroll around Belgium, and then all of a sudden, there's now another green Corvette behind me. <laughs> so it's and now the strategy as well could be completely different. They're now on the same strategy in terms of drivers and tires. So this is just going to be another pure dogfight from here on out. It would appear so. I mean, let's just, this is what we want to see, a duel throughout the night between HM Engineering and Bengali Gods. 159 versus 169. And I have to say, I do love the uh, the HM Engineering colours. They look really good on any race car, but particularly on this this Corvette. Um, and of course, John, we, here on Racebot TV, we were, uh, we were lucky to uh, broadcast the brand new um, Simpower uh, Porsche Sport Carrera Cup and uh, H of Engineering won the team championship in convincing fashion and Maxim Ramstein came runner-up in the championship to Alexander Teeb, the uh, Porsche Esports Super Cup driver and uh, yeah, H of Engineering very very strong indeed there as well um, so good to see them both pretty much quick in whatever they put their drivers into. We also see Kieran Harrison does a great job in the uh, ARLTC Touring Car Championship as well. Yeah, this is definitely, for at least for H&M, this is definitely a, a good showcase right now of what pace they can put in a class with a lot of cars that have equal power. A lot of cars are running the Corvette. There's a lot of Porsches in here, and there's still those two Ferraris, and they, they've really put on a good showcase in the... Ben the Gods, however, have also just put pressure on them, and that's something that we hadn't seen for much of our little broadcasting seniors. HM has had a very quiet time out in front until now. Yeah, we didn't necessarily give the GT category much love because, well, yeah, HM Engineering were were really cruising, weren't they? But uh, and and interestingly, the you know the HM Engineering their outright best lap about three tenths of a second quicker. Uh, than uh, Bendy Gods, but that's only on outright pace. The consistent lap after lap pace. Well, you can, you don't need the timing screen to see it. You know, the Bendy Gods are right there, and they're they're currently sitting just under a second behind, and that is well within draft range. And you know, the more that these laps tick by for HM Engineering, after maybe ten laps or so, um, you know, those guys. Um, uh, Anton Gulick at the wheel of that HM Engineering car, he's thinking, hold on a minute, for the last 10 minutes, I've pulled our biggest rival around and given him a massive free pass on pace, and I've had to work my tyres and work my fuel more than him. So I wonder when that dynamic will start to play a factor. We yeah, saw briefly there for a second as well, that little collision all the way in the chicane with the 8 uh, LMP2 car has now opened up the fight for the second spot in LMP2, the, the T3 Esports car, which has had a very lonely race in third, is now all of a sudden within touching distance of that eight, and we don't know how much damage is on that machine, really. No, indeed, there, there's bound to be something um, that's caught the eye or, or have uh, bent that machine a little bit out of shape. But they are pretty, uh, well, they're uh, pretty pernickety, they're pretty uh, fickle machines, these Lara P2s. You don't want to bash them around too much. You want them to be running at their best. 
And for T3 Esports, yeah, like you say, they might not have necessarily had the outright pace, but they've just clicked off the laps and they've avoided the incidents. And in multi-class sports car racing, there is no rest, particularly in the prototype classes. We see a big, what looked like a big rock up there. It might have been a, a connection issue, perhaps. But yeah, it's, uh, well, it's uh, it's all about just, just constantly put those laps in one after the other and trying to avoid those issues with traffic, which are around every single corner. There's even an issue right here with traffic. There's a slower Audi in front. Nate has to check up, and this is going to cost a tons of time. And the other little annoying thing, at least for the Reinsfunk Sim Sport Sim Racing team, well, not too far behind the 71 is the Phoenix Racing Esport Green is our overall leader. So it's going to be a little bit like insult to injury, that little, you know, I don't know what to call it, like a schmazel at the chicane is now cost them a chance of hunting down the leader and they can't even be put a lap down. Yeah, that was that that, that uh, incident is going to haunt them. Uh, let's say uh, it, it, definitely a Halloween horror there for the eight car. Is ooh, tell you what, that great uh, great camera angle there to show the what the the power on oversteer there of the T3 Esports car, Marcus. Roy there, as soon as he was asking for the power, the rear of the car, this Delara, as it always shakes its head, it's, oh, oh, that was close. Oh, my word, it's, oh, he gets barged aside by the, um, uh, by the race leader. Yes, the Phoenix Racing Esport Green leader goes through, and I see Marcus Brock was really unlucky there. He just got basically pushed across by the GT3 car, and uh, uh, Jonathan, I think he did a great job there to avoid what could have been a huge accident. And he did a great job not taking himself out as well as the leader because that could have been disastrous. Although the Phoenix Esports car is getting very aggressive with some of this GT3 traffic. It, it comes in clumps around here at Spa. It comes in little little clumps as they go around some of the other slower beat'em Ws and Audis. And now clean track. Now you can follow the leader and hopefully chase down the Rhinos for number eight. The gap is still about a second and a half. And now he's getting draft on the leader but he's gonna sit there save some fuel <laughs> he had a huge run he had that run done there didn't he and then oh god i thought he was gonna have a look there he that was really interesting marcus Broich there he had the draft on the leader he could have basically blown straight by him but decided like you say to lift off and sort of sit behind him and save some fuel but then decide oh maybe i will go past oh no maybe i won't so Marcus Broich, you've got to try and resettle here and try and hang on to the back of the Phoenix Racing Esport Green Machine. But again, it comes down to that kind of physical presence. Although the T3 Esports car is a lap down, just being there and just hassling the leader can make all the difference. Yeah, of course, the leader into a mistake. We've already seen the overall leader of the race get into an accident. The Simsa Esports number six was involved in an accident with a lapped car earlier. Yeah. So. You know, anything can really happen, and right now the 66 has run a good race, they just need to keep it clean and tidy, and unfortunately, that little lap traffic issue with the 71, they're now five seconds behind the Reinsport Sim Racing car, so that battle has kind of disappeared, as well as the battle in GTE, the HM Engineering car has been able to pull out two seconds on the Bentley Gods. Yeah, just uh, slowly but surely edging away, just that's HM Engineering, you know, we said it, They've just got that tiny edge on pace, and they're showing it now. They've, now that they've got the clean air, uh, I say that <laughs> as soon as I look back to my screen. They've uh, clean air, not only that, got the GT3 leader to worry about here, the Familian Bomber BMW. They come down towards uh, Pujon and gets through safely. But yes, that, that sort of lap traffic is, is the only thing that can really sort of get in the way now of the HM Engineering car, now that he's broken away from the Bend the Gods, this is not great for the Bend the Gods, this is brilliant for HM Engineering. Yeah, and they're now, they're on pretty much the same strategy, there's only a five lap difference between them in terms of tires, driver wear, and fuel. So, going forward, it'll be interesting to see what each car does for each stint. I imagine they're going to double stint the tires and double stint the drivers for this next stint. But will they triple stint the tires, or will they change drivers after the double stint? It, it's gonna it's gonna really be thought provoking for what each team does as the minutes tick on. 
I think it's interesting. I'd love to know. Uh, I'd love to know that otherwise, but I, I would suspect that a triple stint for the GT cars is going to be tough. Um, you know, it's nearly three hours on uh, on a set of tyres. Um, double stint, uh, definitely. Um, but I think here at Spa, especially even though it's in the night, I think that some there's obviously quite a lot of high loadings on the tyres. I mean, I don't know. I've, I've, uh, I've, I certainly have never had the ability to to triple stint on the GTs, Jonathan. But I, I, have you have you seen it done before? I've seen like talks about it in like some little endurance series here and there, and I know it's it depends on the track conditions and it's tricky. And it's obviously at night and it's cool and you could try and do it, but if you are the Bentley Cods, you I think you have to think about taking those risks and stuff. You're still within touching distance. You're running similar lap times, but HM Engineering has been able to pull out that little bit of a gap. Yeah, that's going to be fascinating to to see what the what the strategy plays that the that the Benley gods use um, to try and uh, hassle HM Engineering at the front. So let's take a look at uh, some of our GT3 runners as well. The 288 car, the Ring Fazire Sim Racing GT3 Pro car. They're one of our many BMW Z4 runners. You see the big spits of flames coming out the back of the car there. It's at the moment on board this car is uh, Dominic Robach, who is doing a grand job at the wheel of that car with uh, Patrick Zerninski, Ben Schaefer, and Christopher Janssen joining him so far. But do they have a fifth driver? We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they play out in their class as well. Uh, with that incident happening to some of their rivals, the Simpson Esports Garden, the 299, you know, their class leader almost getting caught up in damage. Now the podium spot's a little bit open. They're only about 20 seconds back from the 291, which, that's a doable distance. That's that's reasonable. You could almost plan a pit stop around that. So they're going to be in the podium fight for this class for sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They, they are indeed. Now look at that, though. They have some large damage at the back of that car if you look at the rear where the exhaust you see the exhaust popping and crackling there just when the light catches it you'll see in between the tail lights and just underneath and in between the tail lights you'll see a bit it's like the incredible hulk has punched the back of that car so that's bound to be having an effect and maybe they're just running to the end of the stint to get it uh, to get it repaired but that car is um a little bit, uh, yeah, you can just sort of see it there, just a little bit of damage at the back of that car. So we'll see how that plays out over the uh, over the coming stint or so. In fifth in class in GT3 is the number 200 Reparix by Artel Motorsport, uh, also running uh, a BMW uh, Z4. Uh, it's great to see so many of the Z4s, I have to say, I do have a soft spot for this car. Marcus Unkoff is at the wheel of that car right now. Now, this is the, the car that kind of triggered a bit of a chain reaction with the uh, the uh, the front runners in LMP2. Um, but uh, managing managing along fine at the moment with uh, Daniel Wilhemi, Patrick Schmidt and Daniel Epkins and Rennie Penkwe, uh who are the other drivers in that car. But currently holding down fifth spot. It's the quiet fifth. I mean, he has been unfortunately involved in some of that lab traffic fiasco, but the 200 car minding its own business. And again, with that incident happening to its rival, he's only 20 seconds behind 288. Like the podium race now for this class is is a much wide open as it was earlier. Because we also don't know how much damage is on the 299, and the BMWs have good pace. It's unfortunately this car it looks like it's been through a bit of a battle, a bit of a war, but. Might be able to pull something together here. They need some rep. I, I, I'm assuming that Reparix is some form of car repair business, so they've got the right sponsor anyway. <laughs> That's for sure uh, at this moment in time. We see that the Reparix BMW. Uh, in uh, sixth place in class is the team Racegitter.de number 235 machine of Siegfried, Siegfried Beuchner with Sergey Bloom and Michael Yost, his teammates in that car. Now, they've only had three drivers in the car so far. Are they a team with a couple of fresh uh, a fresh guns up their sleeve, as we say, a couple of hot shoes just waiting in the wings, ready to get into that car? Yeah, this is a team that has that was, that has been towards the front of this class, and it was a bit of an issue at Puhan. They've had fights with some of these guys in the mid-tier, and right now they've just been kind of mired back in sixth place. But, you know, sixth place is all right. 
they are a little bit a ways away from their rivals and a little bit off sequence as well. So it'll be interesting to see how they try and combat from this and, and whittle that gap down. Well, indeed. Next up, then, is the, in the GT3s. We've also got in uh, in seventh place the number 285 Mulner Motorsports sim racing car. Kevin King Hogan Hovel uh, is at the wheel of that BMW right now. And this is another one where this car has been involved in a couple of little skirmishes as well. One with uh, Jan van den Spring, I remember, earlier in the race, where he was uh, ambushed a little bit and involved in an incident that wasn't necessarily his fault. Well, and he's also uh, had a little bit of a tussle with the, the barrier on the inside of Wuhan as well. So it's a damaged race car that's definitely been through the war. But they're still they're still in seventh, and they're only seven seconds back from that 235. So they're showing they still have a little bit of pace and life in that BMW, despite it going through a war. They actually just ran a 219 last time, which is one of the fastest laps in their class. So you know, there's still potential with this 285 to come up with a really good result. 43 seconds further down the road from the Mjolnir 285 machine is the 247 Albrecht Motorsports car, the BMW of Matthias Kraus. Uh, next along in 8th spot, uh, Matthias sharing with Mike Stenica, Tobias Gabler and Sven Albrecht in this, uh, well I have to say I love this uh, paint scheme here, this white, blue and red paint scheme, you know that wouldn't look out of place. Uh, on a it almost looks like an NFL jersey that uh, that paint scheme. Yeah, it's, like a, it's like it's almost like sports colors. Like it's a very nice green. Right eye catching. Unfortunately, the eye catching thing for me is a lot of that front end damage. It's going to be definitely hurting on the straights, and it looks like uh, a bit of rear damage as well. Speaking of damage, and uh, we're skipping out of order here, but the car in 11th, right behind this Albrecht Motorsport car is, I think, is the Simza machine. Uh, yes, it is. So Scott Brazier. Poor old Scott Brazier. What can you say? I mean, look at the state of the rear wing of that car. It's bent out of shape. And he'd been in the car for a tiny amount of time. He'd, he's waited 10 hours to get in the car. And then he gets absolutely plowed into the middle of next week by a prototype. That's got to hurt. Uh, it's going to be frustrating for the Simpson team too because we just mentioned right beforehand how good of a position they were in to really fight for second place and now they're going to have to claw back and maybe have to overtake that 247 as well who's also seen a fair bit of contact as well on the right front. Yeah, these are the cars lower down in the classes that have had struggles that have been through the wars but they're still chugging along, still doing all right. Yeah, indeed, yep, they're still carrying on. The spirit of endurance, that's what it's all about. In ninth place, GD, in the GD3s, we have the number 210 Wolf Motorsport Sim Racing Lupus machine, one of our very few, uh, sadly, very few Audis out there. That's Jan Mende, who's at the wheel of this car. Uh, this is a, a five-man team till now, with Max Damert, Johannes Witt, Merlin Mark Wolf, and Jörg Patsch in this Audi. And I have to say that I love the noise this Audi makes. Of course, it shares an engine with the Lamborghini Huracan, of course, they're owned by the same parent company, the Volkswagen Audi Group, and 5.2-litre V10, normally aspirated, and it is just lovely. Mounted in the middle of the car, of course, in road form, this car, most of the time, uh, is, is sold with four-wheel drive, but, of course, the racing car, rear-wheel drive, and actually, Audi have just started releasing this car in, the, in road form, with uh, a rear-wheel drive setup, but the Audi R8 has such an impressive uh, uh, competition history. It's won the Spa 24 hour, it's won the Nürburgring 24 hour, it's won the Bathurst 12 hour, and the Daytona 24 hour. Yeah, it's unfortunate that we only see a handful of them in the field, and obviously for Wolf Motorsport, uh, sim racing, because they all want to do well. It looks like they've kept the car pretty clean, maybe just struggling for pace, setup, anything like that, a penalty here or two might have also set them off, but they still have a little bit of potential. They're not too far off the pace, at least of their other classmates, but, you know, it's definitely going to be a challenge, especially, again, being one of the only Audis in the field. Indeed, and also, just looking at our, our time and screen now, um, every driver on the iRacing service has something called an iRating, which basically is a effectively like a world ranking of their results, uh, good or bad, your I rating goes up and down according to results. And 
looking at the guys in this car, slightly lower eye ratings than some of the front runners, but that is often can be more to do with experience rather than actual out-and-out -out, uh, skills. So uh, they're doing a great job to, to be wheeling this Audi along. It's not an easy car to drive quickly. And, uh, yeah, they're doing a great job uh, in at the moment and, uh, you know, keeping the car clean and keeping it ticking over. In 10th uh, spot in the GT3 runners is the AMC Birkenfield EV Pre-Alpha. That's a nice short team name for you. Number 211 of Marco Selnick in this oh look at this car i like the look of this with the race union wind street windscreen strip there yellow black and red in the of course german uh colors i have to say i like that one that's i like the the um the elements uh sort of uh, graphics along the side of it as well it's kind of like a honeycomb like bumblebee kind of feel but it's yeah. more menacing than like the like the corvette other uh, the camaro bumblebee you see in like the transformers movies like this is more a bit more dark, a bit more racy. Yeah, it, I tell you what, the BMW Z4 GT4 would make a great transformer, wouldn't it? It, it kind of looks like it could just morph into a massive robot, could it? <laughs> oh, as it goes straight down, perfect timing. The AMC Birkenville machine going into pit lane for repairs. And it even, I tell you what, it, it, when, especially when it's in pit limiter mode with those flashing lights, it looks even more like a transformer. So are you going to be pitching this to Michael Bay as soon as we're done here? <laughs> uh, why not? Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 um, we'll, we'll spend all the proceeds on beer in Munich. And you, and you also mentioned I rating and uh, license rating. Previous team, well, the current driver, Michael Zunich, has the lowest I rating of anyone in the field, but is able to do all right. And he's only a D licensed driver as well, but again, he's kept the car out of trouble. The car's still running, it looks in one piece. You know, they're doing all right. Absolutely, yeah. To be to be running, he's running a two minute twenty three right now. It's his last lap, and that's really really impressive for someone who's clearly obviously quite new to the service. And it's completely different. I remember when when I first uh, came on to to, to i racing. Was, you know, I've driven racing games my whole life. I mean, it's I've been a huge part of my love of motor racing. Has been the now. I wonder was he serving a drive through penalty there? I guess he must he didn't have stop. Been. Ah, okay. But yeah, the, coming coming back to that, he, um, you know, when you go from something like a Forza Motorsport or Gran Turismo or really it doesn't matter which pick anyone you like, when you come to iRacing, it, it's a it's a different level, it's a different proposition. It's very it's called a simulator for a reason. It's meant to be as accurate and realistic as possible, and that sometimes can make it very very challenging. Yes, and to, to that actually was yes serving a penalty for forcing the the number eight off track. So actually it looks like this BMW got a little bit of the the blame for that whole chicane incident because this was involving the it a while ago. So that's a bit interesting on that one as well. And then uh, the only other penalties we've seen so far, the number 10 is still under investigation with the 68 for causing a collision. And then the beating and banging by the two Corvettes in the GTE class. Uh, was reported, but no further action is um, taken on those. I wonder who did the reporting. That would that is an interesting one. <laughs> it, it just gets car one and car two, so unfortunately I can't see who did the reporting, but I kind of want to think they both reported each other. <laughs> and I, I, because both <laughs> of them, at the end of that stint, were not happy with one another. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder. Is that a bit of mind games going on, perhaps? Is that the... It uh, could be the Bendley gods just uh, putting down uh, a little bit of a marker there, just a little bit of a tactic. Who knows? It could be HM Engineering saying, oh, how dare you race us up at the front. But uh, yeah, interesting dynamic there indeed. So, uh, in, also we'll talk about the, uh, let's have a chat, but let's have a look at the number 289 Ring Fazar Sim Racing GT3 Am car of Marco Han. There it is. And he's racing with Noah Dietz, Martin Strahm, and David Kemper. And, uh, ooh, they've got a car. I like, the, I like the paint scheme on that car as well. They've got grey, black, and little green stripes on it as well. It's almost tequila patron esque, but it almost looks like it's been driven by someone who's drank too much tequila patron because that car looks very second hand. Oh, God. Yeah. The back, look at the back of it. Oh, God. I believe, and someone in the comments may correct me if I'm wrong. This was the car involved in the 
the scuffle earlier with the Simpson Motorsport car. They had an, a 74 minute pit stop. So it's heavily damaged this car. That is correct, yes. I'm looking at the laps. They are, so the Simza Esports car uh, in 11th place in GT3 is 39 laps down. The Ring for Sight Sim Racing GT3 Amcar, 78 laps down. Uh, so, do you know what? They're the, they're the last of the runners. We've only had two retirements, but fair play to them that they've kept going. They've kept this car limping around, and I love that. That is the spirit of endurance. Well done to you guys. The the Sim Ring Ring Fazart Sim Racing GT3 Am led by Marco Han at the moment. Well done, chaps. Because I tell you what, absolutely nothing they could have done about that particular incident, and it ruined their race. But it's, they've not let it dampen their spirit. No, and they're still they're still pushing on it. Maybe if other disconnects happen, other crashes happen again. We're not even halfway through. Great point. Yeah, abs absolutely. You never give up. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is that there's, um, you can almost think, right, this is a challenge. This is a new challenge. We we know that we've been punted off. We know that the wind's off. We know we know that. But sometimes you can say, how cool is that to say the car was completely toasted. We had an hour and 50 minute pit stop, but we got it back out on the track and we got it to a top 10. In they could get a top 10 in class. They're 12th in class right now. Why not get a top 10 in class? And the uh, you know, everything is, uh, that's what I love about endurance racing as well, is that you, you just never, ever say die. Uh, I remember one of my favorite, my favorite uh, endurance racing story is actually a motorcycle one. There's an amazing race called the Suzuka 8 hour in Japan, and uh, it's held in the middle of the Japanese summer, which is incredibly hot and humid, and held during the heat of the day as well. And the one of the, one of the riders crashed, very, and at Suzuka, it's a long lap, crashed about a quarter of the way around the lap and actually pushed and he was quite badly injured himself he pushed the crashed motorcycle all the way around the circuit on the grass all the way around to the pits just so they could keep going it's almost like shades of like ricky bobby in a talladega it's, nights walking yeah. across the finish line that's exactly what it was like yeah <laughs> i forgot that's i love that's one of my favorite films i love it <laughs> Get a look at now our overall leader, and that's I want to say it was a similar painted car in front, but that was not his teammate's car. But they have almost a lap, they have an entire lap over their other cars, and they're about to lap the eight. And the flashing headlights showing that hey, please move out of the way. The eight is not giving any way. That was a bit of a, a door slam on that one. Yeah, you almost feel like I, I, sometimes I wonder, I guess it depends on the driver, but uh, or the drivers involved, perhaps, is that. You know, sometimes if a driver, you know, we're all human beings, if you've got a car behind you flashing, flashing, flashing at you like this, oh, this is getting tight, oh, this is tight, oh, there's a little gap, oh, oh, oh. breathe in, oh, wow, I th that was sketchy, that was very sketchy, but, you know, oh, spin, spin, oh, how did he hang on to that? How did they not hit each other? And, and how did they also find the time to still flash the headlights at each other? Well, I must be, I, I do apologize, dear viewer. That's not the smoothest commentary of, for 10 or 15 seconds I've ever had, but I think I was just taking a deep breath every time thinking they were going to have an accident. But coming back to my point, Jonathan, I'll get there in the end, is that, you know, we're all human beings. If you've got the driver behind flashing the lights at you, I... When I, if I were in a stubborn mood, I'd go, no, get lost. I'm just going to deliver. I'm, I'm not. I'm really not going to make it easy for you now, just because you've been rude and flashed your lights at me. And designs for some racing cars also had issues of their own, and they're probably already frustrated as they're showing more of their frustration at the number 66. And our, our commentary for Ferrari also in the mix right here, getting in the way, causing a few pacing <laughs> moments. <laughs> the eight wants his lap back. Soren Klexfeld wants his lap back. And this is, do you know what? If you're the 60, if you're the 66 car and you've got a lap lead, give him the lap back. You don't, you don't need it. That's the, this, the one thing. All that he's gonna do here, he's putting himself in so much more risk of an incident than if he was just to let the eight car go. But maybe he feels like he'd be slowed down too much. I don't know. But the. The, the number eight, Ring for Zart Sim Racing, bear in mind this, yeah, they're they're racing for position. You can see the strategy here of Soren Kolodice in the number eight car. 
Although he's a lap down, he's got to try and hassle the 66 and just try and make his life really difficult. For the 66, you all kind of just want to let him go and just sit behind him. Like, they're running similar lap times, except that last, but obviously there was a second difference between the two. And then, I, I think the other, the other thing that the running sport car is going to be annoyed about was the passing during that lap traffic, which again, I love to see that <laughs> going into like Combs again, just to examine how they not hit each other, and off uh -oh. the eight goes! Soren Clarkson has gone off, continues flashing the headlights, gets back on the track, and hopefully not a lot of damage on their car. Now, if there's proof for you that um, <laughs> that the flashing the lights is just simply a distraction tactic, because there was nothing, <laughs> there was nothing the 66 car did there to cause that incident, from what I could see. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, there you go. And of course, when in these cars they're so low to the ground and they're so kind of fragile, if you like, when you go careering over the grass like that, you hear all these horrible crunching noises and. The, you can damage the floor of the car and it can really reduce the performance quite considerably, more than you would maybe think. Yeah, now the concerning thing is if you know these mistakes keep piling up and the driver temper keeps going up, because obviously you know, they, the team has to be frustrated. Can T3 Esports and Marcus Bork, you know, chunk them down? They've already taken away three seconds in the last two laps, so you can't afford these little mistakes right now if you're in the eight car. No, you cannot. No, definitely not. And Marcus Broich, he'll be getting that information from his team, from his spotters, whoever. He will have a form of communication in the car, uh, and that is critical. And yeah, here's the not too far behind at all, the T3 Esports car of Marcus Broich. And uh, again, talking about that physical presence, isn't it? Spa is such a big circuit that often you're you're kind of racing against the watch or you're you're looking at your competitors lap times they're on a different part of the circuit but when you do come together that impact of being present being there in the mirrors is huge especially since it could really upset the rhythm of the two drivers and you know it's good for the phoenix racing esport leader that he's able to continue setting decent lap times but uh it's clearly shaken up the ranks for number eight car a little bit he's been consistently slower than the t3 esports machine and you know maybe in another stint or two they're going to be right on top of each other indeed yeah absolutely they could be so it's it's going on in all the classes uh, let's take a little update in the gte and yeah sit so that you know interestingly that gap has been pretty steady six and a half seconds to my timing screen just in case. <laughs> uh, yes, it's been at the moment 9.5 seconds between HM Engineering and Ben Legod. So, just what we thought then, Jonathan, once HM Engineering were ahead, they've been able to lay the hammer down uh, and start to pull away. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's if it's really the traffic that's hurting HM Engineering's lap times. You can see right there getting held up by that BMW, the sixth place car in GT3. It has to be this traffic, and it's not the car is probably just not set up to really deal with both the GT3 and the Prototech traffic. So, you know, Bentley guys are still not out of it. Obviously, they're on the same strategy and on the same cycle in terms of tires and drivers. So, this is still either driver's race. Indeed, yeah, and and you know, even being within 10 seconds after nearly 11 hours of a race, that's close. Uh, even if it's not quite in the mirrors, it's close enough that. The Benley gods have they've just, they've just got to just keep what they're doing. Try not overdrive. If if H of Engineering car is two or three tenths a lap quicker, let them do it. Just make as long don't chase after those two or three tenths that you don't have uh, and then make a mistake. That's where the problems come in, is when you try to match somebody's pace when you don't have it. And let them make the mistakes. Make sure you stay uh, on the track. And it's a really intriguing sort of almost like a cat and mouse battle here in the GTE pack. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see the different strategy as well for those two teams playing out against each other. Again, 5 left 7 is a big lock up there. I think somebody in front <laughs> uh, was the third place guy in GT3, the 03, now the 288 Ryan Sports Sim Racing GT3 Pro. And a major lock up there. But again, back to GTE. It, it is going to come down to the strategy and who gets on the right tires when, what drivers are in there when. It, it's going to be a big chess match between these two for the rest of this race. Indeed. Uh, well, it's one class where it's uh, 
it certainly ch chest masks not necessarily it's an absolute pulverization from the million bomber team patrick hen in the wheel of that 257 bmw right now lapping a lot quicker than all of their other competitors and uh, two laps ahead at this point from their nearest competitor and for them it's just a case of just click off those laps and cruise at home and it's just i honestly think it's really really impressive that you know we have a car field that has a lot of bmw c4 gt3s and this team has just been able to click off lap after lap after lap and they have two laps in the field indeed yeah it's it's um you know to have uh, yeah to have two laps on the field at this stage is uh, very impressive uh, uh indeed so in the lmp2 another intriguing one where tra lap traffic has been a, a bit of an issue for <laughs> The LMP2 runners specifically trying to get through it cleanly. The Simza Esports car of Temo Toika, they're now back up to 8th. And they're now only one lap away from the 7th the place car of WS Racing Esports Magenta. So, Jonathan there, but I tell you what, the Simza guys, although they had that big incident earlier on and a long pit stop, they are just slowly but surely working their way up through the field. And who knows where they'll emerge when day daylight starts to, uh, to come up over Spa. When we talked to one of the team members, they were really optimistic about their chances. They were saying top five and podium are, are both still on the table. So they obviously think they have the pace and they have the good strategy to get this car to the end. And again, they're up to eighth. They're only a lap behind. And I say only, but there's a lot of like big gaps in the field. And they can, they can work with this. They're running consistently clean and well good laps. 203 last time by. It's actually a couple seconds faster than some of the competitors that they're going to be racing with here in a few hours' time. Indeed, if they, if they can stay happily in the 203s, they will make pretty swift progress throughout the night. So that's their kind of target number. If they can consistently break the 204 barrier, be in the 203s, they will work their way up the field. The critical uh, kind of caveat to that is they cannot afford any other mistakes. They've got to keep the car on the road. So if they feel they can do a 202, don't do it. Do a 203 and make sure that you're in that bracket consistently. Give a little bit more room to the GT runners. There's a lot more slower GT runners out there who are um, basically dealing with their own damage issues right now. So uh, I think this is this is going to be one of the stories of the night when we hand over to our uh, to our colleagues, Jonathan, is. Uh, you know, how far can uh, Simza in the number six car um, get their way back? Well, again, they sounded optimistic, and I, I'm willing to side with their optimism if, they're, if they think they can pull it off and if they think they had the driver's skill and the strategy to bring the six car home. And they were, they were leading. They were your overall leaders by almost a minute. So they have the pace. They just need to make sure they have, you know, the proper strategy and no more mistakes no more running into bmws or managing traffic yeah that's um like it's one of these things easy to say very difficult to do but that's their mission they're they're um they've all every car in this race has their own separate mission that's what endurance racing is all about and for sims at esports the former leaders they um they, they talked about it maybe a top five potentially even the outside chance of a podium and why not um they keep running at the pace that they are They've, uh, they've got every chance indeed to do that. Just looking at as they come over the line, what their lap pace is looking like for Simza. A two, my word, 202.7 last time around. That's flying. Yeah, someone's driving with a lot of authority. You can see the lap difference between <laughs> these last few laps between the 64 and the 6. It, that 6 car is on rails and Again, remember, they were your overall leaders until an accident with a BMW at the tail end of the GT3 field at 289, who's still limping along, but it, it's definitely a, a race where they can still manage to do things, and they have, again, they're showing good pace. Yep, and uh, bearing in mind that they're right on it because they're absolute fastest, which you're not really going get, to get close to at this time in the race, a 201.348, so actually all things being considered if they're able to do 202s well they are um, they are right in the ball game right now and um, that car whatever damage it had has been 
repaired. I don't think actually they're really contending with any damage issues right now. No, it looks very, very smooth. And if the lap times, you know, 202s, and it doesn't seem like there is much damage to be had. Obviously, the, the steering issue has gotten fixed, and maybe they've had to make an adjustment or two to also compensate for any damage. But if there, if there still is anything wrong with the car, uh, it's obviously Team Mortoika hasn't found anything yet. No, obviously not. Well, uh, we're, uh, we're just gone past the 13 hour to go mark, um, so we're approaching half distance now of this 24 hour race. We're racing into the night here at Spa Francorchamps. We're going to ride on board with uh, a fan favourite car, the number 77. Uh, machine, the Durner Motorsport Club car of Nick Sileski, who is in the one of the Delara P2 cars. So we're going to ride on board. Ah, now, <laughs> perfect timing. He's just gone into pit lane. We will go on board in a couple of moments with the number 77 car. Uh, uh, once it's taken its pit stop, etc., we'll follow it along. And uh, we know there's a number of fans of this car in the uh, watching right now so you'll get a, a few laps on board thanks to your chauffeur Nick Silvesky. Come on, come on. 
back to Spa Francorchamps and uh, well, for those who have been enjoying our Race Spot TV fan immersion riding on board with the number 77 of Nick Zaweski, might have noticed a little bit of a moment there coming into Le Combe and nearly, nearly, nearly plowing into the back of the number 6 Simza car, which as we said, was uh, is on a bit of a recovery drive after an earlier incident from the lead and uh, Jonathan that's one uh, if, if one problem that we didn't actually talk about is that of course uh, not only have Simza got to avoid their own mistakes they've kind of got to avoid getting caught up in others as well yeah and I on board the fan immersion out on cold tires was the 77 and I almost I, I took a sip of water I almost spit out my drink when I saw what happened because he just overcooked it heading into like Combs and Almost collected the six car in with him. As we're seeing right here, here's a battle that's going to be heating up right now. Side by side, this is the 21 and the 64 Merlin Motorsport and WS Racing Esport. The 64 is through the WS Racing Esport Magenta car, taking that position. Nicholas Nigel behind the wheel, Robert Kutkins behind the wheel of the 21. And these two have been inseparable this entire run. They have indeed, and uh, it's interesting that the uh, that it's the the team magenta car, but because uh, you think, well, hold well, on a minute, it's yellow and black. But actually, if you noticed, little three lights above the driver's head on the top of the safety cell there, they are magenta. So that's a nice touch. You know, like a like a little like magenta stripe somewhere, or something a little more visible. Because I'm assuming like, in the day, that's going to be a little bit harder to tell. But only one team car for this team, though, so it's a little easy right now. Maybe a, be a better team name for them might have, um, it, it could have been WS Racing Esports Bumblebee, might have been a better one. Alright, well now we're, now we're coming up with naming ideas and I don't know how, I don't know how the iRacing community will respond to this. Saying, what, saying, uh, yeah, here's a better name for you because I say so. <laughs> well, we already have, you know, the, uh, teamracegitter.de in sixth place, the 235, we already said Team Glitter would have been a a really funny and amusing name. Yeah, paint team up. We've got paint the Bentley boys too. We've got the Bentley boys as well. Now, speaking of which, it looks like the Bentley gods have been able to grab the lead on the pit stop cycle. They still owe us another stop. However, that gap is large enough to where maybe the Bentley gods can overtake them, depending on what they do on the pit cycle. Indeed, so they, at the moment they are a minute and eight seconds to the good from HM Engineering, but as you say, they owe a stop. So I would suspect that it shouldn't be an issue, given the length of the pit lane here at uh, Spa, it shouldn't be an issue for HM Engineering to come in, take the pit stop, uh, get fuel, etc. And as we know, there was almost a, a complete reset, wasn't there, as you mentioned, Jonathan, the, They've both of these cars took a driver, fuel, and tires all at the same time in the last stop. So they uh, they're kind of as they were as far as that's concerned. Yeah, and uh, the Delta right now with just taking fuel is about 1:30. So he's going to need to like fly basically. He's going to need to put like the the Nike Trox boosters on the end of this car in order to really put some pressure on it. But this is a good time for you for them to really shave a little bit of that gap down while he has that lower fuel load. Indeed, yeah, absolutely. That that certainly helps. Uh, he needs the you say he needs the uh, Fast and the Furious quarter mile twenty five speed gearbox. Well, that would be super. That would be super useful in this situation. I think that would definitely close down twenty seconds in about twenty nine seconds. <laughs> just just drop down that drop down that twenty fourth speed in the box, and you just make that overtake just when you need to. <laughs> and hopefully the other GT cars. Uh, Hopefully they, this battle continues and they can get some others in here. Our commentary through with the Ferrari 488 sitting comfortably in third. And again, they've, you know, again, we got on and they were ninth place. <laughs> and they've really done an excellent job just meticulously working through the field. Yeah, they have. And that's uh, Stanislav Lenartz, who, that was who was in the car when we came on to the broadcast. So they've done, they've, they've done a, basically a two-man relay over the last, well, five and a half hours so um, brilliant job from this Ferrari and uh, you know mid-engine mid -engine machine it can have a little bit of a fickle nature if you let it but uh, well it's um, 
you know, as we said, Rachel Fry, who races the car in endurance races in the European Le Mans series and that Le Mans, says it's a brilliant endurance racing car. Well, she's proved she's certainly proven correct here. Uh, as we watch, we're riding aboard with the helmet cam coming down into the bus stop, down to first gear, tucking into the apex. One, two, and round. Well, I tell you what, they've done a great job to get up to third, and any problems at all from HM Engineering or the Bendley Gods, or both, you never know what this little Ferrari could do. And they've also outperformed all the Porsches in their class, which I think is something that we should really note here, is that the Porsches have, were up there competing, but there was a bit of calamity involving the Prism Sim Racing Alpha and the Race Union ones that were towards the front end of that group. Damage on the Prism car and a penalty on the Race Union car. Austrian SimSport as well has a little bit of damage, so... It's a bit of an interesting midfield fight. We have a couple guys that have had issues and struggled through, you know, this, you know, as we're closing on halfway, this first half of the day, but there's still a lot on the table, and again, it's 12 more hours of racing. Anything can happen. Absolutely, yeah. We've got, you know, darkness hours, maybe ooh, another eight hours of darkness, possibly. Um, for, for this race and that's a very big aspect as well when the sun starts to rise and come up that is where uh, you, you really take stock and look at the race and it almost enters a new phase altogether it's uh, more than just a, a difference in turning the light on or off it's, uh, it's, there's quite a lot of mental uh, impact to it uh, uh, in endurance motor sport so at the front of LMP2, let's have a, let's have a run through of, of all the LMP2 runners and see how they sit. Uh, LMP2 at the moment led by Phoenix Racing Esport Green, uh, who are a lap in a lap to the good from the Rinkesar Sim Racing team. T3 Esports are in third with Durham Motorsport Club, the 77 car, which we just ran on board with. For a few laps, they're in fourth. They're running a good race indeed. Angry Bull Racing are fifth, followed by WS Racing Esports Magenta and 70s Miller Motorsports and Racing Pro. And finally, Sims at Esports LMP2, the former leader, they're in eighth, but they are very much on the charge back up through the pack. And yeah, this midfield is going to get interesting with a 77 on down. I, I think with the charging six as well and the different strategies that are going on there, it's it's really going to get interesting to see how each team and each driver reacts and what they do for tires and what do for drivers, you know, going forward. Obviously, the long pit road is re really, I think, helps create a lot of interesting scenarios. Like a minute 30 just for fuel. It's almost a full lap for these LMP2 cars for a tire change and even a driver change. You risk losing a lap. So it's going to be interesting. Indeed, yes. Of course, of course, there's no, uh, we don't have any safety car intervention to worry about or full course yellows or what have you. Only local yellows being applied here uh, in the sim. Uh, so we don't need to worry about that. But you're absolutely right, Jordan. That, that length of pitch stop can really just sort of, we saw it. I mean, with the, 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 the Bentley. Uh, the Bentley Gods guys, they were really, really able to basically hassle the HM Engineering guys when they were, you know, actually not necessarily in the same race and that allowed them to get back into the competition. So, uh, and that wouldn't have been possible with a shorter pit lane. So, uh, as we ride on board, and I tell you what, you, you mentioned it just off, off the air there, Jonathan, these these uh, Dallara LMP2s are just rocket ships. It's, and they are, they just, they rev so quickly with that normally aspirated motor and, oh, they, and they are a pleasure to drive. Oh, just look at the inside of them, look at the LED lights, all the buttons on the side. It, it's really, it, like, looking at this, it's a very complicated and awesome machine, but it's running so well. As we're riding on board the Motul number 40, who's been in a little bit of bad luck situations they were fighting in that lmp2 midfield for quite some time and now they're going to bring a little bit of heat and a little bit of a charge back towards the front you can see traffic right ahead of them yeah big traffic there we've got the uh, third place uh, gt3 audi uh, the leading audi just there uh, that is the uh, ring for zeit sim racing pro audi I think. No, no, I apologise. It's uh, it has a number three on the side of it, but actually, 
It is running in second spot right now. That's the absolute motorsport Acola design car of Andrea Dalla Valle. We still don't know how much damage is on that car. I see blinking lights from the 40 who's out on fresh tires compared to the overall leader. I'm not sure how kindly Phoenix Racing is going to take to the blinking lights, but maybe not move aside, maybe not bother. No, that is a strange one, and uh, they are not in the same race at all. Um, and actually, for, for the Mo2 guys in the 40 car, they've got a great opportunity here to, to actually get a, a little bit of a toe along for, uh, for a couple of laps uh, as they head through Eau Rouge and Radion. Now, look at that there, just fighting a bit of uh, of understeer. Oh, and he's going to make a move on the leader. He's going to try and get one of his laps back. Down they go to Lecombe. This is... Oh, this is sketchy for the leader and very smartly the number 66 Phoenix Racing Esport Green Card just dipping back slightly saying okay if you want to go fine I'm not going to compromise uh, my uh, my race lead over it yeah if you want to go have a have some fun go ahead you're on fresh tires have fun Again, the leader being very, very smart. That's, I think that's something that Phoenix Racing East, we haven't really mentioned, but they've been in, you know, some precarious situations and they've backed off when needed to and taken evasive action when needed to. And I think that's what you need to do, especially in endurance racing where a multitude of things can go wrong. That's it, and you've got to have your eyes in the back of your head all the time, whether you're in the class coming through or the class being overtaken. So a little bit of an update on the GTE field. Now we should have our HM Engineering car going for its pit stop. It has. That gap now just hovering around 13 seconds between HM Engineering and the Bendley Gods. The two Corvettes with the Ferrari 488 GTE, the online sim racing machine uh, of Stanislav Lenartz in third. So. Uh, this is uh, really, um, really, really close at the front uh, in in GTE, and you know what? On the online racing, uh, online sim racing DE in their Ferrari and the uh, Austrian sim racers ROT Porsche, they are all in the battle for this win as well. Yeah, strategy can take a part in it. Any issues, mechanical or you know digital issues that come on for HM Engineering and Bentley Gods, it's, it makes the race wide open and there's still very good cars in that GTE field. We talked about Prism Sim Racing and Race Union getting together with one another, but they, they are good cars that have been setting decent pace. They are on pace with leaders. So it, it's going to be an interesting fight towards the end of the race. Absolutely, yeah, but just to compare some of the recent lap times um, for the GTE Runners, the uh, HM Engineering car, the 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 red Corvette, the number one fifty nine, as my timing screen decides to go. Never good timing. <laughs> there it goes. Uh, two minute thirteen point four one nine for them. Uh, two minute thirteen point four for the Ferrari, the online sim racing. Two thirteen point eight for Austrian sim racers. Even the Prism car, two thirteen point eight as well. So very very closely matched at the front in terms of. Uh, lap to lap pace but the critical thing is the HM Engineering they've got their car out in a bit of clean air and that's massively important yeah the more clean air you can get in that car the better and I think without traffic as well you can really get in a rhythm run some clean lap times kind of settle down and get yourself into the stint and that's really what has been the, the case really for this HM car they've really not had any, much issues with traffic and whatever issues they've had, it's been like one or two cars going on by or them passing. It's never been a huge clump of GT3 cars or a huge train of prototypes besides the one instance about an hour ago. Indeed, they have kept their uh, kept their nose clean. And can they do that for the remaining 12 hours and 33 minutes here at Spa? We would just, if we were at Sebring, we would be just coming into the last half an hour. That's, uh, but really you've got to do the same all over again. And uh, here at Spa, there is uh, it's such a demand on the driver. So many big commitment corners as we see. Our overall leader and P2 class leader, the number 66, Phoenix Racing Esport Green. Driver coming through a little bit of traffic using the uh, 
the headlight flasher relatively liberally. There he goes, just making sure the GT runner is uh, aware that he's there. And uh, Jonathan, it's interesting. I listened to um, a podcast recently with uh, a multiple Le Mans winner, Darren Turner, who, uh, of course, last Aston Martin factory driver and raced in the American Le Mans series in the amazing Aston Martin DBR9 as well. And he says, you know, as a GT driver, he says he just his pet hate is prototypes flashing at him with those lights. He says the prototypes have such bright lights at Le Mans now. And he says when they flash you, it's just dazzling. And he says, I can see you. I saw you coming <laughs> about a kilometre behind me. But he says it's so frustrating when you've got these co- prototypes constantly flashing at you. I don't know what's going to be more frustrating, the current prototype, the LMP2s, or the Corvettes, because the Corvettes have those lights on the bottom, and I think on the road, those things would blind us. Never mind on the racetrack, as we look, it's a battle here in GT3, two BMWs going at it, TeamRaceGitter.de and Albrecht Motorsports, Benton Krauss and Stryker Kuchner, under a second, and these two, you know, they've the GT3 class has had a you know, pretty dominant car in the lead, but otherwise, there's still good racing throughout of it. Indeed, absolutely, yeah, and it's, uh, this is great for the uh, both cars here on screen right now, the Team Race Gitter and the Albrecht Motorsports car, because they've they've got cars that they're both quite sim- they're on quite similar pace, so they can, it actually, it gives them, for lack of a better word, it gives them a bit of company in the dark of night here in Belgium. Let me see how long who wants to stay in front and who wants to, you know, stay behind in the company. It looks like RaceGitter.de is itching for a way around the 247. They've been running similar lap times. The uh, 235 about a second faster. He's out also on fresh tires it looks like as well. So that could play a factor. It certainly could as you see oh, the Raging Bulls uh, prototype coming through there. Very, very close one. The GTE runners, I think it's H and R GTE Porsche coming through there as well. So it's getting very, very busy, and you've got to really be thinking quick because if you're, there's three different paces of car there, all going through the same bit of track at once, and you've really got to be thinking. You've got to have <laughs> four sets of eyes and three sets of ears, really. And somehow the ability to turn left and right at the same time. As we look to see the 235 looking to dive down into the cones. That's you know, a risky maneuver, and he thought about it, but it just wisely backs out. But especially through that section right there, a Rouge and Rattalong, where there's not much room for error between two drivers, if we've seen in the real world and in sim racing. You really have to be aware of where the faster cars are and where the traffic is. Yeah, indeed, especially in a closed cockpit car, in particular the prototypes where the vision is really poor you're in you've got a lot of blind spot in one of those cars they are very safe in an accident but blind spot wise they're really tough uh and i think yes that's one thing that in the sim is more difficult i think where if you're it's particularly like for example in my um uh, sim setup at home i only have a single screen so it's really tricky you've got to give a lot more room than i think you would have to with a wraparound screen or a or a vr headset for example so uh that and going through Eau rouge well it's a one-line corner anyway, so when you go side by side, it's often, <laughs> often that you, if you get two cars going in side by side, you often don't get two cars coming out. No, maybe we need to start a race spot petition for us that have single screens to get more monitors. Because I would also love to be on the triple screen or a curved screen. I only have one, and I also feel like you have to give more room because you never know in a lot of these blind spots, and especially when you're here at night racing. Even if you have the triple screen with a VR. You know, it's so dark, and you only see like the lights sometimes. You're, you're not seeing like the car behind you. As we see, Buchner again looking, but he just doesn't have a good enough run to really make it stick. No, he, he, he can tell he's keen to get past there, but the uh, the Albrecht Motorsport machine, the 247, holding him off. Has to come down towards the last source. Nice and tidy through there. Just tuck it down to the yeah, first gear in these cars, tuck it in and then back on the power. And the better you can get that exit, that you get the benefit of it all the way through a rouge and actually, in fact, all the way up the Camel Straight as well. And a good run out of Vision Radalong will really give him the momentum. As you see, the 247 is getting closer and closer to getting overtaken by the 235. We'll see if 
Buchner tries something daring down the inside. He thought about it last lap, wisely decides against it. Uh, the team race getter got DE car has been, you know, had some bad luck, had a spin or two here or there. The 247 looks like has seen a few battles in its days, but both still trucking along. They are indeed, as you can see there. Uh, if, uh, of course, for uh, the, this is exactly what you would see on a, on a real life GT3 car, these little kind of LED panels that you get at the top right of the windscreen, uh, telling you where they are in class and position. And now, as we see here, he goes then. Siegfried Buchner makes the move at Pujon. That's a big move. And he gets it done with relative ease. The uh, the race gooder car there, not putting up too much of a fight. Sorry, my apologies. The uh, the, the seventh place car of Albrecht Motorsports not putting up too much of a fight, but gets the move done. And yeah, slightly fresher tires again on the 235. And also that 237 may just be trundling along along with some damage as well as you can see the front end of it has had you know a bit of a, a running with a wall here or there maybe a car or two and now we can try and go get after maybe get himself a top five here he could do and it's uh, just an, an interesting a little update on the battle for the podium spots in the lmp2 there's now 8.5 seconds between number eight car and 71 car so that is getting really quite spicy at the front of uh, of LMP2 and yeah and over the, actually that gap is reducing as we can see there from our screen now a little bit more up to date so yeah ring for out sim racing Philip Boer he's now getting put under pressure by Mike Rang and uh, he can't afford any mistakes and also have to really keep a move on in in traffic as well and that is not straightforward at all now let me see that Mike Rang has kind of, you know, hit a bunch of traffic right here. There's several Porsches and a few BMWs in this mix. They're also coming to the end of their stint. So I'm wondering if this T3 Esports car just really comes alive towards the end of the fuel stint, whereas the Ryan's Red Sim Racing on the 2 is a bit stronger towards the beginning. As again, several Porsches and the two BMWs. The race skater car we were just commentating the battle on also involved in a little dice you see there. Uh, very, yeah. You you're running out, running out of braking room pretty quickly there, coming off the, the end of the Camel Straight into Le Con, down towards Brussels, hairpin we go. And then Who was that just behind that just split the two GT cars? There's a prototype back there, and I, I want to replay. Ah, oh, ho, ho, it's the Simza car. It's the number six Simza car on the tear. Uh, a couple of laps down, but absolutely getting a getting a move on to the number six Sims car. Let's have a look. Great spot there, Jonathan. Uh, so coming through like Com down towards Brussels, and then oh, that's gutsy. <laughs> that required both of the GT cars seeing him, and I don't think he could have guaranteed that from the cockpit of his Delara. I didn't guarantee it. Like, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I was a little speechless when I was watching it. I was like, wait, he did not just try and go three wide. And, well, made it work. He really did. Yeah, that was, wow. That was some really impressive, uh, uh, well, risk and reward ratio was certainly high there. Uh, oh, as we see the number eight car, Philip Boer comes in. So this is interesting. Will Mike Arang follow him in? He does. So... This is now a race on pit road, really. Uh, what are these guys on a different strategy? Do they need? Does one of them need tyres and one of them doesn't? We will see as they come rolling down the very slow, constant pit lane here at Spa. You'll see all, all the people up in the hospitality up on the right-hand side. Normally, they would be enjoying a nice, uh, a nice cool, um, maybe a leffe or a triple caramelite. That's a nice beer as well. Uh, perhaps even now that the the holy grail of beer, Jonathan, is a West Flater, and I would think you would need to be in the top top hospitality to get offered a West Flater in at the uh, Spa Twenty Four Hour. Uh, maybe you can like negotiate your way into getting one. You can like sneak in somewhere or something like that. It's pro probably just gonna use some good negotiation tactics. <laughs> uh, or being a being a cheeky Scot sometimes helps. Sometimes not. Some but sometimes does. <laughs> Yep, there's, I actually do, I'm very proud to say I own a bottle, one bottle, uh, of uh, West Flatter and Beer, brewed by monks who don't speak. 
Um, you have to go up and you put your money through a, a little window, and then they, they push the beer towards you. They, you don't get change. You have to have the exact money if, if you, you won't be getting change. So it's uh, yep one of the um, one of the few uh, Trappist uh, beers in uh, in Belgium. I'm gonna say I'm assuming you you have this bottle and you're saving it for the the ultra special occasion. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And actually, you, the crazy part is is that you bottle age the beer. So actually, you a west way through and you want to basically have it in bottle for three or four years before you drink it. Now, normal beer, you would never want to drink beer that's been in the can or in the bottle for three or four years. But with west way and, and built similar beers of that type, you uh, yeah you you want it to uh, bottle age in the cellar. Or my cupboard, as, as, as I call it. <laughs> so, so I'm assuming that this is the, the second job you have besides our play-by-play -play commentator is you are our Paul and Beer connoisseur. <laughs> I, I'm going to take that, yes. I'm going to get business cards printed but for that tomorrow. Uh, oh, Race Spot TV. Oh, oh, Beer and Alcohol Connoisseur. Yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> First in class right now uh, for Phoenix Racing Eastward Green has stayed out an extra lap on his stint while his other two rivals have come down the pit lane and I think are about to exit. Or no, the Phoenix Racing has actually pit one lap earlier, so they're one lap earlier than the rivals and BMW getting a very, very close indeed. And actually, that's a bit racy. That's second and third in the GT3 category right on top of each other. Yeah, well, I say are. that, and they dip into the pits. And he goes, yeah, and I'll tell you what, the leader there having to pick his way through very carefully the 66 Phoenix Racing Eastport Green car. Uh, now, let's see what's happening with... Uh, oh, now, isn't this interesting? So, when they went into the pits, these guys were about seven seconds apart. Um, but now, Mike Arang in the 71 car, only three seconds apart, and now they can... Critically, Mike Aran can see Philip Boer up ahead. There he is, just a little bit further up. So, ooh, this is getting very interesting indeed in the LMP2 field. And, uh, it, you know, interestingly for the 66 car, our leader in LMP2, this is probably ideal for these guys to get together on track because that potentially slows two of, the, two of their rivals up. And creates even more of a cushion. He already has that one lap buffer in the 66, do, does... Uh, Daniel Longrick, but any like, sizable gap, any bigger cushion would be something that everyone else would also enjoy <laughs> if you're leading a race. So, thing to keep in mind is traffic held up Michael Ring a little bit, but you know, critically, he's been lap by lap, he's been tearing away at this eight car. And I'm wondering again if that eight still has a little bit of damage from that incident earlier. It's, it's caught more traffic, slower BMW dying down into Brussels, clearing him as best he can. He's hoping to really for some clean track is what he needs to go chase down the, the Rankstall machine. Yeah, interesting. You can see he's just got a little bit of problem with understeer there. I mean, it is something that the Delara P2 does suffer from a little bit, is that low-speed understeer. But it doesn't seem to be such a problem here through Buhon. In fact, definitely not nice and smooth through there. So let's uh, just keep an eye on board then to see. Does he have that same understeer issue? seems to be okay, it seems to be alright, just perhaps in that one little one section there, so uh, this is uh, this is going to be an intriguing battle to see if Mike Aran can pull in at the last three seconds or so to Philip Boer, and of course the great thing for us, uh, quite selfish to Jonathan, is, is that they've just taken their pit stops, so if they do come together, they'll have a whole stint having a battle. Yeah, critically also the T3 Esports car was two seconds faster down pit lane as they're running up now, it looks like on our GTE leader in the HM Machine Engineering car, who's still got a couple laps on his stint to go. But if he keeps clicking off fast laps like this, it, it really won't be long. And then once you see him, I think he'll even go even faster. I know when I'm behind the wheel of a race car, that's normally what I see. If I see someone right in front of me, if I can physically see them, I'll go faster. Yeah, it's that um, yeah, Coyote and Roadrunner uh, syndrome, isn't it? It's, uh... <laughs> You can't help it, you've just got to go chase after the guy uh, in front. 
Interesting they're going through all rules, it just shows you how much aero performance, how much aerodynamic grip these cars have. You notice the very small steering inputs they're going through all rules. The car, you just have to think about the corner and whoosh whoosh around it goes. However, when you get into the slower stuff here, like the Com, much bigger steering inputs. Look at that, you've really actually got to work the wheel pretty hard saying, come on, turn in, come on, go, go. But it will rouge when the car just gets really, it starts to use its aerodynamic grip. Uh, it's a lot actually easier at high speed. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's where like the challenge of driving these little P2 around a place like Spa comes from is those like the slower corners, the cones, the sauce, the chicane. It's it really comes down to trying to manage here. Because right here in Puhan, look, a little bit of steering, gets a little bit of the curve. This is not dramatic, this is not much of an issue. It's once he gets to these slower corners, as we see uh, another P2 car head cut off a GT, but so once he gets to these slower corners, like in this section right here, he's having to really work for it, making sure that he stays steady, he keeps in the lines, doesn't, you know, overdo it on the throttle. Absolutely, and it's just so easy to do as well. And if you're getting, if you get into a habit where you're too over eager on the throttle in these cars, the, the traction control just cuts in and it just kills your momentum. And if you're, if you're riding into the traction control too much, you, you always end up using too much fuel as well because it's very uh, very inefficient for fuel economy if you're just battering into the traction control all the time. So look at that, look at a full lock there going through, both right and left at the uh, bus stop. And then you've got to try and catch that little bit of an oversteer moment as well. So let's see, this gap is sort of just, it's kind of, pretty steady right now so Philip Boer has sort of steadied the ship a little bit and uh, Mike Arang not quite taking uh, as much out as, as he was before the, the pit stops. It's the traffic that's really coming into play you see that oh, just up the road there's a huge gaggle of four or five GT cars I don't know if they're GTE or GT3 but there's several of them dicing back and forth um, trying to get around and get clean track and I think that actually might be holding up the Rangsford number eight. I think I see him in that group of cars ahead of us. We have eighth place BMW right there. And yes, yeah, there he is. He's actually right in the middle of the two Porsches. And the gap is closing drastically. It's now now under two seconds, and he's just gotten around the Porsches, and that was huge. As almost half of that gap he just worked to build up through that traffic is gone. Yeah, it looks like it's maybe going to just go back and forward like an accordion effect as we see just at the spot where Micah Rang doesn't need them. He's got GT cars at the fa the real bit where the aerodynamic grip of the P2 car comes out and he's flashing his lights, he's getting held up and oh no, 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 this is all one line through here. Oh, dear me, that's not what Micah Rang needs and all of a sudden, whoosh straight back up to three seconds again and he gets caught by the prism car big dive up the inside gets through and all of a sudden he's got all that work to do so this traffic gives and it takes away i think the other thing they know about that traffic that i just realized as they went past i think those two porsches have a little bit of bad blood between them as that is the prism sim racing alpha and the race union uh, porsches which if you've not been with the broadcast with us you may have remembered there have been a several incidents with those two, particularly into Lake Holmes that got a penalty on the race union car. So they might be fighting hard against each other just for the sake of fighting hard against each other. They're not in the same lap, unfortunately. Yeah, you, you could you could say that they've got each other's car marked, that's for sure. Um, so a little bit of a reduction in time again. So it seems that in clean air, Mike Arang just has that edge. Uh, at the moment and you know it's all it's going to take I think Jonathan is for just one point where Philip Boer gets balked a little bit by some GT traffic and all it needs is for Mike Rang to just get into his vicinity and and then it changes completely. So Philip Boer can he get by into Lacombe there's a slow GT3 car here oh right at the wrong bit this is going to give Mike Rang a little bit of a chance to catch up again so this is just back and forward all the time it's going to happen like this. And this is the second time into Lacombe's down to Brussels that he's caught a GT3 car. And I'm sure it's infuriating for Philip Boer. There's really nothing he could do about that. And now it's underneath a second as all of a sudden Mike Rang has just activated the rocket ship in that car. And now he gets held up by the slower GT3 car. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, 
It's just going back and forward, back and forward, isn't it? So we're looking at the Philip Boer just getting a little bit of compromise on the exit there, and this is getting closer now. But if Rang now in the 71, he's going to get bought by the R8 there. Yes, right at the wrong bit. Gets bopped by the Audi R8 GT3. Can we make it through in time? That allows Philip Boer to get ahead and Oh, this is this is this is a fascinating battle here between these guys. Yeah, what Mike Rang just needs is no traffic, which it looks like up ahead. There is not a lot right now, but someone could spin, come back out on track, and all of a sudden there's three or four cars that have slowed up and caused a little bit of a traffic jam. So anything can happen. Again, Mike Rang just needs the clean air. He desperately just wants to really catch the ranks for some racing machine as soon as possible. Yeah, and this is this is an interesting one where uh, a good teammate or a good team manager or or whatever is really important because yes, this is important from a psychological perspective, from driver to driver to you know win the win the battle. But it's not about the battle; it's about the overall war, and it's a 24-hour war here at Spa. And for you know for both of these guys, they they need to really keep, in, keep in, in mind that they've got just a hair over 12 hours to go in this race so they're they're only halfway through so running those clean laps and not trying to overstretch yourself is really really important and that's what other cars some you'll see a lot of mind games going on in endurance racing sometimes where you try to force your opponent into a mistake try to you know get them to chase you or or just sit behind them and get them to make the mistakes there's lots that can be done and that's what I think particularly Mike Ryan needs to watch now. He's really obviously hauling in Philip Moore, but you just got to be careful not to take too much risk at this stage. The other thing is, you know, we're looking at this battle. It's for second and third. The leader is a whole lap ahead. Uh, Daniel Longbeck for Phoenix Racing Esport. And I'm sure both these teams are looking at that and going, okay, how do we chase down that 66? There has to be some sort of plan or strategy. Scrapping it about amongst yourselves is not going to be the answer. That's an excellent point indeed. It's uh, for for lots of reasons. Of course, it's uh, scrapping back and forward with another driver is going to slow you both down quite considerably, and of course, uh, increases the risk of of accidents. And really, these guys they don't necessarily have the pace of the '66 car, the leader. But if they run mistake free, they're in a really strong chance of winning this race. So. It's, it's um, yeah, that's where they've really got to have a good, good solid team around them. You know, all the teams they'll be communicating by by voice chat all the time, and that is where it's really, really important to keep your driver in the car calm uh, and uh, just keeping their, their eye on the bigger picture because we're all human beings, aren't we, Jonathan? We all, I mean, if I was in that 71 car, I'd be going absolutely 110% as what I could do because, because I'm, you know, <laughs> like you say, it is the. The, the fly and the, the bright light or the, the coyote and the uh, roadrunner, whatever cliche you want to use, you, you, when you're a racer, you just want to chase them down, but that's where a good team comes in. Yeah, this is where, I think this is where like the team racing also comes into a huge effect. You know, people are making sure, communicating, talking to each other, being on the same page, making sure the setups are good. And again, focusing on the big picture, you know, you don't want to get caught up in the dogfights that we saw earlier into the GTE category with HM Engineering and uh, Bentley Gods. There were several banging back and forth and again in our uh, race incident report screen we even have two reports. We we'll don't know who filed them, but both of them filed them on each other. I wouldn't be surprised because there were several incidents of contact in hard racing, but keeping cool and keeping in mind that again, we're only halfway through and we still have a long way to go. Absolutely, as we see Ooh, the car there going past one of the Corvettes and pushes the Corvette a little bit off course and then that holds up Mike Rang and now we're back into busy GT traffic. So let's make a note, 1.3 seconds is what they came into this traffic with. Where do they come out the other side? Who's going to be better through the traffic here? Is it going to be Boer? Is it going to be Rang? Let's wait and see. It looks like it might well be Rang. He looks to have got himself through the melee there quite well. Now, can he get through Blanchimon unhindered? Yes, he can. Now, this is big. A big move on the brakes here from Morang, and he is right on the back of Boer. 
And yeah, that's definitely a bit closer now. So just that little skirmish there coming through the traffic, just that little bit in favor of Mike Ryan. Yeah, the Austrian SimSport car, which is now sitting in the third podium spot, by the way, in GTE, trying to mind his own business and run his race. Unfortunately, a victim now to a hard LMP2 fight, but now it's under a second. Now the draft comes into play. Now the psychological warfare comes into play. And now it's definitely going to be on for the second spot as well. They're also on the same stint strategy. They've been out for the same time. They pitted together on the same lap. So this is going to be just a one-on-one -on -one dogfight. Yeah, indeed. And actually, I th Philip Boer just ran quite wide on the exit there of uh, La Source. And that's definitely killed his exit. And he's paid the price for it. And now he's got Mike Arang right on the gearbox. So... This is an interesting one. What do you think, Jonathan? Because obviously Mike Arang is the car with a lot of pace. Um, if you're Philip Boer, probably it's difficult because you probably want to just try and just block wherever you can, maybe. Just try and upset his pace. Or do you let you let Mike Arang by and just tuck in behind him? It's a, it's a difficult decision for him at this point. You know, we talk about seeing like the bigger picture, but, you know, if... If these teams have already conceded that that 66 car is going to be uncatchable, well, they may just have an all-out dogfight and have an all-out war right here. Uh, obviously, 71 car has pace, but it doesn't have like consistent pace where it will just blow the eight out of the water as soon as it get by. It's been it's been taking a while, and now that slower BMW really holding up my ring. I'm sorry, Porsche. Excuse me. And now almost a second again, it was within tense. They were on each other's wings, and now all of a sudden, Michael Ring's going to have to do it again. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it, how that multi-class sports car racing, it just adds a completely new element all the time. There's always something different to come across in that you've, got to, you've just got to overcome make your way through and you've got to try and guess what the car is going to do wait and of course by now this is a stage in the race where you'll know every single car in the race you'll know it inside out you'll know a sort of pattern of behavior of what the cars are likely to do and that will you know a lot of the smart drivers will, will really play that uh, in their favor knowing which gt cars are maybe more predictable or or maybe the prototypes that you know are going to die for him or whatever it might be. But here goes Mike Kerrang. He's right in the draft here. Is he going to be able to make this move cleanly? Boer just maintains his line, doesn't put up a fight. Hard on the brakes goes Kerrang, and there's your answer. No problem at all. Through he goes. So Boer very cleverly thinking at the long game. It's a bit of a moment there, though. He had a back end come out on him as the traction control kicked in, but... Yeah, it, that, I think that had to be the smart move if you're the Ryan Schwartz Sim Racing team in Philip Four. You're on the same strategy, you know, you are fighting each other, but then again, the big picture, that 66 is way out in front, and we need clean lap times and good racing. But again, it was a good move by Michael Rang, and whale of a job getting through that traffic and closing him down. Absolutely, yeah, there was lots of potential risk there, as he's, now he's thinking, oh no, don't hold me up now, is the one of the uh, H&R BMWs there getting out the way good job so now yeah for the 71 of Iran he's really got to push because the last thing he needs to do now is pull around Philip Boer for the rest of the stint and give him a little bit of a fuel advantage so Iran's really got to lay down the law here and already you just look at the physical distance he's pulled out in those just few sectors and if he can get past this GT3 GT3 BMW cleanly which he does again catches at just the perfect moment uh, this is uh, Iran's opportunity to take... Oh, God! It, I was about to say it was his opportunity until he nearly gets punted up the back by the number eight car. Boar was really, really brave on the brakes. I didn't ex I didn't expect that. He was. He pulled out such a gap, and I think, I think that BMW just disturbed a little bit of the air off the 71. Now it's still a fight, and now Boar has a huge draft heading down into Eau Rouge and Rallyon, and it'll be another drag race down the Camel Strait if he still wants to put up the fight or if he's willing to ride behind him. Well, that's, that's the thing. is, And do you know what? Boer didn't... Uh, he didn't walk up or in it, so it wasn't a mistake on the brake. He was just really, really late on the brakes uh, as, as well. So riding on board with Philip Boer, looking at the shift lights, well, I think he's... We, we talked about it earlier, you know, are you going to use the regular stack or use the long stack? I think... Definitely this 8 car is on the normal stack because he was 
popped out in sixth gear there. So that's interesting, whereas a lot of the other drivers have had a bit of time to go in sixth gear, so maybe using the tall stack. So that is that is in, that is quite insightful there, actually, that one board there with Philip Boer. And uh, is he using... Oh, yeah, he's using every last bit of every gear. So he's trying to hang on to a rang here and try to at least keep him in sight. If he wanted, I think he didn't want to do like really aggressive defensive driving because maybe he knew the move was inevitable. He wants to still keep a presence and still, you know, put pressure on him. Obviously, a mistake made by the 71 gives the position back to Moore. But again, these two keep fighting. Phoenix Racing Esport Green and Daniel Longrick are going to continue leading. Indeed. Well, why don't we have a little run through the LMP2 standings as we as we see? Of course, Phoenix Racing Esports Green. A lap ahead of this incredible battle between T3 Esports and Ring Fizzer Sim Racing. It's going to rumble on for the next few hours, I'm sure. In fourth at the moment is the WS Racing Esports Magenta car. Uh, Angry Bull Racing are in fifth, followed by Milner Motorsport, the Renner Motorsport Club, and Simza Esports continue their recovery drive. Jonathan, how are they looking in GTE? GTE HM Engineering in that Corvette now have a 23 second lead over the Bentley Gods. It's been consistent good laps times that have really given them the lead. But oh, when a big moment actually <laughs> as they head through Plunge them on. That could have been disastrous for the team. But they have a good lead. It's going to go down a little bit. Austrian Sim Racers, ROT, Prism Sim Racing Alpha, the two Porsches right behind, and then our commentary favorite the online sim racing that de ferrari in fifth race union in sixth Bryansfeld sim racing gte and muller motorsports sim racing blue round out the top eight Let's head on over to the gt3 category well before we do wow that was a big moment there for hm engineering in the gte that would have grabbed the attention for sure and well in gt3 this is a an absolute clinic from the Familian Bomber Black BMW in uh, with nice little homage to the uh, German mark with the little blue and red accents there. Very M Motorsport, I like that a lot. Uh, and well, I'm sure they like their pace a lot. They are just dominating this GT3 class. Absolute Motorsport in the leading Audi, the 299 car, are in second with Ring Fazart Sim Racing GT3 Pro in third. German Performance Sim Racing are in fourth, followed by Reparix by Artel Motorsport, Milner Motorsport, Albrecht Motorsport, and finally Team Race Gitter.de are in eighth. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to bring six hours, uh, the second six hours of this uh, Spa 24 hour to you, along with my colleague in the commentary box, Jonathan Burke. We're about to move over to a new stream. The details of that are in the YouTube chat right now. So check that out and switch straight over here on Racebot TV and you can see uh, the remainder of this motor race. It's time to say goodbye. Thank you so much for watching and enjoy the rest of the race.